Hello, 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 hello. I believe we are now live on the YouTubes. Welcome to episode six of Bright Green Live. My name is Chris and I am going to be your host for the next eight hours of your life. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, if you could let me know in the chat, firstly, where you're joining from and secondly, if everything is working okay. Uh, if you can hear me, if you can see me, if everything is nice and smooth, that'd be brilliant. Let me know in the chat where you're watching from and we'll get started with the show right about now. Um, so you're watching episode six of Bright Green Live. Bright Green Live is a monthly show that streams on YouTube on the second Sunday of every month, bringing you guests from across the labour movement, the UK's Green Parties, social movements, campaign groups and the wider left. We have an amazing lineup of guests joining me throughout the day and I'm going to be very very quickly running down who you're going to be hearing from in a second or so but before we get into any of that I have a couple of things to ask you to do firstly please 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 hit the subscribe button it means that you won't miss out on any of the videos that we're putting out in the future and it helps bright green out massively another way that you can help bright green out as well is by hitting the like button on this video too that means that this video will appear in more people's feeds. So if you're excited and looking forward to the guests that we have on throughout the show, uh, other people will be too. And if you hit like, if you hit subscribe, it means that more people will see them. So with that little bit of admin out of the way, I'll just give you a quick overview of what we're going to be doing today. So I have joining me today an absolutely amazing lineup of guests who I'm going to be speaking to, interviewing and having conversations with throughout the day. So first up, the very first guest today is going to be Sean Berry. And for our regular viewers, I'm sure that Sean needs no introduction, but she is a former co-leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, and she's also a London Assembly member. She's been on the London Assembly since 2016, and the Greens have been on the London Assembly since it was founded in 2000. So we're going to be discussing the 23 years that the Green Party has had seats on the London Assembly. We're going to be discussing the impacts they've had. We're going to be looking at Shan's critique of Sadiq Khan's running of London, and also what the Greens 2024 London Assembly election campaign might look like. So Shan will be joining me in about 10 minutes time. Following Sean, I'll be joined by Elle Folan. Elle's going to be back on the show for the second time, and we're going to be discussing the local elections that are coming up in May. So you presumably <laughs> will be aware that uh, in May, there's going to be two sets of elections, one set in England, and then a couple of weeks later, another set in the north of Ireland. And I'm going to be speaking to Elle about um, their take on those elections, for those of you who don't know, Elle is the founder of Stats for Lefties, the uh, popular election aggregating service for left-wingers across the world. And um, they're also a columnist for Novara Media. I'm going to be talking to Elle about, firstly, what we can expect from those local elections in general. But really specifically, we're going to be delving into the Greens' chances in those elections. So where are the places that the Green Party in England could win really, really big? Where are the places um, that we could see the Greens taking control of councils? What can we expect from those elections that are coming up very, very soon? We'll also talk a little bit about how the Lib Labour and the Liberal Democrats are doing and touch on the elections in the north of Ireland as well. After all, at 11.45, I'm going to be joined by Samuel Sweek, who is the campaign lead on the Music for the Many campaign at the Peace and Justice Project. If you're not aware of the Peace and Justice Project, it was a campaign group, at NGO, that was set up by Jeremy Corbyn and others a few years ago. And the Music for the Many campaign is a new initiative that's seeking to protect live music venues um, in the UK. So I'm going to be talking to Sam Samuel about that campaign, why music venues are under threat, what people can do to save them and why that's a priority for the Peace and Justice Project. After that, at 12.30, I'll be speaking to Gwen Gwynfill. Uh, Gwen is the CEO of Yes Cymru. Yes Cymru is one of the primary organisations campaigning for Welsh independence. I'm going to be speaking to Gwen about why it is that support for Welsh independence is lower than support for Scottish independence. I'm going to be looking at Yes Cymru's priorities and what they're seeking to campaign on in the coming years and also what the progressive nature of the devolved government in 
Wales means for the Welsh independence movement. On into the afternoon, after lunchtime, I'm going to be continuing our series of videos and interviews with uh, people who are talking about the Green Party's new policy on NATO. So on the last episode of Bright Green Live, I spoke to Linda Walker, who was one of the authors of the Green Party's new policy on NATO. And I also spoke to Lindsay German, who is a uh, activist with the Stop the War Coalition, uh, obviously an organisation that's deeply critical of NATO. We discussed um, various bits and pieces in those interviews. And I'm going to be speaking to uh, today Martin Butcher, who is somebody who is critical of both those perspectives that were put forward in the last show. Uh, Martin is a Green Party town councillor and also used to be the author of the now defunct NATO Monitor blog. Uh, he has lots and lots of thoughts on NATO and the Green Party's new position on it. So we're going to be delving into that in a little bit more detail this afternoon. At 2.15pm, I'm going to be speaking to Maisha Begum. Maisha is um, the person behind the Oso oh Ethical Campaign Group and also is uh, part of the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective. So we're 10 years on from the Rana Plaza building collapse. This was a huge uh, humanitarian disaster that took place um, in Bangladesh where a garment factory collapsed, killing over a thousand workers. It's the 10th anniversary this year, so I'm going to be talking to Maisha about, firstly, uh, wh whether the conditions in the garment industry have changed since that uh, disaster took place a decade ago. We're going to be talking about the uh, the work that the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective, which includes organisations like War I Want, No Sweat and others, are doing to commemorate that and how people can get involved um, in fighting for justice for garment workers. At 3 p.m., I'll be joined by Katie Montgomery, who, uh, for those of you who frequent YouTube, will be very, very familiar with. Katie is a YouTuber and a, um, a well-known activist, broadcaster, and so on. Uh, she is going to be speaking to me about the new guidance that the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the EHRC, has issued on the Equality Act. This is deeply controversial uh, guidance that's been issued in a letter from the EHRC to the Equalities Minister, Kemi Badenot. That letter uh, argued for significant changes to how sex is defined in the Equality Act and how it's implemented. So I'm going to be talking to Katie about what the ramifications of that guidance would be if it were implemented for trans people. At 4pm, I'll be joined by Alex Powell, who is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. And I'm going to be discussing with Alex the government's uh, extremely hostile anti-migrant legislation that's been going through Parliament uh, most recently in the anti uh, in the illegal migration bill but also a raft of other uh, legislation we've seen we're going to be talking about that in general as we have done on previous shows but we're also going to be specifically delving into the impacts that legislation could have on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers that's Alex's area of academic speciality he's one of the the most renowned academics in this area. So that is an absolute much watch. And finally, closing the show at 5 p.m., I'm going to be joined by Danielle Bett. Danielle is the Director of Communications at Yakad, which is a organisation which campaigns within the Jewish community in the UK for a two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict and an end to the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Now, we're going to be discussing the ongoing... Uh, protests and turmoil that have erupted after Benjamin Netanyahu's attempt to introduce extremely reactionary, regressive judicial reforms in Israel. So I'm going to be speaking to Danielle about what those judicial reforms are, how damaging they could be to democracy and civil liberties in Israel, but I'll also be talking to her about the protests that have sparked up in resistance to those uh, reforms in Israel and across the globe and what they what impact they're having on Jewish attitudes towards the state of Israel and the government of Israel uh, specifically um, uh, yeah in relation to those judicial reforms so that's our lineup throughout the day uh, if you are excited and interested and inspired by that lineup of guests as much as I am I have a few things to ask you to do before we get going with the show the first of them is to hit that subscribe button. If you hit subscribe, it means that you won't miss out on any of the future shows when we go live, all the other videos that we put out. 
but it also means that you'll help Bright Green out massively. This show will appear in more people's feeds and therefore more people will get to watch the show. If you also hit like, the very same thing happens. It'll appear in more people's feeds, more people will get to watch it. And the most important thing you can do to help the show out is to share the link on your social media, preferably with the hashtag Bright Green Live. If you share the link, more people will get to see it, we'll get more people watching and everyone will be joyous. Now, throughout the show, obviously, I'm going to be putting questions to our guests, but there's also the opportunity for you to put questions to our guests as well. So throughout the show, if you're able to get, if you have any burning questions you want to ask, please do pop them in the chat and I'll try and get to as many of them as possible. I can see there's already some brilliant questions lined up in the chat already and I'll try and get to as many of them as I can. The easiest way for me to get to them is if you put them in the chat nice and early, I can see them, get them lined up and get them ready to put to our guests in the interviews. So get your questions lined up in the chat and hopefully I'll be able to get as many of them to them as possible. The last thing you need to know uh, on the show today is that throughout the show, we are going to be running a game of Guess Who. Now, we started this on the last show where essentially I'm going to give you a series of in clues in decreasing difficulty throughout the show. And you've got to guess who the person that I'm referring to is. Now, the one rule on this is that the person that I'm referring to is a significant figure on the left of politics. They may be alive, they may be dead, they may be historical, they may be contemporary. But the key thing is they're a significant figure on the left. I've got two mystery people I'm going to be giving you clues to, to throughout the day. The first of which I'm going to give you the very first clue to now. Uh, so our first mystery person, our first historically significant person on the left was born in Essex. So please get your guesses in the chat for who that mystery person could be, who is a significant figure on the left and is was born in Essex. Whilst you're doing that, whilst you get yourself ready, hit subscribe, hit like. Sean Barry will be joining us very, very shortly. I'm just going to take a little look through the chat so we can see who is joining us. So Ben Samuel is with us again. Thank you, Ben, a regular long time listener who has uh, kindly said they're watching from England. And Ben has corrected my pronunciation of Yahad, which uh, I must admit my pronunciation is going to be bad throughout the show on that organization's name. Uh, I'm not great. I apologize. We've got some great questions that Ben's put in the chat and also uh, also uh, regular viewer Steve C has put some in the chat as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Mike Dixon is joining us from uh, Brighton. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and uh, I going to get to your comment in a little while because uh, we are going to be joining joined by Sean very, very soon. Uh, but thanks so much, Mike, for joining from Brighton. Um, and thank you to everyone who is with us now. Uh, thank you also to uh, Kelsey, who uh, said on Twitter that they are tuning in now to watch Bright Green Live, to watch Sean Barry. Thank you so much for joining us, Kelsey. And thank you for sharing the link on Twitter. Everyone be more like Kelsey. So Sean will be joining us in just a minute's time. If you haven't already, hit subscribe, hit that like button, and we'll be getting uh, ready very, very soon. Ben Samuel has guessed in the chat that our first mystery person is Aaron Kiley. Uh, I'll leave viewers to see whether they agree with that. Uh, the first clue to our first mystery person was, of course, that they were born in Essex. Um, so Charlotte will be joining us very, very soon, and then we'll kick off proper with the show. We're here until 6 p.m., so get yourself nice and comfortable, get yourself a tea, a coffee, whatever it is that you need to keep you going. And uh, we'll be getting going very, very soon with the first of our interviews. If you're just joining us, you're watching episode six of Bright Green Live, a monthly show on YouTube where we bring together some of the most interesting, exciting and inspiring guests from across the left and uh, speak to them about the stuff they're doing and uh, why they're interesting. And uh, we have uh, conversations about issues, about strategy uh, and much, much more. And we're going to be delving into a lot of that throughout the day today, including very, very shortly with our first guest, the former co-leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, three-time London mayoral candidate, Sean Berry, London Assembly member since 2016, and a councillor in Camden. Uh, please do get your questions lined up for Sean in the chat. I'm going to be speaking to her about the Greens' impact on the London Assembly 
over the last 23 years since the Greens have been in the Assembly. Uh, I've just uh, seen that Sean Zoom is updating, so she'll be with us very, very soon. And wonderfully on cue, she is here now. So as I um, let Sean into the room, I'll just do a brief introduction so you know who you're hearing from, although I'm sure she knows needs no introduction. Sean Berry is, of course, a former co-leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, and she's been a London Assembly member since 2016. She stood for London Mayor three times and is a councillor in Camden. We're going to be talking about the impact of the Green Party on the London Assembly over the next 20 minutes or so. But before we delve into any of that, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Sean. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm good. Thank you very much. Sorry, my, I was a bit a minute late because my Zoom decided to update and you said don't click on it because you'll be live instantly. So I didn't until the minute and then and then it took a minute. Sorry. Not at all. No need to apologise. Uh, tech issues as they go. That one is fine. Uh, that one's normal. I'm, I'm not on mute. Okay. So that's the start, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're doing well. Um, so as I said, we're going to talk about the impact of the Greens Mill in the Assembly. So since the Assembly was founded in the year 2000, the Greens have been represented on it. So 23 years, the Green Party has had seats on the London Assembly. What do you think are the big achievements the Greens have had over that time? Well, I mean, we could do an hour and a half on this if you want it. <laughs> I mean, I've got to start with um, Darren and Jenny's achievements because because they had an extraordinary period where Ken Livingstone was the mayor and didn't have enough votes on the assembly because we've got lovely PR um, to pass his own budget. So that meant he had to come to us and make a deal every year. Um, and they got some really, really fundamental things sorted out during that period. They got the living wage unit in the GLA set up that actually started to sit down properly to calculate what a living wage ought to be. And that is and that um, you know they've changed who does the calculations now the living wage foundation do it i've got you know a little bit of beef with with some of their calculations but the core methodology the fact that you look at the the amount you need to live off sensibly and then you work out what the wage should be is is there and was established properly by you know economists and all those all those kind of people that the establishment takes seriously as a result of the greens putting money into that there's there's loads of other things they did though i think one of the the most iconic is um the way they dealt with the thames gateway bridge which people might not know was a was a very large motorway bridge that was going to be built across the Thames. The successor scheme to that is the Silvertown Tunnel, which uh, Boris Johnson revived and now Sadiq Khan is pursuing. But that was a plan by Ken Livingston to build a big road in London, which was just the weirdest thing. We, we couldn't understand why he was doing that, given so many of his other policies on transport were pretty, pretty good. Um, and what we did with the budget there, we couldn't, you know, we had power, but we didn't have enough power simply to say this needs to be cancelled right now. That was, you know, it's part of his manifesto. He was going to do it. But we got money given to the objectors, the, the green groups, the local residents to, again, put money into expert research, expert testimony at the public inquiry, which ultimately defeated that plan. <laughs> so that kind of clever ways to empower residents to have their own say in a credible way to change policy was was just a really, really clever bit of work. Um, I mean, other things they did and work they started that, that we've carried on with are things like the uh, work for estate residents, Darren Johnson's work, um, some really good reports on that that came out um, in the years before I became an assembly member were the basis for a lot of my work. And we've taken that on since then uh, we've won ballots for residents on the state which are a start they're not perfectly set up so i you know the last thing i did on this last summer was publish a report showing where there are uh, issues with with landlords still having a bad attitude towards their residents and, and not running the ballots properly trying to get those rules changed that's work I continue supporting residents across London um, and that's important ongoing work I mean it's not always about the big the big policies and the big sudden you know changes you can often just build power for, for people in London build support in a in a more ongoing way um and then sorry it's a very long answer because you've given me a bit of a long question i'm afraid um 
And then more recently, I have to say, I'm, you know, I'm really proud of the work we did on youth services, um, turning that from something the mayor recognised there was a problem with councils cutting youth services, big squeeze due to austerity on council budgets. Young people were coming off worse, you know, maybe because they don't vote when you're under 18. You know, those are all issues that led to this. But the mayor started off, the current mayor, Sadiq Khan, started off saying, I don't believe that's my job. I believe that's the council's job. When I started saying, can you put some money into youth services? Eventually did turn around and recognise that he had a public health role. He had a role in supporting young people in London and has put tens of million, millions of pounds back into youth services. And that's, you know, that's made a genuine difference on the ground. And, you know, it was our work that did it. The mayor himself often brings up spontaneously saying that it was our influence that made him do that. And I just think that's, that's absolutely fantastic. We're three quarters of the way now to doing the same thing with toilets, which is really exciting. Um, transport for London. I don't know if you, you know, if you come to London, you'll you will know that there is not when you get on the tube, there is not a sign in every tube station going here are the toilets like you get at a normal station because they don't they haven't really believed that their job was to provide public toilets as part of the transport system. That's just wrong, and and we have got all the way to getting the, as in we, Caroline Russell, who is our absolute leader on the toilets issue, um, has got all the way to getting the Assembly passing a budget amendment um, at the first meeting where we have to get a simple majority to pass a budget amendment to put money back into putting toilets into stations. And then at the final budget meeting, I, at the very beginning, I said, you know, you need, you need to have a two thirds majority to change the budget. Um, Ken Livingston used to need our votes for that. Currently, um, we have a majority on the Assembly who are not Labour members. All of those members voted to put money into toilets in the final budget meeting. So it was left to the Labour group alone to block that. So we had a lot of publicity for the headline Labour blocks toilets, which I'm very proud of. Oh, you're in his own right. And I think that publicity the fact that they've been politically embarrassed for not standing by something which is so obvious and so affordable and something we put forwards in a properly worked out amendment I just think that's going to happen but but we'll see that's for that's for this year coming so you said earlier that I asked you a really big question which was 23 years of green successes which was big I'm going to ask you another massive question now uh which is I did that in like uh, six so minutes so, you know some credit please thank you yeah <laughs> very, very well done. Uh, you covered less, what's that, like uh, one one year, three, three years in a minute or something like that. Um, but uh, the next question I want to put to you is uh, equally big. So you're obviously in the Assembly uh, holding Sadiq Khan to account. What is your and the Green Party's biggest critique of how Sadiq Khan has been running London? Oh, I mean... We sit there, you know, every month we sit there and we ask him questions and, and we see, you know, we see him going about doing his publicity. And um, I have to say, you know, there's 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 a lack of vision, there's a lack of leadership and a lack of really decisive action, particularly on the climate. There's there's far too many ways in which he will half do something like the ultra low emission zone. He first of all took it to the north and south circulars, which leaves out, you know, in area and in population, most Londoners from protection from from dirty air, um, and and now he's doing the whole of London because he should have done it in the first place. It was it was almost before the initial expansion came in that he recognised it needed to be London wide. So that was you know a terrible error on his part. And by leaving it, by doing it in two stages, by leaving it till now, when there's a really frightening, growing, um, right-wing, joined-up conspiracy-type situation where people are really exercised about absolutely anything that happens on our streets and prepared to be quite violently um, oppositional to it. Now we're, we're making, we as London, are making the ultra emission zone London-wide. Um, that's facing an enormous backlash, which could have been avoided if he just had the vision and the strength to put it forwards as a London wide measure in the first place. And there are quite a few things like like that. Um, I think particularly on climate, we've seen uh, a big scandal recently where they put some money into supporting solar panels on people's roofs, which is a nice thing. Um, and then 
outsourced the entire program. So didn't, you know, didn't want to keep it in house, didn't want to, to, to make it a proper GLA initiative, you know, weren't keeping their eye on things. And one of the, so that they, they subcontract, they contracted it to a choosing app who then contracted subcontracted a um a company to do some of these installations who turned out to be and i don't think i'll be sued for saying this um complete cowboys <laughs> basically mm-hmm. and i you know my inbox is absolutely full of people um you know, i would say dozens and dozens probably over a hundred people have written to me saying this company's let me down can you help and, and i've been doing that i've been sending the the cases off to the mayor's team but the the fundamental problem lies in underpowering and outsourcing this program and it's you know it's that kind of thing and then thirdly the the last thing i'd add is on too many things he shrugs his shoulders and says the government need to do this and you know that's you, you, we've had the big battle over transport for london funding and that has been you know you can see the government exercising its elbow and trying to um, tell London what to do, trying to, you know, micromanage things like what pension schemes we have. And, you know, that that has been their big thing. But then there are many, many other issues where he he does the same thing. And and that's, you know, that's how he started out with youth services as well. And that's his natural instinct. And and I think for someone who's, sta- who's supposed to stand up for the city and represent the city um, and all of Londoners do deserve a stronger voice, a firmer voice for them against the government but also doing things showing the government what can be done is more of what he should be doing rather than just blaming the government and so you mentioned some of this already but what are the big things that you're working on in the assembly right now oh um so you've caught us right in the because it's april and there are no meetings in april we're in the east happy easter by the way um i hope you're enjoying your four-day weekend um, so we're in the Easter break and we're leading up to our final year of this assembly term. So uh, me and Caroline and Zach, we're doing all our, our planning ahead um, and seeing what it is we can finish off, what we can get through, what we can finally get sorted out during our final year. So so for Caroline, there's a really exciting thing about to happen. She's about to be chair of the Police and Crime Committee. Now, I don't think... And I, I prepared to be wrong about this. I don't think we've ever had that chair in, as a green group in the assembly before. And the year that it's happened is the most crucial year for scrutiny of the police. The police need to absolutely transform themselves or or else, basically. Mm-hmm. And the, the Casey report that just came out um, confirmed a lot of what we already knew, a lot of the criticisms we've been making of the police um, for years are, are reflected in that with evidence. They have to sort that out. And Caroline's job as chair of the committee is not just to sit there and, you know, spout our, our opinions. It's to, to, to shape the scrutiny that takes place, to make sure that all of the things that are in KCR are, are discussed that the police are held to account for what they absolutely need to do next and I just don't think we could have a better chair of the committee than Caroline on this one she's she's been so good since she took over the scrutiny of the police and so convincing and calm and relentless she's been working on child strip search for a while now and you'll have seen the the evidence that came out this week about the racial bias that's in that you know we we were we've been asking questions about that and getting them not answered by the police for for some time and that kind of um what's the word determination relentlessness in asking the right questions is something she's so good at so that's that's really exciting um zach's work is also we've got a huge opportunity because um, he chairs. He has chaired the Environment Committee for two years. He's our lead on environment and climate. He's just done a really good thing in the committee, which is get all the all the groups um, to agree by you know by consensus a, a policy that there shouldn't be um, airport expansion at, at City Airport, and that's something you know, we haven't got all the parties to agree on before. It's something Sadiq Khan didn't didn't agree on when he first came in. So that's just really good work getting getting a consensus around that. But we've also had for the first time this year the mayor attempting to put m- numbers on his budget 
that actually show the climate impact of the measures that we're, we're paying money for. And we've got 20 billion pounds in our budget each year. So that's a lot. Um, and this year's tables were not amazing, but they were a start. There were, there were, there were errors. There, there's lots missing. Um, each of the different parts of the GLA are laying out some projects essentially that they might do that affect our climate impact. By next year, we need that to be very rigorous and, and Zach will be spending a lot of time on that. Um, and my jobs are transport and housing and planning. Um, I've got an awful lot to do on, I think, fares this year um, because fares have gone up um, two years in a row now um, and they are really unfair. Um, you know, we're not we're not seeing the the right division of payments between different people traveling in different ways across London. So I've got a lot of work to do on that. Um, and then in housing and planning, um, I think the, the most exciting idea out there at the moment is the idea that we must be switching ten years between homes that already exist. You'll you know you'll know that that the housing debate is always about shouting out numbers of homes that we need to build. And then, then you get into a big row between, you know, what so-called NIMBYs and so-called YIMBYs about what gets built where. And actually, the biggest impact we can make on um, people's lives is not the, the tiny percentage of new homes that get built each year, but what happens to the homes that already exist. And we've started to be able to show that it's good value for the government, for councils to purchase homes from private landlords to increase the social housing stock. Um, and we're starting to, we being sort of me talking about it in the assembly, which I've been doing for a while, but also you've got um, think tanks and NGOs out there who are doing the work. NEF produced a really good report on this recently. The Smith Institute, um, worth looking up as well. Um, there's there's various people thinking, actually, we do need to do work to, to reverse the impact of right to buy to switch 10 years back to the sort of mix we used to have because there's no quicker way of doing it and in terms of the costs and benefits it, it completely works it, it, it can it completely works even when you're not counting things like health benefits it's good value to do it and so you're like you're like that chris won't you so so bringing bringing housing back into public hands is essentially the the mission for this year and and my goal is to make it, again, a consensus issue so that every party is talking about how many homes they'll do this with rather than just whether or not we should do it by the time of the next election. So that's all our strategy. I hope everyone in the other parties is taking notice. <laughs> and so that so segues... You disagree with that. It's question. all good ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so in terms of strategy, uh, so obviously Londoners are going to go to the uh, polls next May, so in a year's time. And uh, for, for viewers who don't know, the Greens have had between th two and three assembly members for the whole of the 23 years of the assembly's existence. Obviously, in May next year, you're hoping to get more seats and so that you can spread some of that incredibly busy workload that you've got between more and get more Green representatives and so on. Um, what are the issues the Greens are going to be prioritising in those elections next year? Ah, yeah, well, that's a really good point, actually. The fact that we've had Zach um, added to me and Caroline for the last three years has been absolutely amazing. You know, the amount of extra work we've been able to do, the amount of um, additional issues we've been able to put full, um, you know, full focus on has been has been huge. Um, we are we are absolutely aiming to gain more assembly members next year. And we've got a fantastic new candidate for mayor um, who will be elected to the assembly if we if we increase our numbers as well. Um, that's Zoe Garbett. And I know you've you've had her on. Um, she's got really good track record as a councillor in Hackney, as a candidate for mayor in Hackney. She got 17% in that mayor election, um, which is a lot more than the eight I got when I stood for mayor last. So, you know, we're expecting a lot from Zoe there. Um, but also, I think, you know, the issues she brings in are really exciting as well. Um, Caroline's done some work on reducing drug harm, for example. But the reason we we knew Zoe in the first place is because she'd spent all that time on the, the drugs policy working group, really sorting out the Green Party's drugs policies, you know, updating them, not, not changing them utterly because they were kind of they were right in the first place, but making them really practical, getting the, you know, the details updated for for a new age and really focusing on the public health aspects of it and she works in public health so I think that is going to be a 
key part of our, our platform, like drawing on Zoe's experience with the drugs issue, but also the wider public health sphere as well because so so many of the policies we talk about you know we're shouting out numbers of homes like I said really what we're talking about here is giving people a healthy environment to, to grow up particularly children you know an overcrowded home a mouldy home incredibly bad for your health for your mental health for your education if we're talking about a public health approach to everything that will be a really really good election um focus for us um but obviously there are you know there are wider issues zoe's also been really good at um looking at the over policing of um people from um minority groups um she stood up for the um the the, the riders who do the food deliveries who who faced a um a really aggressive police raid um right in her ward and she was straight out there like on the streets she was liaising with the the mayor of Hackney to make sure that they they weren't necessarily just taking the police line on what this was all about um she's she's a really clear thinker and a really good activist she has all the right instincts I'm just really looking forward to to what she does in the next year and, and how that campaign goes with her on the on the platform because one thing we've been able to do with the mayor I think is the current mayor is influence him by just modeling a kind of politics that he actually can't help but be impressed by and then tries to emulate <laughs> on things like the police you know on things like rent controls he's he's seen us advocating for things and and actually changed his rhetoric to match and i think that is an influence we can have and i think zoe being up on that platform will be really really exciting you'll have to listen to a new green he's used to us now you'll have to listen to a new green and that'll be <laughs> that'll be really interesting to see what happens so as you mentioned zoe and the mayoral campaign there i just wanted to ask you one thing about that which is obviously the three times that you've stood to be london mayor you've stood under a system where uh voters get a first and a second preference vote uh next year will be the first time the election takes place under the antiquated undemocratic first past the post what impact do you think that's going to have on the greens campaign i'll be honest i don't think it's going to have that much impact at all and particularly not on the votes because the the tories and the labor party have always fought the mayor election as if it was first past the post um and they're the ones with all the all the reach so all the election adverts that you saw from um, the you know, current mayor from the Conservatives were all that classic, you know, don't vote for us or, or you'll let the Tories in, don't vote Green or you'll let the Tories in. All of that was, all of that rhetoric was all, always flying around and we've always had to, to fight it to get the vote that we get in the mayor election. So I don't think it'll make any difference to that election particularly. What it might do, which is quite, quite nice, is there are a lot of people out there who voted second preference for mayor. Um, you know, I've, I've, uh, last election, I got the most second preferences of any candidate. Um, it was over 20 percent of people cast their second vote for the Greens. Um, and they like doing that. We know that they like doing that. We've, you know, we've talked to people. Um, it's something that they feel like that is a, you know, is a, is a statement of their own values. And if they can't give that statement as an X in the second preference box, then more of them might use it for an X in the in the assembly um election so that i think bodes very well for us getting the the extra extra votes that we need to get to get five or more assembly members at the moment we only need about one percentage point more to get another to get a fourth assembly member we were quite close we were on the upper end of that um scale before that's that's a that's a target we can very much aim at but if more people do feel like their vote for the Greens needs to go somewhere, then it goes on the Assembly, then we could get even more. So I I, you agree with that, Chris? Sorry, because you, I know you're you're a you're a an analyst of all of this. Do I agree with that? That's an interesting question. I think <laughs> um, I think it depends what the media do, right? Because if the media change the way they report on the election and present it even more as a two horse race, I think that could have significant ramifications um so i think that that would be a worry for me in terms of the greens campaign if if the if the media goes well this is now first past the post there's literally no chance that anyone else is going to get in so uh we prioritize that at least before the offcom rules kick in in the run-up to the election um yeah we've not known that so far yeah. though so yeah yeah so i mean it's because of the assembly being proportional and because of us being the the third largest group on the assembly 
um we're we're doing extremely well for coverage of our work at the moment um on the assembly we've 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 yeah, we've had loads of really good coverage on the on the regional news, on the evening standards, doing an awful lot of coverage of, of Caroline's work, particularly. So, uh, yeah, I, I've not noticed that yet. But, you're, yeah, you're right. I don't think they can turn around and exclude us from debates um, any more than they did before. And again, you know, this is always been a problem. So it's not like it's going to get much worse, I don't think. Interesting. Yeah, well, we'll definitely see how that pans out. Um, I'm going to come to some questions from the chat now. So last reminder for people to pop any questions in the chat. Oh, I didn't know there were questions. Um, OK, sorry. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so they're, they're, they're always lovely. Our viewers never ask anything too difficult. So Steve C has um, asked, how can the success and influence of the L Greens on the London Assembly be replicated across the country where there are different systems of first voting, but also how local government works? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, well, this year, I, I talk a lot about the budget process because that is a really crucial part of our work every year. Even if we don't have the cast, casting vote, what we get during that process is an awful lot of really, you know, really accountable numbers to do with what's being spent on what and the opportunity to propose changes and access to more information. If we need to know something for our budget amendment, that information comes back to us far more quickly during that process, during that period than normally. Because often if we ask a difficult mayor's question, it can sit there for months. They can put that off for a long time. But during the budget process, we get the answers that we need to make policy proposals. Um, and that's that's something that every councillor group can do. And now we've got more groups in different councils across the country. I noticed this year um, during the budget period, so many of our councillor groups posting and talking about their budget amendments, campaigning around their budget amendments, which is something we've always done as well. So I don't know if it's our influence, but it's certainly something that Greens in councillor groups across the country are using our, our, our premier tactic for influence, which is properly costed proposals at budget time, because they have an influence. If, if you've done a really good one, what happens the following year is the administration comes forwards with that as if it was its own idea. And that's that's the best victory you can get. <laughs> yeah, as the Oxford City Council Green Group finance spokesperson and budget lead, I can very much concur with all of that, including that the administration will bring your uh, budget amendments in the next year so any councillors watching highly recommend yeah and again uh, that I think as a having them written down in a budget amendment is is the proof you need that it was your idea in the first place exactly yes um so i have one last question for you and then i'll let you enjoy the rest of your easter weekend um so uh it's unrelated to london again uh but so obviously in uh four weeks time now uh across england we're going to have council elections across the country um the Greens uh, leadership, Carla and Adrian, have both said that uh, the Green Party is on track to win, gain over 100 more seats. Um, firstly, how many seats do you think the Greens are going to be winning and uh, how important do you think these elections are coming up? Oh, my goodness. Well, they're super important. So the one of the first things I did six months after I became co-leader was welcome in the equivalent results in 2019. So these are the seats we were defending all these seats that we won in 2019. And there were so many of them. I mean, I had sorry, something just fell down in my flat. Um, I had um, you know the spreadsheet that you get from the, the election team telling us what to look out for, because I'm like I was spending the, the whole night. On, in the TV and radio studios. So I had on my iPad, you know, access to the spreadsheet where the gains would appear and all of that. And each one had, you know, likely to get or possible. And when I was watching it go by, so many of the possibles were coming through. People were breaking through onto new councils the first time they tried. I mean, that was extraordinary stuff. Now this year we're, we're defending those seats and trying to gain new seats on the same councils. So I just don't I just don't know. I mean, in theory, we, we ought to be on for the same magnitude of gains. I would have thought not many green councillors um, win a breakthrough and then lose it. And quite often we can we can make a further gain based on their hard work. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'd go with what Carla and Adrian say, basically. Yeah. And we're going to delve into more though. It could be more because the you know, the possibles we underestimate. We're always a bit cautious. 
so that's a beautiful segue to my next interview, which is going to be with Al Folan from Stats for Lefties. And we're going to be delving into where the Greens could be making some big games. Uh, they will definitely. Uh, they're get them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're getting their spreadsheets out. So, yeah, um, it's been an absolute pleasure as always, Sean. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Sorry about my long answers, but they were big questions, Chris. Thank you very much. They were, yeah. <laughs> Next time I get you on, I'll give you really narrow, specific questions instead. Yeah, that's yes, please. Good. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Sean. Cheers. So that was Sean Berry, the former co-leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, a three-time London mayoral candidate, a member of the London Assembly and a councillor in Camden. If you enjoyed that interview, please do hit the subscribe button. Please do hit like and please do share the link to the stream on your social media. If you enjoyed it, other people will too. So if you do all those things, more people will see it. I'd also love to hear in the chat what you thought about that interview as well. So let us know there if you have any comments or thoughts. So as I just said at the end there, our next guest is going to be Al Folan from Stats for Lefties. And we're going to be delving into uh, this year's local elections and what's likely to happen where are the big areas where the Green Party could make big gains? Uh, what's the state of play for Labour and the Lib Dems and the other parties as well? And much, much more besides. So stay tuned. At 11 o'clock, I'll be joined by Elle and we'll be having that conversation. Um, thank you to everyone who is watching and everyone who has been commenting throughout. Sorry, I didn't get to all of your comments and questions, uh, but please do get them in for our next set of guests. And I'll try and uh, put as many to, of them to them as I can. Now, just a little reminder, um, we are throughout the show going to be playing a game of Guess Who, where I give you a series of clues for a mystery person who is a prominent figure on the left. Could be alive, could be dead, could be contemporary, could be historical. The one thing is, you don't know who they are yet. They're a mystery person and they are a significant figure on the left. So the first clue I gave you earlier was that this mystery person was born in Essex. We've had some guesses in the chat already. Please do get more in because the second uh, clue for our mystery person is that this mystery person died in 2014. So you're looking for someone who was born in Essex and died in 2014. Get your guesses in the chat for our mystery person on the left, please. Thank you, Steve C. Steve C says, thanks, Sean. Uh, thanks, Steve, for being a regular viewer. And thank you, of course, to Sean, who is always a pleasure to have on Bright Green. Uh, in the interview with Sean, um, she mentioned a number of different things about Zoe Garbutt, who is the Green Party's London mayoral candidate. And she mentioned that we've had Zoe on the show before. We have indeed. So if you uh, if you get a few minutes at some point, uh, head to our YouTube channel, click on the YouTube channel, and you can find the interview that I did with Zoe a few months ago now um, on there, where we talked about uh, her candidacy for London Mayor, what she's seeking to prioritise and so on. Sean also mentioned the campaigning that uh, Zoe has done around uh, uh, riders, uh, I think delivery riders, if I recall correctly, and the uh, raids that have taken place in Hackney and the work she's done on that. Um, Zoe's written uh, for Bright Green on our website about uh, the work that the Greens in Hackney have been doing to support uh, gig economy workers and uh, riders in particular. So you can find that on our website. There's links to our website in the description of this video, bright-green.org, if you want to check those out. Whilst you're on our website, the one amazing thing you could do throughout the show is to set up a regular donation. The reason that I ask you to do this is because Bright Green does not have the backing of billionaires or big business. We rely solely on the kind and generous support and donations of people just like you. So if you are able to, please do head to our website, bright-green.org forward slash donate. There's a link in the description and you can set up a regular donation or a one-off donation. Everything helps. But the only reason we're able to put out shows like this, all our articles on our website, all the other interviews and content we put out on YouTube is because of the kind of generous support of people just like you. So please do set up a donation if you can. Of course, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. It helps Bright Green out massively. It means that you won't miss out on our future uh, episodes of this show. And it also means that other people will get to see it because it will appear in their feeds. Um, just going to go to a few comments that have popped up on the socials. Uh, so Meg Shepherd Foster, a regular viewer of the show, has just tweeted a lovely photo of them leafleting uh, in Maidstone uh, and is tuning in whilst uh, doing their leaflet rounds. Uh, so thank you so much, Meg, for joining us. And I hope 
uh, your leaflet round is dog free and enjoyable um, as well. Uh, thank you to Kelsey again for sharing the link to the show on your socials. If you uh, want to share the show link, please do so using the hashtag Bright Green Live and um, that will get more people watching. Um, so our next interview is at 11 o'clock. I'm going to take a very, very, very brief break because I haven't yet had any breakfast. I woke up late today, so I'm going to wolf down some breakfast in the next two minutes. I'll be back very, very shortly uh, for the for our next interview and we can crack on with the rest of the day. Uh, but thanks so much for joining us. Stay tuned. Hit like, hit subscribe, share the video, do all the stuff along the way. Get questions lined up in the chat for our future guests and for me. And we'll come to as many of them as we can. But I'll be back in about two or three minutes time. Oh, hello, hello. We are back. Sorry for the brief intermission. Uh, I have coffee number three with me now. 
and we are you're watching bright green live episode six we have an amazing array of guests still to come we have Elle Folan, who's going to be joining us very, very shortly. They are from Stats for Lefties and a columnist at Navarra Media. We're going to be discussing the local elections that are coming up uh, in May and looking at the Green Party's prospects uh, in those elections and much, much more besides. If you haven't already, please do hit like, please do hit subscribe. Um, and uh, that means that you won't miss out on any of our videos. It means the show will appear in more people's screens and in more people's screens, more people's feeds and much, much more um so please do hit like uh we're aiming to get to 50 likes by the end of the show we're currently on 10 there's 16 people watching so there's some way to go so if you haven't already please do hit like um and the best thing about hitting like is that uh well firstly you don't have to do it again it's free and it makes me happy so if you want to make me happy hit like uh so also coming up later on in the show uh this morning we have samuel sweet from the um peace and justice project talking about the Music for the Many campaign, which is trying to save music venues across the UK um, and defend live music venues. Uh, we'll have uh, Gwyn, Gwynphil from the uh, Welsh Independence Campaign Group, Yes Cymru, coming on later today at about 12.30 to talk about the movement for Welsh independence. We have Martin Butcher to talk about NATO and the Green Party's new policy on that. Maisha Begum from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective talking about the 10 year anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse. Katie Montgomery, the YouTuber and activist talking about the EHRC's latest guidance um, on the Equality Act and the impact that could have on trans rights and trans people. Alex Powell, who's a lecturer at Oxford Brooks University to talk about the impact of the government's anti-migrant legislation on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. And finally, closing the show at five o'clock, we have Danielle Bett from Yahad, and she'll be talking about the uh, protests in Israel against um, Benjamin Netanyahu's judicial reforms and the impact that's having on uh, attitudes towards the Israeli government, both in Israel and the Jewish diaspora outside of Israel's uh, attitudes as well. So that's all to come uh, in the next ooh, seven hours of your life. The long day, but we have amazing guests. We have amazing viewers. Uh, so please do stay tuned for that. If you're just joining us throughout the show, we're also running a game of Guess Who, where I'm going to give you a series of clues in decreasing difficulty to a mystery person who is a significant figure on the left. They may be alive, they may be dead, they may be historical, they may be contemporary. I've given you two clues so far to the first of our mystery person. So please do get your guesses in the chat for this mystery person. They were born in Essex and they died in 2014. So please do get your guesses in the chat for who that significant figure on the left is and who they might be. Um, so we can see whether you can get my clues and win the Guess Who competition. Uh, there's no prizes except the joy and privilege of being the winner. Um, so you get that little uh, smugness throughout the rest of your Easter Sunday and the rest of your Easter weekend. Our next guest is Al Folan from Stats for Lefties. If you're not familiar with Stats for Lefties, it is a Twitter account and a blog that uh, logs um, polling data, election numbers, and looks at it from a left-wing perspective. And Elle is the election analyst and statistician, the genius behind uh, that, um, behind Stats for Lefties. And we're going to be delving into the local elections that are coming up in about a month's time in England and Northern Ireland and looking at the, uh, the prospects the Greens have of gaining seats in them. And... Uh, Elle's also a columnist at Navarra Media as well um, and writes brilliant articles on uh, public attitudes, on opinion polling, on elections and much, much more besides. So Elle will be joining us very, very soon. Please do get questions lined up for Elle in the chat. I'll try and get as many to them of them to them as possible. Um, the best way you can do that is to get them lined up nice and early because the earlier that I see them, the more likely it is that I'll be able to put them to them. And uh, yeah, I'll try and get as many of them to them as possible. So get your questions lined up for L in the chat, who will be joining us very, 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 very shortly. Um, thank you to everyone who has shared the link to the show on your social media channels. Um, you can follow Bright Green on all the socials. We're at BrightGRN on Twitter. We're facebook.com forward slash BrightGRN on the Facebooks. We are at Bright Green Online on 
the Instagrams. And we're also on Mastodon, but I don't know whether people are using that anymore, but there's a link in the description if you need to find us on there as well. So make sure you follow Bright Green on all the socials to keep up to date with everything we're doing and all of our content, articles on the website, uh, our videos, interviews, so much more. Follow us on the socials and you won't miss a thing. Very, very shortly, we'll be joined by Elle Folan from Stats for Lefties. Please do get your questions lined up for them in the chat so that I can put as many of them to them as I can. Uh, I'm going to be asking Elle a series of questions about the upcoming local elections, including the prospects of the Greens winning seats across the country um, and looking at some of the areas where the Greens might win big. Um, do get your questions in the chat so that I can put as many of them to them as possible. They'll be joining us very, 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 very shortly. And I can see that Al has just entered the waiting room. So as I let Al into the call, I'll just let our viewers know who they're going to be hearing from and seeing in a moment or two. So Al Folan is the election analyst and statistician behind the highly popular uh, Twitter account and blog, Stats for Lefties, also a columnist uh, for Navarra Media. We're going to be talking today about the upcoming local elections and the prospects the Greens um, have in those elections, where they could win seats and much, much more. Besides, before we delve into any of that, uh, firstly, Al, welcome back to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me on. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm on coffee number three. I'm still waking up, uh, but I am getting there and hopefully everything will go smoothly as it has done so far. So let's delve straight into it then. What's your assessment of the state of play for the political parties going into the 2023 local elections? Well, um, at the moment, the Labour Party leads in the polls by uh, 18 to 19 percentage points. And all of hist the history of the last like 30 years of local elections suggests that will lead to massive gains. In the last 30 years, um, there have been five times when the opposition has led by you know, big double digit margins going into local elections. And if you average these out, they point to a gains of about like a thousand council seats in the local elections for Labour and equivalent losses for the Tory party. Um, but I think there are reasons to think that Labour won't reap such massive rewards, um, even if the polls don't change. Firstly, Starmer has underperformed in local elections thus far. He did in 2021 and in 2022. In 2022 in England, he only gained 20 seats or 22 seats, which is vastly less than the Greens and Lib Dems gained. The second reason is... Labour's electoral coalition draws very extensively on people who voted Lib Dem last time around. And those people are very likely to vote Lib Dem in local elections when they come around, even if they do vote Labour in the general election. And the Lib Dems on top of that do much better in local elections anyway. You'll often see uh, the Lib Dems will poll like uh, eight, nine percent in voting attention polls around local elections. And then they'll do that projected national share of the vote, like how would the whole country have voted if they all voted? And the Lib Dems will be on like 14, 15 percent. And that basically reflects the fact that the Lib Dems are much better at mobilizing their vote in local elections and people just vote differently. And the final thing is Labour kind of suffers organizationally. It's not just that its active membership is lower than it was last time round, but in many parts of the country, it lacks an organizational presence. I mean, we're going to talk about Mid-Suffolk later. Um, on paper, Labour is in a good position to take both parliamentary seats in Mid-Suffolk, um, but it's only running eight set candidates for the 28 council seats. And in most of the wards, they're not standing at all. And that doesn't speak to a party that's very well organized or has enough of a presence to benefit from a labor surge even if it does happen so before we delve into the greens i'm going to ask you about the lib dems because you mentioned them there um so what do you think of the prospects the lib dems making big gains in these elections well they have done uh they did make very good gains last time and i think that reflected the fact they were having a bit of a, a very good time because they were 
on a on a, an upswing. They had by election gains from the Tories. They've I think they've had three at this point uh, in Tory safe seats. Uh, they have dipped a little in the polls since then, although they're averaging about 10 percent now. They're about 12 percent, 11 percent last time. Um, but as I say, they always do very well in local elections. And one thing that has to be borne in mind is the Tories are going to do very badly. And the Lib Dems are very good at sweeping up when the Tories do very badly, especially in local elections. And um, that I mean, that applies in general elections, too. There's going to be a lot of seats where the Tories are going to collapse in 2025 and the Lib Dems are just going to be sitting there waiting like, yes. Come to Ed, Davey. Yeah, and so for most of our viewers, it's the Greens prospects in these elections that are most interesting. So the Green Party's co-leaders, Carla Denyer and Adrian Ramsey, have talked about the uh, Greens gaining over 100 seats in this year's elections. The Greens are standing a record number of candidates this time. They're standing in 41% of the available seats, which is 10 percentage points more than they did in 2019, the last time these seats were up for election. How realistic do you think it is that the Greens will win more, gain more than 100 seats this time around? I think that's very realistic. I, I, when I saw that figure, I remember th- my first reaction was, I think they're underselling it. Um, if you think about it, that would represent an increase of about 40% in seats compared to the last, uh, to t- May 2019, um, which would be surprisingly low given the results of the past three years. Bear in mind, 2022, 119% increase, 2021, 140% increase, 2019, 273% increase. So a 40% increase, historically, that would be exceptional, but um, it, it would still be a slight cooling of the green surge, as it was, like slowing down. Um, for context, if we saw gains that were like basically equivalent to last year's, we'd be looking at 400 green gains, not 100. But I would imagine that's why they settled on that figure, because they know that Labour's surging the polls, they're likely to do far better than they did the last two years, even if they underperform. And, uh, you know, 100 is still, it's it's impressive and it's relatively realistic. So it's, I think it's good expectation management. Uh, I would be surprised if it was less than that. Um, but also, if it was that, 100, still pretty impressive. In raw numbers, it's still more than the last two years, just because there's more seats up. I guess the the other thing about this, this year's elections that we haven't touched on yet is that, uh, for the Greens at least, is that, because the Greens won so many seats in 2019, this year they are defending more seats than they've ever done before by quite some margin, because over 200 seats that they currently hold are up for re-election this year. Previously, they've only had to defend, you know, a couple of dozen. Do you think that has the potential to impact on how many gains the Greens can make? Because not only are they trying to make new inroads, but they're also having to hold the seats they've done before. I would have said that a few years ago, but basically the thing that the last two set of sets of local elections have proven is that the Greens success in May 2019 was not one off. If the Green Party had on the back of, you know, anti Brexit protests, which is a lot of a reason for a lot of surges in 2019, um, if they had surged to success and then gone back to totally normal in 2021 and 2022, then I'd say, yeah, you could be very worried about, you know, losing a bunch of seats, even if you gain a few, uh, causing the overall net figure to be to be low. But I think if you look at many of these places and many of the other places the Greens have gained in the last few years, they've basically solidified those gains and they've dug in and they've organized and they've kept that support uh, at or above what it was um last time round so uh, uh, you know the green party if you look at polls it's not a party necessarily at the moment surging to massive like poll numbers but it's not going down all that badly it was probably about five percent in may 2019 it's probably about five percent now i would be quite surprised to see them lose uh big numbers of seats especially because this is a set of local elections where the big story is going to be how many seats the tories lose and a lot of these places are places where if the Greens were going to go backwards, they would be going backwards in favour of the Tories. But Tories aren't going to be gaining anything this time round. 
So those people, I think, are going to stay green. And so let's talk about some of those places then. So where do you think are the councils where the Greens could make big gains this year? So about that chair's a bit squeaky. Um, well, it depends whether you mean like good results or big gains, because uh, Norwich and Brighton will obviously see very good results for Greens in terms of share of seats, but not as many gains because Norwich only has a third of seats up for election and Brighton already has a lot of Green councillors. Even if they win a majority, the numerical number of gains is going to be huge. Um, but in terms of big gains, I would say uh, Lancaster, sorry, <laughs> Lancaster, Lewis, Forest of Dean and Solihull. And in all these places, the Greens have performed quite well in the popular vote and have been slowly building their support, but they kind of lag behind in terms of seats. Forest of Dean, I think they won the popular vote in May 2019, but they're still second. Um, however, with the collapse of the Conservatives, which I don't think anyone seriously disputes that there will be a big Conservative collapse. I know I'm relying on that in my analysis, but while I, I wonder if Labour will benefit, I don't think anyone seriously contests it's going to be a big collapse in the Tory vote. So Tory collapse and some defections in Lancaster where a lot of um, Labour councillors became eco-socialists and they moved to the Greens. Uh, they have a golden opportunity to surge in all of those places uh, in a way that is more than just building on existing support. Like I think there'll be quite an increase that's notable. Interesting you mentioned Lan Lancaster because tomorrow I've got a piece coming out on Bright Green specifically looking at the Lancaster elections and they're talking about ending up on 20 or more seats. Um, yes, yeah. I would be very surprised if they win a majority because the problem that they have in Lancaster, as I'm sure you'll you'll observe, is that there's a lot of independents uh, and they'll take up a lot of seats that could otherwise be useful in winning a majority. But I, I would be surprised if they're not the largest part here. Yeah, so the, for, for viewers, the Lancaster Council covers a much wider area than just Lancaster. And outside of the city of Lancaster, you get a lot of independence. I think Morecambe uh, is, is the area where there's a lot of independence. But, oh, yeah, Morecambe um, independence. Exactly, yeah. But interestingly, the Greens are the only party, I think, to be running a full slate in Lancaster, so running every seat. And uh, the Labour Party there are in disarray um, after the string of defections and a whole bunch of other issues. Um, but some of the areas that I, I had on my kind of list of areas that there might be big green gains were Herefordshire and East Hertfordshire. I don't know whether you've looked into the detail of those and whether you have any commentary on whether the Greens could make big gains there. No, no, no that, 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 um, those two also sound about right. I mean, there's a lot of councils up for election, uh, a lot of rural areas that might be, uh, in the film industry, we call them sleeper hits. Like you wouldn't, they're not really on the radar and then they'll sort of come out of nowhere and surprise you. Uh, and I, I, those those two definitely sound to me like they would be sleeper hits for the Green Party. Um, I do find it interesting, and we'll talk about Mid-Suffolk later, that a lot of the places that uh, the Green Party has been doing well in, especially since May 2019, have been these sort of rural Tory areas where their appeal is less... Um, is is different to what it is in cities like Brighton, Bristol and, and Norwich. Yeah, I think that's an interesting dynamic because I guess in Brighton, Bristol, Norwich and the metropolitan areas, it's often we're the more left wing party than Labour. If you're disenfranchised by Labour, vote for us in the Tory areas. It's often we're the only non-Tory who can win. <laughs> and in a lot of places in these areas, it literally is only a Green or a Tory on the ballot paper. And that um, that's had a big impact. So you've talked a little bit you mentioned Mid Suffolk a few times, so let's look at Mid Suffolk. Talk us through the situation there. Hang on. Well, the Greens have been growing in Mid Suffolk for the last few set of elections, and in 2019 they burst through to win like 30% of the popular vote. Very impressive. Emerges the largest party uh, opposition party on the council. They have 12 seats. The Lib Dems have five. Labour have none. Uh, and then the Tories don't have a majority. But they were only one seat short, so they managed to stay in office, I think, with an independent support. And the Greens now only need to gain six of the 16 Conservative seats to win a majority, which would be the first majority of the Green Party on any council ever. They didn't even get it in Brighton, even in 2011, when they finally when they won minority control. 
In normal years, I would have said six or 16, a bit of a hefty challenge. Um, but in a year when they're collapsing and support across the country, I, not so much. I think it's doable. As, uh, yeah. And yeah, you mentioned there that it would be the first Green Majority Council anywhere in the country, which is obviously hugely historically significant. Are there other places that you think there's the prospect of the Greens gaining control, either in a minority or a majority administration? Uh, well, Brighton and Hove is obviously second on the list because they're already in minority control and they have a chance to go up, take seats, win majority. A little bit harder than Mid Suffolk, which is a strange thing to say, would have been a very strange thing to say to Greens 10 years ago. Like, it's more likely you're going to win in Mid Suffolk than in Brighton. Um, but it's because in Brighton, both the Tories and Labour are strong and they have a good seat, number of seats on the council, whereas in Mid Suffolk, there's basically no Labour Party. Um, to speak of. I think there's also a plausible chance that the Greens could end up as the largest party in the Forest Dean uh, and, and of course on in, in Lancaster. Lewis as well, I think they, they did very well in the popular vote last time. At the moment, I believe they have this sort of uh, arrangement with the Lib Dems where they uh, alternate the leadership of the council every year. So I, there was some confusion over that. I remember saying there's a uh, the number of green council leaders is this number and then people were like no 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 lewis is around the leader it's like but it, they were last year it's because they keep changing it but yeah so that, that, that's the answer very hippie-ish and confusing that uh switching leaders business so um i'm gonna ask you about the elections in northern ireland in a second but before i do that just a reminder to viewers please do um, get any questions you have for L in the chat about anything we'll be talking about or any other things related to the elections. If you're currently watching on Bright Green's website, if you click through to the YouTube video and watch it on YouTube, you should get access to the chat that way. Um, so the elections that are taking place in about four weeks' time are in England. There's also a set of elections that are taking place a couple of weeks afterwards in the north of Ireland. What can you tell us about those elections? Uh, well, there are elections for the, the local councils um, using the single transferable vote, like all elections in Northern Ireland. The political context is that the assembly remains shut down because the democratic unionists, the, the right wing, uh, far right unionists, um, are boycotting it. And the main thing to watch out for, I think, from an aggregate perspective is who emerges as the largest force in local government. Because at the moment, it's um, uh, the DUP, I believe. Uh, and uh, they've been, you know, top of the pile in uh, assembly elections very frequently until the most recent one when Sinn Féin uh, won the most seats and the most votes. So if Sinn Féin manages to once again surpass the DUP, uh, as polls suggest that they will, that that will indicate the voters have not moved on from uh, their opinions since the last assembly election. But if the DUP managed to seize the, the crown of leading party again, they'll be very, very happy with that. I imagine they'll see that their boycott of the assembly has paid off electorally and uh, either, you know, it may, it may carry on, which will not be great for Northern Ireland. So I'm not saying I'm hoping for a Sinn Féin victory. I'm just saying that would be the, uh, you know, Presumably, because the elections take place under STV, it's very, very challenging to predict anything there because of the complicated, nature, not com complex nature of the counting within the electoral system. Uh, yes, yes. Um, although it does, it, 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 that's mainly, a, a, it mainly makes it difficult to predict like wards, even uh, like ward elections, but um, it is a proportional system. So I think if if national polls, you know, polls of Northern Ireland are saying that um, Sinn Féin is going to win the most votes, it probably will. So, um, yeah. So it's not, there's not too much I'm, I'm I'm not Irish, but, you know. Not at all. No, that's it's helpful uh, nonetheless. So um, when we last had you on, we talked a little bit about the... Uh, the general election, the, the impending potentially by 2025 or maybe sooner general election. We talked about the Greens prospects in that. And thinking back now to the English local elections this year, if the Greens make these gains that we've been talking about, what do you think the potential impact of that is around the next general election? I think if the green party continues to make big gains in local elections and this really is a big test of them because 
they you know they made good ones in 2021 made good gains in 2022 um and if they make them again this time round then that's building on an already incredibly impressive performance and that really says that it was not at all a flash in the pan in any of those years and that i think suggests that the green pie is much stronger locally and organizationally than national polls would indicate which i think definitely points to results that people would not expect in places like bristol um and and maybe you know waveney valley where um adrian ramsey is, is is standing as the um the candidate uh because national polls can't pick up you know potentially big swings in bristol central which is going to be the new bristol west seat or or indeed in waveney valley or in brighton and so i think that if the local elections go very well then even if we haven't got any local election data in, in bristol because there aren't any this year then it does point to the fact that greens party continues to be strong and continues to even in the atmosphere of a massive swing to labor if they manage to make a ton of gains then that points to a very very strong party that's able to defy the national headwinds which to me that's a very good sign of course this is all hypothetical results are not in yet i don't want to call exactly. anything before it happens but um yeah I guess though that 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 poses an interesting question for I guess the Labour Party strategy because the Labour Party at the moment you know from from everything that we're seeing from their communications and their messaging and their policies and so on it basically seems like the approach they're taking is we need to win back uh, seats in the so-called red wall in the Midlands and North where you know you have slightly more socially conservative voters particularly pensioners. Um, and homeowners and the reality is that the electoral coalition that the Labour Party um, has the that they're, they're kind of progressive younger urban voters have nowhere else to go and so therefore they can tax the right on social issues like we've seen them doing on uh, trans rights on um, on migration on a whole bunch of so-called culture war issues I guess what's your what's your reflection on 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 that in terms of the how that intersects with the Greens vote share in elections? Because if the Greens are doing well, presumably that means that actually those voters do have somewhere else to go and they very much will go somewhere else if Labour continues to take these reactionary lines on on social issues. They most certainly do. One of the interesting observations to make about the last Labour government, particularly when it started getting more and more right wing on social issues, whether it was ID cards, immigration, people forget really really terrible policies new labor had on immigration or indeed on on foreign policy like the Iraq war was that a big beneficiary in places that had been strongly labor were the lib dems because they took the attitudes of we're against war we're against id cards we're in favor of social liberalism we want labor to go further on like lgbtq rights and things like that and they would clean up in places like you know you know, they do really well in places like Liverpool, in the London boroughs. Uh, they were, you know, at one point they were running like um, London boroughs that had been Labour for a very long time. And of course, since 2015, that has gone the way of the dodo because the Lib Dems lost an enormous amount of credibility with those very same voters. And even if they recover, it's not going to be the same electoral coalition they used to have. Uh, but those people... I think are receptive now instead to the Green Party. And you see this in local elections in London, for instance, where, you know, in places like Hackney or Newham, in Newham in particular is a very good case study where Labour voters are defecting to the Green Party in very large numbers. In Newham, in large enough numbers to give them the only seats on the council that are not Labour. Like the only the only non Labour councillors in Newham are Greens because they're the only people who can compete against the Labour Party in that borough. Uh, and a few, you know, a decade ago or so, that would have been the Lib Dems, but they they you know they completely uh, uh, threw themselves into the bin, and now the Green Party I think have taken their place as the competitor party to Labour in metropolitan liberal young areas. And of course, Bristol is the epitome of that, as is Brighton. Uh, and I think Norwich is a bit of a sleeper hit for that as well. They did kind of poorly in the last few years, but they're on the upswing again. It's interesting because obviously I'm based in Oxford and in Oxford in the um, New Labour era, 
it was, as you say, the Liberal Democrats that were the primary beneficiaries, also the Greens as well. The Greens in Oxford were, Oxford was one of the first places the Greens started winning substantial numbers of seats. But yeah, the Labour Party lost control of the council during the new Labour era in Oxford because the Lib Dems were mopping up votes across the city from those types of voters. Um, so very, very interesting indeed. And um, yeah, I think depressing as Labour's descent into kind of far right <laughs> positions is, it nevertheless is interesting to see what the ramifications of that will be um, on our politics. Um, so I'm going to let you enjoy the rest of your Easter Sunday now, Al. Uh, before I do, is there anything you wanted to plug, things that you've got coming up with Stats for Lefties, etc. at all? Uh, I just, yeah, encourage people to um, to go to at Lefty Stats on Twitter. We uh, recently hit 50,000 followers. It's very exciting. I did not think that would that would happen when I started the project. Uh, and yeah, I would just encourage people to um, subscribe to the Bright Green YouTube channel and uh and visit bright green because it's a um exceptional website that uh I, how long has it been going for at this point because it used to be bright green scotland it's been going for like so many years now yeah 2010 so 13 years yeah long old time. it's so impressive that's really impressive um very valuable voice not just in the green party but on the left so yeah check it out I promise, viewers, I'm not paying Al. Al is not on commission to do the plugs. Uh, but Al, it's been a pleasure as always. Thanks for joining us again. Of course. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. So that was Al Folan from Stats for Lefties. And uh, if you enjoyed that conversation, please do hit like and please do hit subscribe. If you hit like, it means the video will appear in more people's feeds. And if you hit subscribe, it means that you won't miss out on any of the videos and interviews we put out in the coming weeks and months. Please let me know what you thought about that conversation in the chat. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts, any reflections on the points we discussed about the upcoming elections, any comments, thoughts, reflections on any of that. Just to give you a rundown of what we've got coming up for the rest of the show, we still have a stellar lineup of guests to come. Next up on the show, we have Samuel Sweek from the um, Peace and Justice Project. I'm going to be talking to Samuel about the Music for the Many campaign, which is a campaign that's been set up by the Peace and Justice Project to fight to defend uh, music venues across the country. We'll be delving into why music venues are under threat and why it's so important to save them. Following that, uh, lunchtime, I'll be joined by Gwen Gwynville. Gwen is the CEO of Yes Cymru, one of the primary groups in Wales campaigning for independence. I'll be discussing the strength of support for Welsh independence at the moment in Wales, why uh, it's, it has less support than Scottish independence does, and we'll also be discussing um, what Yes Cymru is currently doing and planning on doing in their efforts and campaigns for independence. Following that at 1.15, we'll be talking NATO again. So for those who watched the last episode, you'll have seen that I discussed with Linda Walker and Lindsay German the Green Party's new policies and positions on NATO as part of a wider rewrite of the party's defence, peace and security policies. I'm going to be speaking to Martin Butcher, who is a Green Party councillor and the author, former author of the NATO Monitor blog. I'm going to be speaking to Martin about what he thinks about the new Green Party policy. He's critical of NATO and he has some interesting views on the new policy and um, how realistic some of the reforms the Green Party wants to see of NATO are. At 2.15, I'll be joined by Maisha Begum, who is from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective. For those of you who don't know, Rana Plaza was uh, the place, the site of a building collapse in 2013, in which over a thousand workers lost their lives. We are going to be discussing the 10th anniversary of the building collapse um the the nature of the garment industry now whether reforms have been made and what the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective are doing to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the collapse at three o'clock I'll be joined by Katie Montgomery the YouTuber and activist and talking about the EHRC the Equality and Human Rights Commission's new guidance on the Equality Act and its potential ramifications for trans people at 4 p.m I'll be joined by Alex Powell a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University We'll be discussing the government's anti-migrant legislation, which we've discussed on the show a few times before. This time we're going to be discussing it in the context of uh, its impact on LGBT asylum seekers and refugees. 
And finally, I'll be joined by Danielle Bett, the Director of Communications at Yahad, and we'll be discussing the uh, protests in Israel in response to Benjamin Netanyahu's judicial reforms and what it means for public attitudes within Israel and across the globe uh, within the Jewish diaspora community towards the state of Israel and the government of Israel. That's our incredible lineup of guests. If you're excited to hear from them, if you've enjoyed the interviews we've put on so far, please do hit like, hit subscribe and share the link to the show on your social media channels. And please, of course, do get questions in the chat lined up for our guests. The earlier I can see the questions, the more likely it is that I'll be able to put them to them. Uh, so please do get them in the chat. If you're watching on our website rather than directly on YouTube, just click the little YouTube button. It'll take you to the YouTube website. You'll get access to the chat and you can stick your comments and questions in there. Throughout the show, you're also welcome to put any questions you have to me about Bright Green, about the stuff that we've been talking about and anything else you want to. Um, and I'll try and answer as many of your questions as I can. Throughout the show, we're also playing a game of Guess Who, where I'm going to give you a series of clues to a um, significant figure on the left. Uh, we've got two um, figures that I'm going to be giving you clues to. The first of them, I've given you two clues already. The first clue was that this mystery person was born in Essex. The second clue was... This mystery person died in 2014. We've had some guests in the chat, but please do get more guests in the chat now. And I'm going to give you a third clue to mull over while I take a very, very short break. The third clue is that this mystery person was a fan of Millwall FC. So you're looking for someone who's a significant figure on the left, born in Essex, died in 2014 and was a fan of Millwall FC. Guesses in the chat, please. In the meantime, I'm going to take a quick break while you think about who that mystery person could be whilst you hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. We're trying to get to 50 likes by the end of the show. We're currently on 16. There's 21 people watching. That means that there's loads more likes to come. So please, 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 please do hit like. And uh, it means the video will appear in more people's feeds. And you make me very, very happy. And for viewers of the world who want to see these interviews, very, very happy too. I'm going to take a very short break and I'll be back to get you your next series of interviews. Thanks so much for joining us. I'll be back very, very briefly.
Welcome back. If you're just joining us, uh, the show isn't just a still life uh, visual of my bookshelves for the next uh, six and a half hours. We are going to be bringing you a series of interviews with the uh, some of the most exciting, interesting, engaging, inspiring people on the left. And we have an amazing array of guests still to come. If you're just joining us so far, we have spoken to Sean Berry, the co -lead, former co-leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, a three-time London mayoral candidate, a member of the London Assembly. And we discussed the Greens' successes on the London Assembly since they were first elected 23 years ago in the year 2000. We also talked about the upcoming uh, London Assembly election campaign for the 2024 elections. I spoke to Sean at about 10.15, so if you want to rewind, watch that interview back, you can scroll scroll back, rewind back, whatever the terminology is, um, about an hour and 10 minutes to find that interview. I then spoke to Elf Olin, who is from Stats for Lefties, the um, left-wing election analysis Twitter account blog and so on. We had a very in-depth discussion about this year's local elections, the prospects the Greens have of winning seats in those elections, winning big numbers of seats. Um, L said that they thought that the Green Party's um, public communications that they will be gaining over 100 council seats in this year's elections were um, a bit of an underestimation and they were expecting the Greens to make more gains than that. We talked about the prospects of the Greens taking control of councils such as Mid Suffolk and Lancaster and other places as well. Um, that was about 20 minutes ago I spoke to Al, so feel free to rewind and watch that at your leisure. But coming up throughout the rest of the show, we have a stellar lineup of guests if you are looking forward to these interviews, other people will do. So please do hit the like button, the subscribe button. It means the video will appear in more people's feeds. And also, of course, share the link to the show on your social media channels. Please also do get, get the questions in the chat lined up for our guests throughout the show. The next person I'm going to be speaking to is Samuel Sweek from the Peace and Justice Project. If you're not familiar with the Peace and Justice Project, it is the campaign group that was set up by Jeremy Corbyn a few years ago now. And I'm going to be speaking to Samuel about the Music for the Many campaign. That's a campaign to uh, defend and protect music venues across the country. So I'll be speaking to Samuel about why it is that the Peace and Justice Project is campaigning on that issue and also why, our, uh, why venues are under threat and what people can do about it. Following that, I'm going to be speaking to Gwen Gwynville, who is the CEO of Yes Cymru, one of the organisations that is campaigning for Welsh independence. I'll be talking to Gwen about the um, support for Welsh independence in Wales at the moment, why support for Welsh independence is lower than support for Scottish independence, and why Yes Cymru, the, the, the activities that Yes Cymru are going to be doing to campaign for independence for Wales. I'll then be speaking to Martin Butcher, who is a Green Party councillor and the former author of the NATO Monitor blog. Um, we're going to be discussing uh, the Green Party's new policies on NATO. For regular viewers of Bright Green Live, you'll be seeing you'll have seen that this is an ongoing conversation we've been having. We interviewed Linda Walker, one of the authors of that policy, on the last episode, as well as Lindsay German from the Stop the War Coalition. Martin Butcher, whom we're speaking to today, is critical of both those people's perspectives. He's deeply critical of NATO and also Stop the War Coalition's attitudes towards that organisation as well. At 2.15, I'll be speaking to Maisha Begum from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective. At 3 p.m., I'll be speaking to Katie Montgomery, the YouTuber and activist, about the EHRC's new guidance on the Equality Act and its ramifications for trans people. I'll be speaking to Alex Powell at 4 p.m., who is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. We'll be discussing the, the latest of the government's anti-migrant legislation, the Illegal Migration Bill, how it fits into a wider pattern of anti-migrant laws the government is, the Tories have tried to introduce or have introduced since 2010. And specifically, we'll be discussing the impact of that legislation on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. And finally, closing the show at 5 p.m., I'll be joined by Danielle Bett, the Director of Communications at Yakad. Um, Yakad is an organisation which campaigns for an, uh, and, and works for a uh, building support for a two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict within the Jewish community in Britain. We're going to be discussing the impact of the judicial reforms in Israel that Benjamin Netanyahu has introduced, the mass protest movement that has emerged as a result, and what impact that's had on um, Israeli attitudes towards the government and the state. And we'll also be discussing a little bit about the um, Jewish diaspora's attitudes as well as a result of those protests. So that's our show. 
I think that's an amazing lineup of guests. We're set for some really fascinating, interesting, engaging conversations. If you think so too, please do hit the like button. We're aiming for 50 likes by the end of the show. We're currently on 18. We can get that 50 if you hit the like button. It doesn't cost you a penny. It helps Bright Green out massively. It means the show will appear in more people's feeds. And it, of course, makes me very, very happy. So if you want to make me happy, hit the like button, massage the algorithm, and everyone is a winner. You can also share the link to the show on your social media channels preferably using the hashtag bright green live and all those guests that are coming up please do get questions lined up for them in the chat the chat is very quiet today i'm feeling a little lonely please do get your questions and comments lined up in the chat um, and i'll try and get as many of them to our guests as possible and in just a couple of minutes time i'll be joined by our next guest samuel sweet from the peace and justice project before i uh, get samuel in we are playing a game of guess, through, guess Who throughout the show where I'm giving you a series of clues to a prominent left-wing or significant left-wing figure. Might be historical, might be contemporary. The um, I've given you three clues so far. There's been some guests in the chat. But please do get guesses coming in as we go. The first clue was that this mystery person was born in Essex. The second clue was that this mystery person died in 2014. And the third clue I've given you is that this mystery person is a fan was a fan of Millwall FC. So guesses in the chat for who that mystery person is. Questions in the chat for our next guest, Samuel Sweek. I'm just going to let Samuel into the waiting room now and we'll get, crack on with our next interview. So as Samuel connects the call, I'll just do a brief introduction to who Samuel is so that everyone knows who they're going to be hearing from in the next bit of time. So Samuel Sweek is the campaign lead on the Music for the Many campaign at the Peace and Justice Project. We're going to be discussing that campaign, which is trying to protect music venues across the country. But before we delve into any of that, it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by you today, Samuel. How are you doing? Hey, not too bad. Thank you so much for having me. Not at all. Thank you for joining us. So let's dive right into it then. Um, can you talk our, our viewers through what the Music for the Many campaign is trying to achieve? So the Peace and Justice Project has launched Music for the Many um, so in response to a series of economic challenges that our country has faced, so that be be it the 10 plus you know, 13 years so you now of austerity and cuts we've had from the Tory government and the coalition government, um, the pandemic, which meant that live music venues, uh, and bars and, and sort of other hospitality venues and such were not able to operate and open. Um, and of course, uh, now the cost of living crisis, which is impacting directly uh, the sort of uh, disposable income of literally everybody in the country. Um, and in response to that, music venues in particular, who have already faced these significant challenges, are struggling even more so just to stay afloat. They already operate on incredibly tight profit margins. And the aim of the campaign is to raise awareness of those challenges. We, we will soon be saying out a series of demands to the government in terms of arts and live music funding, um, but also, you know, promoting uh, that that level of inclusion within people's within communities to go out and see live shows um, to support their local economy. Um, that's what Music for the Many is about. It's an inclusive campaign, and we're happy to be taking along with us uh, trade unions, community groups, and uh, supporters up and down the country. We've had a fantastic response, and we look forward to the next steps. So you talked a little bit there about the economic conditions that venues are facing, but what are some of the other threats that music venues at the moment are hit with? So really, the minute there's the large challenges they face, and most of that is generated from the uh, the decimated income they have faced over time, uh, is the need to pay their staff to pay their staff fairly, um, which of course all workers deserve and should have. Um, because of the incredibly tight profit margins, it's becoming difficult to meet those commitments. Um, the other challenges that they are facing is the general maintenance and upkeep that, um, as well as that, there's um, yeah, the general maintenance and upkeep of their venues. Um, and as well as that, it's just that there is so much in terms of like corporate competition for grassroots live music venues, you know. Um, so we launched the other day at the Lexington, which is, you know, a fantastic independently run venue. Um, but many, many touring artists now uh, are looking at, say, all of these venues, which are, you know, named after huge corporate sponsors like O2, uh, you know, there's energy companies, there's like, uh, um, 
you know gambling companies and there's all sorts of uh, you know they, that's where the real investment is in the british live music sector at the minute and unfortunately that means that these grass music venues with incredible heritage and history um you know we, we've lost many over the time be it the hacienda in manchester the cockpit in leeds um they've struggled to stay afloat they do not have that same level of corporate backing and that is where uh up and coming artists and unsigned bands are you know they they there's just not really a sustainable market for them as things stand and that's what we're trying to build um so why do you think that grassroots local music venues are so important well it's simply because it's an expression of 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 you know local feeling isn't it um so people people can come together um to be around their communities like so many artists are inspired by their surroundings um you know and they've also many artists some of the biggest names of today have started off playing in tiny clubs and pubs in their towns that's how they've got their gigs that's how they've got noticed without the grassroots live music venues um it, you know in every corner of the country um we just you know we risk losing out on an entire generation and and beyond of of talent of names of like and it's 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 a waste um you know um so many there's so many what we were so lucky to have the other day at the lexington when we launched is three young up-and-coming bands um who have got their break through playing small venues in their towns hot wax who played from hastings uh juices uh from northwest london uh, and Diamond Country Dance Club from from St. Neots, which is a little town near where I'm from in Cambridgeshire. Um, you know, those are people who are making their name on the live touring scene in their towns and in the surrounding area and building up that base and that following, which will take them on to bigger and better things. Without these small live music venues and pubs and clubs, where where's where where do they get noticed? Where do they, you know, make their name? That's the real risk we're facing without securing the long-term economic future of that particular part of the economy. So you mentioned uh, yeah, some of the specific venues that have already been lost. You mentioned like the Hacienda and other places. Are there particular venues right now that um, that you're concerned are, are under particular threat or that Music for the Many is planning on campaigning to save? So since we announced the campaign, we've been in, uh, and in great conversation with a number of music venues and there will be future music for many dates we're looking to uh announce in in due course um the the campaign uh sort of was started when we went for a meeting with the lead mill in sheffield uh sort of i think it was in sort of the middle of last year um they're they're, they're obviously a, a historic music venue of a great heritage and history people like pulp arctic monkeys played gigs there um their challenges are different they uh, they're more sort of to do with like their issues being with like landlords and like changing of like their sort of that level of the contract. But we've had conversations with uh, the lead mill and that sort of has inspired that as of the next parts of the campaign. And we've consulted with a number of organizations and a number of venues. Many have actually reached out to us since we announced the campaign as well. So there's some really good ongoing conversations. Um, but the, the, there is people can can check it out um the music venues trust uh, regularly publish a list of what they're calling at risk music venues um where there has been great fundraising campaigns the lexington was very recently uh, a part of that list um and was in the top 10 most at risk venues in the country which when you consider uh, its its location in london when you like you know how populated that area is and like you know the great names and regular events they have there it should never be in that situation but obviously in terms of paying overheads in terms of like economic challenges we mentioned earlier that's how they've come to that position but if you yeah music venues trust do publish a list and there are names up and down the country they have their own separate campaign going but we've looked at their annual report uh we've looked at their recommendations and we're looking at continuing those conversations with music venues and music venues trust going forward to sort of consult the next steps of where we plan to take the tour basically and so one you, you talked there about the lead mill and the specific circumstances there and that's an interesting dynamic in this because i think you know when when we hear about loss of music venues we often hear about you know the economic things that you talked about but there's also a load of other factors at play that you know uh relationship with landlords uh there's often like issues of gentrification that impact on live music venues where um you know high-end flats get built opposite a music venue and then you get a series of noise complaints and all those kinds of things that has led to the losses of various music venues um 
what impact do you think those kinds of things are having on the kind of independent live music venues we have in the UK? And is that something that you folks are going to be campaigning on? Well, certainly, I think it'd be hard to say that that, that doesn't. I mean, like gentrification has had its, an impact on the creative sector for decades. You know, like people, genuine creative spaces have been lost in the name of sort of commercialization. That's a problem all around the world here in, in the UK, uh, the United States as well, um, particularly, the, you know, the areas of like Soho in, in New York was particularly in the 60s and 70s famed for being such a creative space pricey apartments and, and and tower blocks were built around it and that that connection was lost um there's a real risk in this country too of things of things going that way i think we have a lot of great sort of people and artists who are willing to camp who are campaigning sort of you know in, against that and certainly we as as the uh, peace and justice project music for the many um you know we certainly do support keeping that c connection to the local area you know ensuring that there is a fairness ensuring that local people you know receive you know the, what you know the the the, re the rewards of having that creativity on their doorstep and like the nurturing that goes into that um it's it's not directly part of one of the campaigns it's a it's a huge campaign to take and sort of the spirit of the uh the campaign is to keep things as local as possible um and support those particular local areas um and you know do what we can i mean we're still very lucky to be in like the sort of shaping part of the campaign and i think since we announced it and the amount of people that have reached out to us on a whole number of issues um it, it sort of has like brought into like how much the, the, the music uh, and entertainment industry is up against it and gentrification is certainly one of those challenges that you know we we will be looking at i think um but now we're in the in the process of building it and sort of like looking at the futures of uh, the direct at risk futures of music venues first of all and before i you know, ask you to talk about how people can get involved i guess um one final question for you is that obviously you talked at the start about the role of smaller independent local music venues in the kind of ecology of the art sector and the music industry so the reality is that you've got yeah the big o2 venues and the the the, the corporate sponsor venues which only can exist because you have a thriving local small independent venue scene because that's where musicians and artists ply their trade it's where they you know are able to build up a following build up a big enough following to play the bigger venues and so on um but i guess the the existence of small uh or rather the threats to smaller venues is just one of the challenges that the music industry is facing right now in terms of the ability for smaller artists to break through when you've got you know the the impact of <clears throat> uh the streaming giants and the tiny pittance that they they pay in terms of royalties when you've got um you know the impact of brexit post-brexit regulations on touring in the european union um how do you think that the the issue of loss of music venues fits into that wider piece of the the challenge of being i guess a, a touring musician a live musician a musician generally today I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it, it, there, there are people in a better place to advise on how it's as in, in the music industry to advise on how it's impacted things like touring, you know, things like uh, the documentation required to go into Europe or, or abroad. Um, I think that but the, the, what the UK has going for it uh, is that it has always been seen as being a, a, a place in terms of creativity, in terms of touring where artists do want to come and play. And that's great. The problem we have here, though, is that it's 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 artists, you know, who we want to be up and coming from our own towns and cities as well um, that aren't getting that sort of like fair share. So when a huge band from the States or Australia comes over that, you know, chances are if, they've, if they're touring from the US or Australia, then they've made the name for themselves and they're going to be playing a huge venue, aren't they? They're going to be playing the O2 or Wembley Arena or, or you know, venues of, of thousands of thousands in size. Um, I think that in itself and the streaming certainly I think is an interesting sort of thing in terms of artists getting their name out there and I think it was, it was uh, John from Reverend and the Makers made a very good post about this on Twitter the other day about how many times you'd actually have to listen to an album um, for an artist to actually make any money from it and it's it's it yeah it's it's they pay something like 0 0.003 cents or something per stream of a song and that in itself is a, is a, is a challenge to break down and maybe that's uh, um that's something that we can all i think take on together later on down the line because that is hugely unfair and it no doubt does impact the airplay 
um, or like, you know, artists getting their names out there and, you know, having being a full time musician can't really be a possibility um, unless you are making a lot of money from touring. And that's where music for the many sort of is raising the issue that people just simply aren't able to do that if we don't have the venues for them to make a name for themselves and 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 to start. Um, I'm not sure whether or not that fully answered your question, but I think what it, it certainly ha- does highlight is that there are a number of challenges. Um, and we, we even even as as you said, we we even as a campaign are learning them as we go. We have we've had a great response to it. People have been getting in touch with us and highlighting their own issues in their own towns, uh, you know, in terms of their own venues and them being in bands or trying to you know get a song out there. It's 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 incredibly difficult. And I think if we do not act, the the real risk is that we lose a, a phenomenal part of our history as a country and our, also our future. I want you know to live in a world where people who have that creativity and that ambition can go on and do what they want to do and sort of spread their you know share their talent and their gifts with the world and I think that it, you know I think there there there's so many problems in the world at the minute and I get to some people and this has actually been part of the response that we've had you know is that people do turn to us and they have said you know but what about this well and that's true and that's so true but you know that we need to try and fight to keep you know people's hopes alive. Music can, and this was a big part of the launch as well is that people have been inspired by music over time. We had great speakers at our event as well from Love Music Hate Racism. We had a speaker from Just the Poil. We had a speaker from the Name Game. And each one of those campaigns uh, is about uniting people, about raising awareness of issues of say discrimination or or, or the challenges people face or the climate crisis. Each of those are important issues, and there's a place for music to unite people around those issues. And that is, again, in the spirit of the campaign. And that's why I think it's important we take it forwards. Music is a thing that can unite us, and it can unite us over those issues too. And so then finally, how can people get involved with the campaign? Sure, people can get involved if they... So we're Peace and Justice Project on all social media platforms are at the Peace and Justice Project, apart from on Twitter, where we're at Corbyn underscore project um they can also get involved by visiting the corbin project.com um where and if they corbin project.com for us action if they wanted to get involved and join our mailing list to find out and like get exclusives on like what's coming up on the campaign next there's a place to that but it will all be across the social media platforms please do also email us on info at the corbin project.com uh if you want to get involved in the campaign if you've got any suggestions or if you want to raise an issue in your local area to do with music venues or anything else any other injustice we'll take it um <laughs> then yeah please do fabulous thank you so much for joining us today samuel thank you thank you for having me so that was samuel sweet from the peace and justice project the campaign lead on the music for the many campaign um i'd love to hear what you thought about that conversation in the chat so please do get your comments and responses and reflections there in the chat um, and uh, let us know what you thought. So coming up for the rest of the show, our next guest is going to be uh, Gwen Gwynville, who is the CEO of Yes Cymru, the campaign for Welsh independence, um, one of the leading campaign groups for Welsh independence um, there. And we also are going to have an array of other guests coming up throughout the show. But before I run through who we've still got coming up, just have to ask you to please hit like, please hit uh, the subscribe button and please do uh, share the link to the show. Now, we're still running our game of Guess Who throughout the show. And I've so far given you uh, three clues to our first mystery person who is a significant figure on the left of politics. The first clue was that this mystery person was born in Essex. The second was that they died in 2014 and the third was that they are were a big fan of Millwall FC the fourth clue for this mystery person is that they have a they have a brigade of the international freedom battalion named after them so you're looking for someone born in Essex who died in 2014 a big fan of Millwall FC and who had a brigade of the international freedom battalion named after them Put your guesses in the chat as to who that mystery person is and you can get all the pride of getting the answer right. 
And please do, if you haven't already, hit like, hit share, hit subscribe, and let's get more eyes on these interviews. If you've enjoyed the show so far, other people will too. And we have an array of amazing guests still to come throughout the show, including, as I said before, Gwen Gwynville, uh, the CEO of Yes Cymru, who will be joining me very, very soon. We then have Martin Butcher, a Green Party councillor, who will be talking about NATO. We have Maisha Begum from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Campaign talking about the 10th anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse. We have Katie Montgomery, the YouTuber and activist, to talk about uh, the impact of the EHRC's new guidance on the Equality Act, Act on trans people if it were to be implemented. At four o'clock, we have Alex Powell, a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. We'll be talking about the anti-migration legislation the government is uh, currently introducing or has introduced over the last decade. And finally, we'll have Danielle Bett from Yakad, who is the Director of Communications at Yakad, and we'll be talking about the protests against Netanyahu's um, judicial reforms in Israel. That's all still to come. So please do stay tuned throughout for that throughout the show. Now, the interview that I did one before last with Al Folan from Stats for Lefties, we talked about the upcoming local elections that are taking place this May. So our viewers, I assume you're aware, but you may not be, there is a huge set of local elections taking place this year in May. First of all, we have a series of elections that will be happening in England, and we also have elections in the north of Ireland, where voters across those two countries will be going to the polls and will be voting to elect their representatives in local government. Now, Bright Green viewers, lots of you will be interested in the prospects for the Green Party in those elections, and there's a lot to talk about. So in 2023, we're seeing the seats that are up for election were last up in 2019. If you remember, in 2019, the Greens won an unprecedented number of seats in those local elections, doubling the number of councillors that the party had in local government in a single night. That means the Greens will be defending over 200 seats in this year's local elections, but the party has big ambitions to be gaining more. So the party's co-leaders, Carla Denyer and Adrian Ramsey, have talked about gaining over 100 more seats in those elections. So not only defending the 200 seats that we won last time, the Greens won last time, but also gaining 100 more seats as well. That's a huge ambition. And interestingly, when I spoke to Al Foden from Lefty Stats, Stats for Lefties earlier on the show, they said that they think that's actually an underestimation how many seats the Greens will be winning. And they thought that it was a classic case of expectation management. There are lots of places that are going to be really interesting for the Green Party in the next set of local elections. And Bright Green is going to be providing you a series of articles in the run-up to the start of May, uh, where we're going to be running through and uh, looking at the councils where the Greens could be winning really big. Now, we've published the first of those articles very, very recently, which looked at Herefordshire. Herefordshire is a really interesting county, uh, a really interesting election this year for the Greens. So in 2019, the Greens went from two to, I think, seven seats on the council. Since the Greens have been a joint administration with independents on the council and the election in 2019 saw the Tories turfed out of office across that's a council area. Now, in 2023, the Greens have got big ambitions for gaining even more seats on top of the seven they already hold. I've spoken to some of the people involved in the local campaign, and they think they could be winning 14 or possibly even 16 seats in May this year. That would be huge. It would be a, you know doubling or even more so the number of Greens on the council. And really interestingly, it would mean that the Greens would be going into an election administration and hopefully still coming out of administration on the other side. Now, Herefordshire is also interesting because it's the location of one of the Green Party's top target seats in the next general election. So we've talked on this show before about Bristol Central, where Carla Denyer is the candidate. And we've talked about that a lot in terms of the prospects of the Greens uh, winning that parliamentary seat. One of the other primary target seats the Green Party currently has for the next general election is North Herefordshire. Now, in North Herefordshire, Ellie Chowns, who's a former Green Party MEP and a cabinet member in Herefordshire Council, is the candidate. Now, if the Greens in this year's local elections manage to go from seven 
14 or even 16 seats. That is a huge uh, leap forward and creates a lot of momentum for that next general election campaign. Now, Ellie Chowns at the Green Party's conference said that there was a real chance that the Greens could win a seat from a Tory in North Herefordshire could win a second MP. Now, of course, the Greens have never won anywhere outside of Brighton Pavilion. But we could get a really good indication in this year's local elections whether North Herefordshire could be one of those seats the Greens could win in the future. There are other councils across the country that are going to be really interesting this year. So the other one, which me and Al talked a little bit about earlier, is um, Mid Suffolk. So in the last local elections in 2019, the last time these seats were up for elections, the Greens won 12 seats on Mid Suffolk Council. They only need six more seats in order to get a majority on that council. That's unprecedented. Nowhere in the country, anywhere ever, have the Greens won a majority where all of the opposition councillors add up to less than the number of Greens on the council. So in Brighton and Hove, where the Greens have been in administration twice, in both instances, the Greens have so only been the largest party. So what that means is, is that they don't have a majority of the votes on the council. So when it comes to setting things like a budget, when it comes to certain votes on the council, they don't have the majority vote. So they're relying on negotiations with the party. In Mid-Suffolk, we could see the Greens winning a majority for the first time anywhere in the country. That's hugely, hugely historically significant if that were to come off. And as I say, the Greens only need to gain six more seats in order to do it. It's also interesting for the very same reason that Herefordshire is interesting in that Waverley Valley which is one of the new parliamentary constituencies um, under the new boundary changes, is also an area, a general election constituency, which the Greens are optimistic about doing very well in. The party's candidate is Adrian Ramsey, one of the two co-leaders of the party, and the Greens are very optimistic about doing well there, potentially even theoretically winning it. Uh, there's been huge activity in Waverley Valley with lots of action days, with lots of campaigning going on there. So Mid Suffolk is deeply, deeply interesting as well. And we'll be doing some more in-depth analysis on Bright Green's website there as well. Lancaster is another place that I discuss with Al where the Greens could win big as well. So at the moment, the Greens have 15 seats on the council. However, in the last set of local elections, they only won, I think, 10 or 11 seats. They've since gained more through a combination of defections um, and also by-election victories. I've spoken to some people in Lancaster and they've told me that they think they are looking towards gaining more than 20 seats on the council. You need 30 to get a majority, so there isn't a prospect, they don't think, of the Greens winning a majority on the council, but it means that the Green Party could continue an administration in Lancaster, because at the moment, Lancaster is one of three places in the country that there is a council that is led by a Green Party member. So a Green councillor is the leader in Lancaster, similarly in Brighton Hove and in Stroud, those are the three places where the Greens lead the council. There are lots of other places where the Greens are in joint administration, but they don't lead it. Now, if the Greens were to go into that election in 2023 and come out the other end with uh, 20 seats or more, then there is no doubt the Greens will continue to lead that council. It's a fascinating political environment in Lancaster because, as I said, you've had those defections um, that has increased the Greens' uh, numbers in terms of council seats. There's also a collection of independents on the council and um, the Labour Party has been in disarray up there for a while. Interestingly, in the last local elections, there were a huge number of seats in Lancaster, which were essentially two or three way marginals. And what that means is that there's really obvious prospects for the Greens to gain more seats in this year's elections. That combined with the fact that over the last um, two years, the Greens have won a series of by-elections there, which and, and also even when they didn't win by-elections, when there were other by-elections and they didn't take the seats, they came very, very close. That means that the momentum is there with the Greens. They have the organisation which has demonstrated that they can win and win big. And we could see some big gains in Lancaster. And there'll be a piece going up on Bright Greens website tomorrow looking in a little bit more detail on the elections in Lancaster. There are other places too, which I think are really interesting to watch. Obviously, Brighton Hove is always very, very interesting. So Brighton Hove, um, the Green Party has been in administration twice there. They won the most seats on the council in 2011 and ran a minority administration. In 2015, they, were, they, they, they lost a lot of seats and um, the Labour Party went back into running Brighton Hove, again as a minority administration. Fast forward to 2019, the last time the seats were up for election, and the Greens didn't emerge as the largest party. Labour did. Labour ran the council for a couple of years, 
fell apart through expulsions, through defections, through infighting. The Greens took over, have since won by-elections and are going into this set of elections as the ruling administration in Brighton Hove. Now, as I said, the last time the Greens were running Brighton Hove, they went into the 2015 elections administration, came out the other end with half the number of councillors. This time, the Greens are really optimistic about not only going into those elections in administration, but coming out the other end also in administration. They think they can win enough seats to retain power in Brighton Hove. So it will be the first time in history where a Green group in sole administration of a council goes into an election in administration and comes out the other end after the election still in administration. That's really interesting. And there'll be an article in Bright Green looking in more depth at that election very, very soon. We also have places like um, East Hertfordshire, where the Greens ran a number of candidates last time around and won, I think, two or maybe three council seats in 2019. The reality was that the Greens came a close second or third in loads of seats in East Hertfordshire, and the Greens are very optimistic about making, making big, big gains there, uh, potentially even double digits. Similarly, we've got a similar situation happening in Darlington, and there are other places across the country too where there could be massive gains for the Green Party. And so when you start adding these things up, that 100 number that Carla, Denya and Adrian Ramsey have been talking about starts to make a little more, more sense because if you're picking up, you know, an additional seven or nine seats in Herefordshire here, six seats in Mid-Suffolk there, five in Lancaster there, 10 even in East Hertfordshire, you're getting close to that 100 number. All of these councils where the Greens could do well, we're going to be looking at in more depth on Bright Green. So if you uh, want to keep on top of those articles and the analysis we're doing, in the run-up to the elections, please do head to our website, bright-green.org, and subscribe to our mailing list, because then you won't miss out on any of the articles we put out in the coming weeks and months. You can also follow us on all the social media channels to make sure that you don't miss out too. So twitter.com forward slash brightgrn or at brightgrn on Facebook with facebook.com forward slash brightgrn and at brightgreen online on Instagram. We'll be posting everything there as well. Also, that coverage of these elections doesn't come for free. We're not funded by billionaires. We're not backed by big business. That's why we're able to provide the detailed coverage analysis of the Green parties and the wider left, because we are independent. The reason we're independent is because wonderful, beautiful, fantastic people just like you donate to us and keep Bright Green afloat. If you are able to, please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate, set up a regular donation so that we can keep running this kind of coverage of those elections. Um, we're talking about the elections more throughout the show, uh, of course, but to let you know that also on polling day this year, alongside all that analysis I've talked about already, Bright Green's coverage of the local elections will run on into polling day and election night. So throughout election night, on the day of the election, we'll be running our annual live blog, running down all the twists and turns in the elections everywhere where the left is doing well in elections, not just the Green Party, but the wider left as well. We'll be looking at um, where there are gains, where there are losses, bring you all the results live on our website, bright-green.org. We'll be running the live blog throughout election night and beyond, bringing you all the results as they come in, in a more in-depth fashion than the other uh, outlets will do about the left. We'll also, at 3am on election night, have, be having a live stream where we're going to run down and analyse the elections um, throughout the night. We'll be talking to some important, interesting, exciting figures from across the left, TBC, who those will be. And we'll also be doing a separate live stream at 6 p.m. the following day on Friday, again, to delve into the analysis of the local elections. So get those in your diary. Um, you don't, I mean, it's 3 a.m. in the morning on the Thursday night. I'm sure many of you will be asleep, but if you're, if you're struggling to get to sleep, you can listen to my dulcet tones talking to you about election results, which I'm sure for many of you will indeed send you to sleep. And at 6 p.m. the following day, we'll be doing more analysis as well. Uh, you can find the best way to make sure that you don't miss the um, the live streams we're doing on election night and the day after is to hit the subscribe button. It means that when we go live, you'll get a little notification on your phone, on your laptop, wherever you are, uh, that tells you we are going live. Um, so... We've got some amazing guests still to come. Our next interview is going to be starting very, very soon. But just to remind you that you can get questions in the chat for both myself and for our guests. So please do do that. 
please do subscribe as i say hit the like button we've got 22 people watching 20 people who've liked the show that means that there is at least two people who can hit like so please do hit like it means that more people will see the stream and of course share the link to the show on your social media channels uh, i'll just take a little look on the socials and in the chat see if we've got any comments coming in uh, so, of course, if you are sharing on the socials, please do use the hashtag Bright Green Live. Uh, so Peter Welsh in the chat says, looking forward to the May elections and to green gains. Wonder if the local Labour defections, Greenwoods at a local level, are going to replicate at a national level and who? Great platform. Appreciated. Thank you so much for that question, Peter. It's a very, very interesting one. I'm assuming your question relates to, I guess, parliamentary defections, um, which we'll touch on a little moment. But I guess the the other element of your question is, I guess, more broadly um, about defections from Labour to the Greens at a national level that isn't, I guess, MPs. And one thing we've seen really interestingly recently, I think, is we have seen some of those defections taking place um, of kind of core Labour activists, uh, campaigners, influencers and so on. Not MPs, but people who were very, very active in the Labour Party during the Jeremy Corbyn years, jumping ship to the Greens over the last 18 months or so, sometimes less than that. Um, so Al Folan, who I spoke to earlier today uh, from Stats for Lefties and a Navarra Media contributor, um, Al was a member of the Labour Party during the Jeremy Corbyn years. I remember very vividly uh al joining the labor party because i was on a bus with them in norwich when they told me they were going to do it um and they left the green party then and joined the labor party they've since rejoined the greens uh, very very recently and they were a brilliant article on broke green about why they did so we've also seen a number of kind of other left in, uh left left-wing figures um who have Similarly, uh, joined the Greens and defected from Labour. So one of the most um, striking ones was Matt Zarb Cousin. So Matt Zarb Cousin was a former uh, spokesperson for Jeremy Corbyn. He worked for Jeremy Corbyn in the early years of his premiership. Uh, he, about a year ago now, maybe not that long, uh, defected to the Green Party uh, with the Labour Party's move to the right, uh, made the decision to join the Greens as the the as a as a left wing party. Uh, we've also recently seen that George Aylett, who is a sort of big left influencer on Twitter, um, former parliamentary candidate for the Labour Party, he recently said that uh, people shouldn't vote for Labour and should instead vote Green. So we're seeing those types of people um, defect. Uh, switch their allegiance to the Greens either by joining or saying that people should vote for them I think we're likely to see quite a bit more of that and I think we're likely to see it particularly um, in the coming weeks as the Labour Party appears to be doubling down and digging in on its sort of right-wing reactionary positions on cultural and social issues um, so obviously we've seen recently you know the Labour Party triangulating at best and throwing trans people under the best uh, under the bus at worst when it comes to uh, the kind of culture wars around trans rights at the moment, we've seen them, you know, going hard on law and order and antisocial behaviour. Um, we've seen them, you know, complaining about the Labour, the, the Tory government for its migration policies, not because they're disgraceful, inhumane, racist and repugnant, but because they're not deporting people quick enough. All of these kinds of issues, I think, is going to see increasing numbers of people defecting from Labour to the Greens, who could be quite prominent. Uh, so we're going to see it at the local level in terms of local activists and members. We'll definitely see it in terms of councillors. We'll see it in terms of sort of uh, national influence and figures, influences and figures as well. I think that's only going to accelerate. And like, I think if you're if you've got a Twitter account, you can't have missed over the last two weeks the number of uh, photographs you've seen of people's Labour Party membership cards uh, cut up in pieces um, on the uh, on 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 Twitter. I think that's going to inevitably lead to some movement towards the Greens. The interesting thing I think about that is that I think what you're probably going to see is it taking place immediately after the local elections, <clears throat> because. I think that at the moment you've seen a lot of people leaving the Labour Party, i.e. they've been pushed. So uh, they've been you know, pushed by whether it's you know, the Labour Party's position on migration or those disgraceful dog whistle adverts that the Labour Party put out about Rishi Sunak um, very recently. You've seen people being pushed out of the Labour Party because of that. I think it's going to be a while until you see them pulled into the Green Party. I think the moment that's going to happen is in the immediate aftermath of the local elections, because when that happens, uh, there's momentum generated. So if the Green Party wins 
you know, somewhere in the region of 100 to 200 seats, people will see I've left the Labour Party. This is a viable electoral vehicle of the left that I can get on board with as well. So I think you're going to see that probably after local elections. I might be wrong, but I think that's when it's going to happen. I think you're probably going to eventually see a, a pretty substantial wave of, uh, of people of it happening, possibly on the uh, a similar scale to what happened in 2014 and 2015 under the Green Surge. Uh, because what happened in that period was, again, the Labour Party had moved significantly to the right, not just on economic issues, but crucially also on social issues as well. So 2014-15, you had the Labour Party uh, printing mugs with controls on immigration emblazoned on them. You had them like Ed Miliband stood literally in front of a giant stone where the words controls on immigration had been etched and carved into them. You had them, uh, you know, you know, Rachel Reeves at the time was, I think, the shadow DWP secretary talking about how the Labour Party would be even tougher on migrants, uh, not migrants, sorry, um, welfare claimants than the Tories had been. That was, you know, the Tories who'd introduced the bedroom tax, who'd introduced uh, universal credit, workplace assessments, all those awful things that have um, really decimated welfare and demonised welfare claimants. The Labour Party were claiming they'd go even further than that. So I think the conditions are very, very similar to that. The difference this time is that when the Green Surge happened, the Green Party had maybe 15,000 members and went to 50,000. Uh, so went to went, went up 35,000 in a matter of months. The difference now is we, the Greens currently have 50,000 members. And so if there is a massive swing influx of new members into the Greens, then you're looking at that going up to 60, 70,000, potentially even higher if there's a substantial move from the Labour Party over to the Greens in the coming months. I think the moment's going to be the local elections. I think you are going to see a, a substantial uh, movement towards the Greens then, probably on a similar scale, I think, initially to um, what happened after the 2019 local and European elections, when there was a mini version of the Green surge. I think there was one point where um, the Greens were gained a thousand um, members in a single day. Someone can fact check that. I wrote an article for Bright Green on it in 2019. So someone can Google that and find out if that was true. But I think you're probably going to get a similar scale to that of, you know, a few thousand new members joining in the immediate aftermath of the local elections. Lots of them will be refugees from the Labour Party. Um, that kind of answers your question. But I guess your initial question was actually about uh, MPs and the realities. I don't know. Like I'm not I don't have I'm not I don't have inside knowledge. I think it's a huge thing for an MP to defect. I think there are lots of left wing Labour MPs that basically it appears that their strategy is at the moment sit down, stay quiet and hope that Labour wins a slim majority in the next election so that therefore the uh, left of the Labour parliamentary party has substantial influence and leverage over the, um, the Labour leadership. Because if the Labour Party wins a majority of, say, 20 at the next election, well, there's over 30 members of the Socialist Campaign Group, which is the main left group within the Parliamentary Labour Party. If the Labour Party has only a majority of 20 and there are 30 Socialist Campaign Group members, that means that, that group of MPs can be really influential over the government because they have the votes. I suspect what you've got at the moment is the strategy amongst the Labour left is essentially sit on your hands, don't get expelled, don't get kicked out, don't get don't have what happened to Corbyn happen to you. Stay quiet, be on your best behaviour and then exercise your leverage for the next election if the majority is small. That's, I suspect, what's happening. So I think I think it's very unlikely you're going to get anyone jumping ship uh, anytime soon. It's possible if the a scenario happens after that, maybe it'll happen. I don't know. It's worth always bearing in mind that a lot of the people who are on the left of the Parliamentary Labour Party now, of course, have been Labour members for a very, very long time. They stayed Labour members during New Labour. They outlasted the, the Iraq war, privatisation, PFI, uh, you know, the all the repugnant tuition fees, all the awful things that the uh, the Labour government did in, in office um, from 97 to 2010. They stayed during that. The reality is that, like, it, it, these people are wedded to the Labour Party and it is going to be very, very hard. So I'd be surprised if you see that. I'm just going to go to a few more comments before I bring in our next guest. Uh, so Enroll4200 says that we're competing with a bit of sunshine in the UK today. That's absolutely right. It is a beautiful sunny day and I'm very jealous not to be outside. But the show must go on. So please do stay with us. Uh, you can definitely watch with your headphones in if you're outside or watch it outside. You don't have to stay indoors. So uh, please do stay tuned uh, throughout the rest of the show. Uh, I'm going to be bringing in our next guest very, very shortly. But before we get them on the call, please do make sure that you hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. It means that you won't miss out on any of the videos 
we put out in the future. It helps Bright Green out massively. Please do hit the like button. It means the show will appear in more people's feeds. Please do hit share. Please do share the link on your social media channels, preferably using the hashtag Bright Green Live. If you've enjoyed the show so far, other people will too. And it means that more people will see it. And please do get your comments and questions for our remaining guests lined up in the chat so I can put as many to many of them to them. That's a horrible sentence to say as I possibly can. Just to give you a quick rundown of who we have still to come throughout the show. So next up, we have Gwen Winfield, uh, the CEO of Yes Cymru. Uh, we'll be discussing the current uh, levels of support for Welsh independence within Wales. Uh, we have Martin Butcher, a uh, Green Party councillor and the former author of the NATO Monitor blog, talking about the Green Party's new policies on NATO. We have Maisha Begum from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective, talking about uh, the 10th anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse. We have Katie Montgomery, the YouTuber and activist, will be talking about the EHRC's new guidance on the Equality Act and the impact it could have on trans people. We have Alex Powell, who's a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. We'll be discussing the impact of the government's anti-migrant legislation on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. And finally, closing the show, we have Danielle Betts from Yahad talking to us about the protests in Israel against Benjamin Netanyahu's judicial reforms and the impact that they are having on attitudes towards the Israeli government. That's the rest of our show. If that sounds good to you, please do hit subscribe. Please do hit like. And um, that will make me very, very happy. And with no, without further ado, then I'll bring in our next guest on the show. So as they connect to the call, I'll just give them a brief introduction so that you all know who you are hearing from. Gwen Gwynville is the CEO of Yes Cymru, which is one of the main organisations campaigning for Welsh independence. And over the next bit of time, we are going to be talking about Welsh independence, levels of support for it, and Yes Cymru's strategy for getting there. But before we delve into any of that, Gwen, I just wanted to give you a massive welcome. Thank you so much for joining. How are you doing today? Oh, thanks, Chris. I'm very well, thanks. As you, as you can see, I'm outside in the fresh spring air, which is uh, uh, lovely. Al fresco. Very, very good. Um, can I just, a, a quick technical request for you, if you'd be able to turn your phone sideways, that will just make the video slightly more viewable for our viewers, if that's okay. Uh, just horizontal. Um, so so, so I'm, ac I'm actually on the iPad and I'm actually on, yeah, I'm actually on the iPad and the camera is at the top. So if I turn no worries, it. Then. In which I, case, that's that's totally fine. Let's just crack on as is then. No worries. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So we're talking about Welsh independence and I think, um, I don't think it'd be unfair to say, if you look at the opinion polls, if you look at um, where public attitudes are, that at the moment, uh, support for Welsh independence is lower than it is for Scottish independence. Why do you think that is? So yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I think what's more interesting is possibly the speed at which Welsh independence support has, has grown. So, so just nine years ago, um, in the weeks running up to the Scottish Indy referendum in 2014, there, there was a poll in Wales putting support at Welsh independence at 5%. And if you think about it, just nine years later, we are consistently at 25%, sometimes 30%. So, you, you know, that's a five-fold increase in nine years. And, and I know some of my colleagues in the Scottish independence movement are quite envious of the pace of change here and, and the different way in which independence has been approached in, in Wales. Um, whereas in Scotland for a very long time, it, it has been very tied to the fate and fortune of the SNP rather than a more broadly based one. Um, so I, I, I think that that's one interesting fact. And the the other thing is that, you know, in, in Wales, there has been a sense, um, even amongst quite strongly Welsh people, of being part of a broader project, particularly in the 20th century. Um, and that project being the union, you know, being um, the ideological division and, and unity against, uh, you, you know, different ideologies, the Cold War, Second World Wars, and all of that has changed. You know, all of that has changed. The, the 21st century is a different world. We've come to the end of an age of history. And, and that's filtering through, not only in Scotland, but certainly in Wales. 
and you can definitely see it in the demographic you know support amongst the young in wales is sometimes eight nine ten times as high as amongst the over 65s for example and the challenge for us is, is talking to those over 65s and helping them understand how much the world has changed and and the time for independence has come so you touched on it a little bit there, but could you talk us through what Yes Cymru's current priorities are in campaigning for Welsh independence? So, I mean, I mean we're still a very young organisation and, and our priority at the moment is building that organisation. I mean, we're a grassroots campaign. Um, we're led by our members based on a group structure that we've only recently formalised. I mean, the the organisation was set up in 2016, grew incredibly quickly. Um, I'm the first employed chief exec, and I've only been in post for seven months, um, and I have one employee. So, you know, we're building up that group structure at the moment, and that's what we need to create so that every town, every village in Wales has a Yes Cymru representation in it, so that when we have the conversations about independence, you can have that conversation with someone who is very local to you in, in your own language. Um, and when I say language, I don't mean Welsh or English or any other language. What I mean is, you know, the language of that community. It's someone that you're familiar with who understands why importance would be good, independence would be good for you as an individual, why it's good at that super local level as well as at the national level. And so you've, you've talked about the kind of structure of Yes Cymru and how you're going to operate in that sense in terms of the campaign, but what does your vision look like for an independent Wales? Well, that, that, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? And now, um, I, I, I think very core to that vision is that it will not be the way Wales looks now. And it will not be um, a sort of rehash of the existing Westminster model. I mean, it has to be different. You know, we must have, we must make things better for the people of Wales. We have over 90,000 children in absolute poverty in Wales. It's an horrendous statistic for what is, you know, nominally one of the wealthiest places in the world. Um, and, you know, to make things better, you have to have deep and radical change. So I think I think that radical change has to be built into it, but it has to be led by the people of Wales. So when you come to that transition phase um, towards independence, you need to talk to the people of Wales and, and it must be led by them. I mean, there's no doubt that there will be um, a different political makeup. There's no doubt that we would have a written constitution. You know, it's incredibly anachronistic in the United Kingdom that there is no written constitution. And all of those things should be informed by the people of Wales and, uh, and driven by the people of Wales. I don't think we should take the approach of other countries that have uh, um, gone for independence over the years, I mean, I, I know Iceland is a great example because they just adopted the constitution that already existed with a few small changes. All we're saying that they were going to change it, but they're only actually changing it now, 70 years later, um, which is a long time after their independence. Uh, so, so we should be a little bit more organized and structured about it. You know, citizen assemblies, whichever way you find to communicate with the people of Wales, it must be done that way. And... So I guess looking at the case for independence, I think the the counter argument at the moment would be, look, you've got a devolved government in Wales, which has not insubstantial powers, obviously not the powers you would get from full independence, but still uh, more powers than you used to have in the when it was the uh, assembly. Now that you've got the Senate, you have more powers um, and you have a relatively progressive government at the moment uh, with Mark Drakeford as first minister. You've got a relatively high degree of cooperation between progressive political parties, whether it be Plyde and Labour in the Senate, whether it be you know, the Greens and Plyde in other, in other places and so on. And, uh, you know, a lot of people like myself who are sitting in England look at the Welsh government with a great degree of envy, um, especially with the, <laughs> the state of what we've got in Westminster. Why do you think that the kind of devolved administration, which has repeatedly given you sort of centre-left governments uh, throughout the history of the the Senate and the Welsh Assembly is insufficient and that you need to, to, to get independence? 
Well, you, you've touched on a lot of, re- of the good reasons for independence there. I mean, I mean, let's start with the current devolution settlement, for, you know, just as a, as, a, as a kickoff point. So the interim report of the Constitutional Commission for Wales may, uh, has made it very clear and has come down categorically that the existing devolution settlement is inadequate in a myriad of ways. It just doesn't work. There are too many places where there are conflicts. There are too many places where not having the levers of power causes all sorts of, of issues. Um, and that, that, that covers energy. It, it covers simple things like elections. Some elections are run from Westminster. Some elections are run from Cardiff in Wales. And that, that's bonkers, sometimes on the same day. I mean, it, this is just an absurdity. Um, the lack of devolution of the, of the criminal justice system in Wales and policing means that you can't create joined up ways of dealing with things. It, 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 it's anachronistic and causes more trouble than it should. Um, and some would say that that's an argument for improving the devolution settlement. But ultimately, any devolution settlement, any devolution settlement will give you a situation where too often Westminster will be pulling in one political direction, as it is today, and the whole of Wales will want to pull in a different political direction. And historically, for Wales, that is over 65% of the time. You know, over 65% of the time in Wales, over the last 100 years, Westminster has been governed by a party which has not been elected by Wales. And, you, you know, that apart from the fact that that's just democratically unacceptable, it means that you don't get um, any of the Welsh priorities being put first. And even when in Westminster you get a party or a leadership which is of a similar sort of st- political standpoint to, to Wales, you still don't get Welsh priorities being placed first because there's 55 million people in England and there's only 3 million in Wales. And, that, and that's always going to be the case. And, and to go back to my earlier answer um, in one of your early questions, the world has changed. You know, you, you know, there are no good arguments for union on the pattern of the United Kingdom anymore. It, it is a decaying ve- vestige of empire really and it is something that belongs to history it's just that we're taking a little bit of time to become aware of that and register that and i genuinely believe that england scotland wales and and united ireland would all be better off as strong independent nations cooperating well with each other and that that very much includes england you know england would definitely also be better off Um, so, so I, I think the argument now has become so strong in favour of independence that if, if we just have people talking about it, eventually a, a, a vast majority will come across to the side of independence because it, it, it just makes logical sense. I mean, it is a sensible option today. And so before I ask you about how our viewers can get involved in Yes Cymru, I've got a question that's come in from the chat from Philip Davies. Uh, one of our regular viewers, um, and Philip has asked, uh, what will Yes Cymru do to make sure the Welsh independence movement remains progressive? And they've asked specifically about, um, I guess, the the conflict that happened within Yes Cymru a couple of years ago, and specifically some of the allegations of transphobia that were levelled against some Yes Cymru members and members of the uh, committee. Yeah, Dior Philip. Um, so it, it's a good question and an understandable question. There was quite a lot of turmoil and um, some quite acute growing pains for the organization at that time. As I say, it wasn't a professional organization. It didn't have a particularly formalized constitution, um, which it now does. The um, the, the national governing board, the body um, that set up Yes Cymru 2.0, as it were, worked really hard over the last year and a half to get all of that in place. Uh, preparing the way for me, really, uh, to come along and, and giving me some really firm um, foundations upon which to build the organisation as we move forward. In terms of accusation of transphobia or any other kind uh, of prejudice, I want to be absolutely categorically clear that Yes Cymru is an organisation for everybody and is completely and totally inclusive. You, you know, we are campaigning for an independent Wales so that in an independent Wales, we can have the inclusive the kind of inclusive society and political structure that is suitable for the 21st century and a digital and technological age. Um, And I'm absolutely categoric about that. And that is certainly what's going to be happening on my watch. 
And so finally, before I let you go and enjoy the rest of your sunny Easter Sunday, um, for our viewers who are in Wales, lots of them will be members of the Wales Green Party, which obviously is a pro-independence party in Wales. How can they get involved with Yes Cymru and the wider movement for independence? So, uh, I mean, for everybody in Wales and, and beyond Wales, um, for the first thing to do is, is to get online and uh, join Yes Cymru. Um, membership makes a huge difference. Uh, at the moment, um, the largest political organisation in Wales by a, a stretch is the Labour Party. Um, and then in second and third place, I think we're pretty close to each other, almost neck and neck, uh, Applied Cymru and Yes Cymru. Obviously, if Yes Cymru can become a larger political organisation in terms of its membership, its impact becomes far more significant. And if we can imagine, it is certainly my goal, I'm, I, I am incredibly ambitious for the movement and I'm incredibly ambitious for Wales and for the people of Wales. I feel that we should be ambitious, confident and hopeful um, and, and often we are not, we, we, we often do ourselves down. But my ambition for the organization is that we become the largest single political organization by membership in Wales. And, and in doing so, however long it takes, I'm sure that we will get to that milestone. And when that happens, that is a permanent and dramatic shift to the political landscape in Wales. Because you have to remember that for a hundred years, the Labour Party in Wales has held that position. And because we're a pan-political movement, there is nothing stopping people having multiple memberships. So that is what I would encourage people to do. And that includes people in the Labour Party who are pro-independence. I mean, our recent polling would show that 40% of Labour supporters in Wales are already pro indie Sometimes that figure hits 50% in some surveys. Um, and yet the Labour Party in Wales remains a unionist party, which must be causing all sorts of internal tension for them. But that's, that, that's a problem for them to deal with themselves. Um, but from our perspective, we're, we are absolutely op open armed and we would welcome members of the Labour Party, members of the Green Party. We would even me welcome members of the Conservative Party if they support independence. Obviously, I don't think there'll be very many of those because unionism is pretty core to their set of beliefs. Um, but everybody else, absolutely, come along and join us. And once you're, once you're joined or even signed up as a supporter to receive emails, you'll start to get information about how to take part at a local level. Um, as we strengthen that group structure, you, you'll find out which, your, which one your local group is, go along to your local group. Uh, I'm currently trying to go across the length and breadth of Wales for face-to-face -face question and answer sessions with as many groups as I can. I, I had great, a great time in Blaine Festini a couple of weeks ago, and I think I'm up in Machenchef on the 15th of um, April and then I'm in Newport on the 18th of April so by all means come along to those ask questions uh, and just get involved. Brilliant thank you so much for your time today it's been an absolute pleasure Gwen. Brilliant thank you Chris have a good day. Cheers thank you so much so that was Gwen Gwynville the CEO of Yes Cymru Please do let us know in the chat what you thought about that conversation, any comments, thoughts, feedback, reflections. I can see some um, comments already coming in. There's uh, a flurry of Welsh, which I unfortunately can't read or pronounce, but uh, please do get your uh, comments and thoughts on that interview in the chat in whichever language you desire. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that interview and your thoughts on Yes Cymru and the campaign for Welsh independence more generally. Uh, if you're just joining us now, please do hit like and subscribe. Please do share the link to the show on your social media channels. Uh, you're watching Bright Green Live, a monthly show on our YouTube channel, which uh, brings you interviews with guests from across the left, from social movements, the Labour movement, Green parties, and much, much more. If you're interested in all that, the best way you can keep on top of everything we're putting out is to hit subscribe so that you get a notification whenever we put a video out and whenever we go live. We still have... An amazing array of five more guests throughout the show. Our next guest is going to be Martin Butcher. We're going to be talking about the Green Party of England and Wales new policy on NATO. Um, reflecting on the interviews we've done in the last few shows on that as well. We'll then be joined by Maisha Begum from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective to talk about the 10th anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse. 
Katie Montgomery will be joining us at 3 p.m. She's a YouTuber and an activist. We'll be talking about the EHRC's new guidance on the Equality Act and the ramifications it could have for trans people. Alex Powell will be joining us at 4 p.m. He's a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. We'll be discussing the impact of anti-migrant legislation on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. And finally, closing the show, Danielle Bett from Yakad will be joining us to talk about the protests against Netanyahu's judicial reforms in Israel and the impact they're having on the uh, public's attitudes towards um, the Israeli government, not just in Israel, but across the world as well. That is all still to come. And of course, throughout the show, we are still playing our game of Guess Who. I've been giving you clues to a mystery person who is a significant figure on the left throughout the show. We have had a series of clues so far as to who that person is. I'll run you down the ones we've had so far and then give you a new one. So first clue was that this mystery person was born in Essex. The second was that they died in 2014. The third is that they were a fan of Min Millwall FC. The fourth is that the mystery person has a brigade of the International Freedom Battalion named after them. And the fifth clue I'm going to give you is that this mystery person was the leader of the no to EU, yes to democracy, electoral alliance. Who is our mystery person? Get your guesses in the chat, please. Hit like, hit subscribe, hit share. Get questions for our future guests um, lined up in the chat. Any questions for me, I'm always happy to answer. Just to go to the chat. Um, so uh, Crusoe 40 says, Gwen was excellent as ever. Here's the thing, as he said, there are no logical or good arguments for the union. Independence is a matter of time. Love to hear people's thoughts and reflections on that. Uh, Crusoe 40 has also said that there is a Yes Come Remarch in Swansea on the 20th of May, 2023, which people can go to if they please. Uh, thank you to Gwen for your tweet saying that you enjoyed the interview. I enjoyed interviewing you too, and hopefully uh, it was a fruitful discussion for our viewers. Um, so please do get comments, questions in the chat for our remaining guests. Um, Paul Bezek has asked a question, which is coming a little late for Gwen, I'm sorry, which was that, that uh, Paul completely agrees that the United K Kingdom is an anachronistic and the legacy of empire but asks whether federalism works better than nationalism in changing that. I'm sorry I didn't get to put that to Gwen, but we have uh, people in the chat who may well want to have a discussion about that. And we will no doubt have future discussions on future episodes of Bright Green Live about that question and much more in relation to independence. Which brings me to tell you about the next episode of Bright Green Live, which will be taking place on May the 14th. On that episode, we already have three fantastic guests lined up. The first of them is Gillian Mackey, who is a Scottish Green Party MSP. Gillian has been campaigning around buffer zones for uh, uh, campaigning for buffer zones around abortion clinics to prevent protests from taking place immediately outside of them. I'm going to be speaking to Gillian about her campaigning and the legislation she's trying to bring in the Scottish Parliament to ban them. Uh, sorry, to, to introduce buffer zones. I'll also be joined by a representative of the Student Activist Network, People and Planet. Those of you who've been viewing for a while remember they were supposed to join last time, weren't able to make it. So we're bringing them on in the next episode to talk about the fossil free careers campaign, why People and Planet is campaigning to kick uh, fossil fuel company recruitment off university campuses. And then our final guest that I have for you. Uh, next time around is the author of a new book uh, which is called The Silent Coup, How Corporations Overthrew Democracy, which will be coming out very, very soon. I'm going to be speaking to one of its co-authors, Matt Kennard, about that book, the uh, themes within it, the topics that it covers, and much, much more about the influence of corporations on our democracy not just in the UK, but across the world. Um, I'm part way through reading that book, so I can't give anything away as of yet. But it'll be a fascinating interview. Matt is a brilliant uh, reporter, journalist, writer. Uh, interestingly, did a really, really uh, uh, fascinating and um, insightful video with Double Down News very recently about the uh, about the Labour Party and Keir Starmer's sort of right wing uh, uh, approach within the Labour Party. So that is all coming up on our next show, May the 14th. Please do stick around for that. Put it in your diary. Not stick around as in like you have to sit here for the next month, but please do stick it in your diary and make sure that you don't miss out by clicking the subscribe button so that when we go live, you'll get a notification. 
I am going to take a very, very brief break in a moment or two. In the meantime, please do get questions lined up for the guests that we have throughout the rest of the day, comments and thoughts and reflections on the previous interviews we've had, and your guesses for our mystery person who is a significant figure on the left, who was born in Essex, died in 2014, was a fan of Millwall, was has a brigade of the International Freedom Battalion named after them, and was the leader of the No to EU, Yes to Democracy, Electoral Alliance. Get your guesses in the chat as to who that mystery person, a significant figure on the left, was. I'm going to take that quick break now. Uh, please do get all those questions, etc., in the chat. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, tweet on the hashtag Bright Green Live, get questions lined up for our guests and for me, and I'll see you all very, very soon. Our next interview will be with Martin Butcher, uh, and that will be soon once I'm back from my break. See you very, very soon, shortly.
Hello, 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 and welcome back to episode six of Bright Green Live. Um, sorry, I'll be back in one moment. I'm just going to shut the door and then I'll be back. Apologies. The door is now shut and we are now back proper for episode six of Bright Green Live. Thank you so much for everyone for tuning in and for watching. If you're just joining us now, the show isn't just a sort of performance art piece of my silent bookshelves. We will be having interviews throughout the show with some of the most interesting, exciting, engaging, prominent figures on the left of politics. And we still have five amazing guests yet to come throughout the remainder of the show. Coming up next in about 10 minutes time, we have Martin Butcher, who is a Green Councillor, and he is also the former author of the NATO Monitor blog. As part of a series of interviews that we're doing at Bright Green, uh, looking at the Green Party's new policies on NATO, I'm going to be speaking to Martin about his criticisms of NATO as an organisation and his critique of the Green Party's new policy. On the last episode of the show, we interviewed Linda Walker, one of the authors of that policy, and Lindsay German, the convener of the Stop the War Coalition. You can, at your leisure, go back on our YouTube channel and watch those interviews. But today I'll be speaking to Martin about his criticisms of the party's new policy. I'll then be speaking to Maisha Begum, who is from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective. I'll be discussing with Maisha the um, 10th anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse. That was a building that collapsed in Bangladesh and led to the deaths of over a thousand garment workers. We'll be discussing what the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective has planned to commemorate the uh, 10th anniversary and also uh, looking at whether the conditions have changed in the garment industry uh, today. I'll be speaking to Katie Montgomery, the legendary YouTuber and activist about the EHRC, the Equality and Human Rights Commission's new guidance on the Equality Act and the ramifications it could have for trans people and trans rights. At 4pm, I'll be joined by Alex Powell, who's a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University and an expert in uh, migration law. Specifically, um, we're going to be discussing how the government's anti-migration legislation could impact on refugee um, asylum seekers and refugees. And then at 5 p.m. closing the show, we have Danielle Bett from Yahad, who will be talking to us about the protests in Israel um, against Benjamin Netanyahu's um, reforms to the judiciary, the impact that's having on in Israel and on uh, the Jewish diaspora's attitudes towards the Israeli government. That's the rest of our show. Five amazing guests still to come. If you like the sound of that, please do hit the like button. Please do hit subscribe. Please do share the link to the show because without you doing that, we won't be able to reach the many, many people who I'm sure would enjoy the show as much as you. And of course, we don't have the backing of billionaires. We don't have the backing of big business. We rely solely on the kind, the generous support of people just like you. So if you are able to, please do head to our website, bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation so we can keep running shows like this and keep putting out the amazing uh analysis content articles interviews that we um do as well so that's the rest of the show still to come throughout the show of course we are running our guess who competition where i give you a series of clues to a prominent significant figure on the left and you have to guess who they are we've had no correct guesses so far for our first guess who mystery person so please do get your guesses in the chat uh we have had the following clues so far this mystery person was born in essex they died in 2014. They are a fan of Millwall FC. The, they have a brigade of the International Freedom Battalion named after them. They were the, and the final clue I've given you thus far was that they were the leader of the No to EU, Yes to Democracy Electoral Alliance. Who is that mystery person? Please do get your guesses in the chat or indeed on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about some other work that Bright Green is going to be doing in the next month. So obviously coming up very, very soon, we have the 2023 local elections, which will be taking place in May. I spoke to Al Foden of Stats for Lefties earlier on in the show. You can rewind and watch that interview at your leisure uh, about the what those elections look like in terms of the scale of the Tory collapse that we're likely to see, uh, where the Greens could win big and gain lots of seats. And on election night itself, 
We're going to be running on Bright Green our website, the annual Bright Green election night live blog, where we'll be bringing you all the results as they come in, bring you analysis, news of the results and uh, the places where the Green Party and other left groups and left councillors are winning seats, places where they're potentially losing them. And we'll also be having at 3 a.m. on election night a live stream We'll be breaking down in more detail, doing some more analysis of the election results. We're hoping to have some high profile and significant guests to join us throughout that live stream. Uh, if you're still up at three in the morning, then join us for that to get it in your diaries. And at 6 p.m. on the Friday, the day after the election, we will be having a second live stream where, again, we'll be delving into the results when more have come in. And again, we'll be having some really incredible guests discuss all of that. Uh, they're going to be a lot shorter, those live streams. Uh, so if you find this a bit more of a marathon, that those will be a bit more of a sprint. So please join us for those. The best way that you can make sure not to miss out of them, obviously put it in your diary. But secondly, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you subscribe, you'll get a notification when we go live and you won't miss a thing. Um, and we are on 555 subscribers right now. Let's get to 570 by the end of the day. Hit that subscribe button and you won't miss out. You can also hit the like button. We're in 50 likes by the end of the day on this video. We're 24 right now. We can hit 50 with your help. So I'll do a brief introduction to our next guest who'll be joining us very, very shortly. I'll give you some context and some background to what we're going to be talking about. So at the Green Party Spring Conference, the party members voted to change the party's policy on NATO. So members gathered in Birmingham and they voted for a new policy which revoked the long-standing policy which, would, which said that the Greens would take the UK out of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, the military alliance that the UK has been a part of for many, many years. So it was a long-standing policy that the Greens would withdraw from that alliance. Now, the policy says something very different. It says that the Greens would support continued membership of NATO, but would seek to secure a number of reforms to that military alliance, including, for example, a commitment to a no first use policy when it comes to nuclear weapons, and also that NATO should only act in the interest of human rights and defense, defense of its member states. So to end the sort of military aggression that has come to uh, typify a lot of NATO's operations. So that was a big shift in the party's policy. The party's policy does still say that the Greens would consider other defensive arrangements if NATO would not accede to those reforms. Now, on the last episode of Bright Green Live, I spoke to Linda Walker, who was a co-convener of the Green Party's Peace, Defence and Security Working Group, the group within the party that rewrote those policies. I also spoke to Lindsay German from the Stop the War Coalition. Now, Lindsay is a convener of the Stop the War Coalition. That's the group that organised the largest demonstration in British history in 2003 against the Iraq War. And it's also an organisation that is deeply critical of NATO as an alliance. They obviously had different perspectives on the new policy. And we're going to be delving into that in a little bit more detail today with Martin Butcher, who is the... Uh, former author of the NATO Monitor blog and is a Green Party councillor as well. We're going to be discussing why he has concerns about the Green Party's new policy on NATO. And we're also going to be talking about why he's critical of Lindsay German and Stop the War Coalition's response. So uh, very much providing an additional different perspective on all of this. You can at any stage, obviously, go to our YouTube channel and watch the interviews with Lindsay and with Linda. Uh, but for today, very, very shortly, we'll be joined by Martin to give an additional perspective. Um, I'd love to get questions for Martin lined up from the chat. So the last two interviews we've done on NATO have been very, very interesting. And we have had a number of really interesting, good questions come through in the chat for Lindsay and Linda. I'd love to be able to put more questions to Martin as well. So if you do have any questions that you want to get answers to, please do pop them in the chat and I'll try and get them to him. The earlier they come in, the better. Uh, I've got some questions already lined up about whether NATO is reformable, whether the war in Ukraine shifts how the left needs to respond to the NATO and its attitudes towards NATO and much, much more besides. Uh, but I'm sure you have questions too, as you did for Lindsay and Linda. So please 
please do get them in the chat and I'll get as many to them, many of them to him as possible. For some reason, the one sentence I can't say is many of them to them, uh, which is a real tongue twister. And every single time I cock it up. So apologies. Maybe I should stop saying it. Before I bring Martin in, I will give you one one clue, one more clue, sorry, on our mystery guest of the day. Our first mystery guest, mystery guest, mystery person of the day, who, of course, is a significant figure on the left of politics. No one has correctly guessed this thus far. So please do get your guesses in the chat. The clues you've had so far are the mystery person was born in Essex. They died in 2014. They're a big fan of Millwall FC. They have a brigade of the International Freedom Battalion named after them. They were the leader of the No to EU Yes to Democracy Electoral Alliance. And my penultimate clue for you is that this mystery person was a co-founder of the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition, also known as Tusk. Who is our mystery person, please? Get your guesses in the chat. I would love to be able to praise some of you very, very heavily for your correct guesses. But thus far, we've had none. So please do get your guesses in the chat now. Have a little think before Martin joins us who that mystery person could be. In the meantime, a final reminder of our guests for the rest of the day. Martin Butcher's up next. We then have Maisha Begum from Oso oh Ethical and the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective talking about the 10th anniversary of the uh, Rana Plaza building collapse. Katie Montgomery, the uh, renowned and famous uh, YouTuber and activist, talking to us about the uh, Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission's new guidance that it sent in a letter to the Equalities Minister, Kemi Badenoch, uh, about the Equality Act and uh, the implications and ramifications that guidance could have if implemented on trans people and trans rights. At 4pm, I'll be joined by Alex Powell, who is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. We've had a lot of conversations uh, on Bright Green Live about the government's anti-migration uh, and anti-migrant legislation and rhetoric. We're going to be delving into that again, this time talking about the impact it could have on LGBT refugees and asylum seeker. And closing the show at 5pm, I'll be joined by Danielle Bett, from Yahad uh, to talk about the protests against Netanyahu's judicial reforms in Israel, the impact they're having um, on attitudes towards the Israeli government within Israel, but also uh, amongst the Jewish diaspora outside of Israel. That'll be closing the show. So five amazing guests still to come. Please do stay tuned, hit subscribe, hit like and share the show link. We've got some guesses coming in, in the chat on who our mystery person might be. Brilliant. Thank you for popping your guesses in. Get more guesses in and I will reveal the answer after I've given you the final clue following our next interview. We've got 16 people watching. That's brilliant. Please do hit like if you haven't already. And if you're just joining us, you're watching episode six of Bright Green Live, a monthly show which goes live on YouTube on the second Sunday of every month and brings you interviews with interesting, engaging, inspiring guests from across the left of politics from social movements, from cult from uh, the Labour movement, from the Green Part UK's Green Parties, from the arts and much, much more. And we have five amazing guests still to come on today's show. Stay tuned for all of that still to come. And I can just see that our next guest, Martin, has entered the waiting room. So I will just admit them to the call. And as I do so, as they connect, I'll just give them a brief introduction so that you all know who you are hearing from. So I'm absolutely delighted to be joined next by Martin Butcher. Martin is a Green Councillor and also the former author of the NATO Monitor blog. And we're going to be talking about the Green Party's new policy on NATO. Before we get into the detail of that, though, Martin, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Yeah, thanks very much for having me on. Doing well. Uh, uh, a little break for Easter Sunday from campaigning. <laughs> Good, good, good. Uh, we talked a little bit about the East Hertfordshire campaign earlier on, so people are uh, well acquainted with that, but that's not what we're talking about uh, right now. We're talking about NATO. Can you explain to our viewers what your major criticisms of NATO are? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to start with, it's a massive military bloc that consumes enormous resources and does so really inefficiently. Um, 
And in being that, it's an impediment to progress in security policy. So you go all the way back to the 1990s when I was living in Brussels and you know, working very actively on NATO issues. Um, the Cold War finished. People thought NATO would wind up. Certainly people in NATO HQ back in 1990 and 91 were absolutely panicking. They were all going to be out of a job. It was quite remarkable. Um, and we had the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, as a more human security based organization that, that um, certainly I worked to try and promote and people thought could, could take over from military blocs in Europe as, as disarmament happened that decade. But NATO stood in the way of that. There was a lot of um, momentum behind its existence, you know, 40 years at the time of existence, and the lack of trust that the continuation of that, that military bloc signaled meant that initiatives like the NATO Russia Council or um, OSCE drives to, to create a system based on indivisible security for all states just never got off the ground. And finally, I'd say, you know, the, the, the way the, the military looks at security as a zero is as a zero sum game. You know, if I've got security, then it doesn't matter whether you've got it. And indeed, if you think you can't have it because I've got military security, that doesn't matter to me because I feel safe. But in the long term, it's not a good way to 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 look at the world. So you finished there by saying that it's not a good way to look at the world. Now, the Green Party of England and Wales at its recent spring conference uh, passed a new policy on NATO. So historically, the Greens position was that the UK should withdraw from that military alliance. The new position is slightly more nuanced. So the, 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 the policy that was passed at spring conference in Birmingham says that uh, the Greens would like to see the UK remain a member of NATO and push for a series of reforms of, of it, uh, calling for NATO to, um, uh, to introduce a commitment to a no nuclear weapon first use policy, to um, ensure it upholds human rights in its operations, to only act in the, in the defence of its member states, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, now, you have said that you think that those reforms, that position is unrealistic. Why do you think so? Um, I think it's really important to base policy, all policy, in a, a careful study of what it is we're trying to reform. And I think you know, if we look at you know, good housing policy, you know, environmentally friendly housing, if we look at transport policy, absolutely Green Party policy is, is based in realistic assessments of what needs to be done and the step that needs to, steps that need to be taken to get to where we want to be. It often feels like the, the Green Party and, and, and the left in general um, in the UK doesn't look at an organization like NATO in the same way. It looks at it and thinks big military block, that's bad. Want to be against it. As you say, the new policy is a bit more nuanced, but um, I think I, I have heard people saying that, you know, there were some good ideas on one side of the debate, some ideas on the other side of the debate, they weren't necessarily able to be reconciled. So you sort of put a bit of both in. And and it makes for a declaratory policy that I don't particularly disagree with in most of the bits of, um, but it, it, it doesn't really feel like a realistic policy for actually what's happening in the world. I mean, it clearly, um, you know, we've seen German Greens going in a big way um, towards um, you know, military supplies to Ukraine and, and reinforcing defence because of what's happening in Ukraine. Um, and I under, absolutely understand that. Um, but I mean, the problem is NATO isn't something you can treat as just a homogenous organization that, that acts on its own. It's the sum of its member states. And you need to look at what all the member states think, what the bigger member states are doing, what the smaller member states are doing. 
how that organization has changed because of that over the years. Um, and I, I, I don't think that, that, that our analysis does that terribly well. I mean, I will say I was, I was pleased that the, 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 um, the paragraph on, new, on the missile defense didn't get deleted because I think that's really important. And I think people don't necessarily understand very well um, the offensive role of missile defense, you know, its potential for shooting down satellite, satellites, its potential for shooting down um, uh, you know, knocking out other other systems, which then allow the side that possesses possesses missile for defense to carry out its own offensive operations. It's an integral in, integral part of a first strike capability um, in nuclear terms. So I, I, I think it's to to me there's something of an understanding lacking in the 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 policy as a whole. It all feels a bit sort of cobbled together. In terms of that understanding, I guess the the, the party's defence policies, you know, still support and endorse uh, nuclear disarmament, and yet are now saying they want to maintain membership of NATO, which is fundamentally a nuclear alliance. How? W what do you see as the incongruence there between those two positions? Well, I think it, it's really basically that um, while you know, no first use of nuclear weapons is absolutely a policy, you know, I would support, have campaigned for, um, while, you know, other ideas like, you know, denuclearizing NATO as a whole, again, it's, you know, this is work I've tried to do over the years. It's, it's fundamentally unrealistic to think that NATO is going to go down this path. I mean, the first thing is, again, NATO's nuclear policy is driven by its member states and in this case by the United States and every time the United States does a nuclear posture review that policy then becomes NATO policy it it just happens it it follows people follow it because the US is you know the by far the largest nuclear state in NATO and they they decide things like that um, so you know, where where we're, we're in a situation now where the Biden administration has done its nuclear posture review, it's rejected no first use, it's rejected an idea um, that was knocked around during the Obama years and since about declaring that nuclear weapons only exist to de deter other nuclear weapons, play no other role, um, and indeed it's bringing more nuclear weapons back into Europe, they're, they're very likely to return to Lake and Heath after a 20 year absence. Um, and the, the nuclear sharing policy, um, where, which I wrote several papers on in the 90s and early noughties, tried very, very, very hard to get NATO states to accept that it was a breach of the non-proliferation treaty. Um, that's been strengthened, it's been widened to bring in cooperation of more member states and now we're seeing it mirrored between you know Russia and Belarus so um sadly I was at the at the Pentagon in 1998 when the German defense minister came to tell the United States that nuclear weapons had to go from Germany and the nuclear policy had to change and he went into the meeting really confident very sure of his talking points um telling the media what was going to happen in the meeting and he came out and stood there and said that he now understood that these things were very hard and that um, maybe there were factors that he hadn't considered and, and things would take time. And that in the meantime, NATO would have a review of disarmament issues to see what might be possible. So, you know, the, the block is not in Brussels on these things. The block is in Washington. So that's where you have to have to persuade change. And I think that's not reflected in the policy. So what do we do? Are, are we therefore not going to go in, into NATO because this change is not imminent? Or are we going to go into NATO and be sucked into nuclear defence as well? So I want to move on to one of the things that you mentioned earlier, which was Ukraine. And I think the context in which the Green Party's policy was rewritten is obviously in the aftermath of uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. 
And I think for quite a lot of people on the left, that's that's challenged their views on NATO and its role in world affairs. Um, do you think the left needs to reevaluate its position on NATO in any way following uh, Russia's invasion? I think it's absolutely reasonable to look for um, ways of helping the Ukraine to defend itself. I mean, Ukraine is a, you know, it's a sovereign state. It has the right of self-defense set out in the UN Charter. Supplying weapons to allow it to do that um, in the way that's been done seems to me to be absolutely reasonable. So in that sense, yes, I mean, I think the, we need to recognize that, um, you know, in instances like this, the world is as it is, not as we would like it to be. And, and uh, self-defense um, is a reasonable thing to strive for. Um, I think there is some over-egging of the pudding, as it were. I and mean, if we, we look at NATO as a whole, um, it has somewhere between two and a half and four to one advantage in conventional forces over, over Russia. And we've seen in Ukraine just how abysmally Russia's forces have, have performed militarily and how you know, bad their equipment is when you know, assessments prior to the war um, might have assumed that a large Russian force would just walk through a much smaller country. Um, so I, I think there's maybe too much stress in, oh my goodness, we have to build up military forces, we have to spend more on the military. Um, I think we could certainly coordinate more on the military. European countries spend a lot of money very, very inefficiently matching capabilities that they don't need to match and, and you could probably spend less and get more for their money if they coordinated better. Um, you know, the UK also, you know, we, we look at um, procurement in the MOD and it's, you know, nobody's happy with it either. Even the most militaristic Tories think it's appalling and needs to be done better. Um, so I, I think they, those two sides of the coin need to be need to be looked at at the same time. But it's definitely it's refocusing NATO um, back into its core mission of, of defence of its members and away from the sort of out of area or out of business attitude that took over in the 90s and saw you know, terrible episodes in, um, you know, ac across the world. And so some of the things that you've been saying have been similar to some of the things that um, Lindsay German, who I interviewed on the last episode from Stop the War Coalition said, but you have been critical of Stop the War's position on NATO and Lindsay's position as well. Mm. Um, where are the points that you disagree with them? Well, I think I mean, coming back to where we began, I think, you know, stop the war has a tendency to throw out slogans rather than to think about what it's saying. Um, you know, it's unfortunate. You know, I, I come from a background. I, I worked for CND for, for several years in the 80s. I was on CND's National Executive Committee. So, you know, I'm not unsympathetic to that campaigning background at all. Um, but, you know, when, when uh, you know, she says things like NATO is an offensive alliance and stop the war campaigns on that, um, I think, again, we have to get back to this question of looking at the difference between the organisation with the headquarters in Brussels and its member states. Um, you know, the, 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 the invasion of Iraq did not happen because NATO wanted to invade Iraq. It happened because the United States wanted to invade Iraq. And after the, it, it persuaded in a coalition of the willing a, a few states to come along with it, notably the UK. And then afterwards, it persuaded other NATO members to try and mop up its mess. Um, the same was very much true in Afghanistan. You know, NATO was not involved in the initial overthrow of the, the Taliban government after 9-11, but became involved once NATO had, had come in um, put Karzai in power and essentially demolished the government structures. So NATO was again used as a way to bring to bring other states in. Um, so 
I don't think it's necessarily fair to say that 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 the alliance is inherently an offensive alliance. I don't think it's, um, and I don't think it's helpful as 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 a way of campaigning. I mean, other issues that you know, NATO has been blamed for for the the war in Libya um, around the overthrow of Gaddafi, but again, you know, that was very much driven by France, Italy, with the UK tagging along and then dragging America into it. It was a French Italian thing that, as much as anything, um, was about um, changing the trying to change the relationship between um, uh, the south, southern and northern Mediterranean and, and stop flows of migrants. Now, obviously, that failed dramatically, and it failed dramatically because the Libyan state was systematically bombed out of existence by countries which belong to NATO, but were not acting as NATO. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's, that's, again, it comes back to, we, we need to, to study NATO. We need to, and defense as a whole, and we need, we need to um, understand thoroughly what we're talking about in order to be part of a um, a realistic debate about how to reform the UK's role in that alliance. And so while I've got you, uh, it's, 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 it's linked, but it's not directly related to the Green Party's position. But um, given your expertise in this area, I think it'd be interesting for our viewers to hear. Obviously, in the last uh, few days, there's been quite significant news in terms of NATO and its membership with, with Finland um, joining. And it looks like NATO is going to be expanding its membership more. Um, yeah. what's, your, what's your reflection on the, the changing shape of NATO, uh, sort of, I guess, post the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, I, I understand why Finland might want to do that now. Um, you know, and it's been years and years and years this has been discussed in Finland. Um, and I, I actually, I, I went to Finland back in about... 97 98 i forget exactly to debate the finnish defense minister about whether it was a good idea to join and i was there you know the the anti-nuclear movement expert who was you know basically saying it was a bad idea i need to discover that she thought it was a worse idea than i did <laughs> that threw me a bit but you know um so clearly circumstances have changed very much for finland and you know, within living memory, they have been invaded by Russia uh, and had land taken off them. Um, Sweden's in a bit of a different situation. Sweden throughout the Cold War, although neutral in a sense, integrated its defence very, very thoroughly with NATO planning. Um, so it, it's less of a surprise that they might want to. I, I, the, the enlargement of NATO is not in any way an excuse for Russia to do what it has done in Ukraine. It just isn't. But 20 to 30 years ago, lots of people in government as well as in civil society like me were saying that if we wanted to have a long-term sustainable peace in Europe, we had to take account of the security thinking of all European states, inside or outside NATO, and not do things that would um, lead to a deterioration of what looked at the time, you know, the beginning of the 90s, as if it might be a more peaceful world. And unfortunately, the momentum was with NATO, the enlargements began to happen. I mean, reluctantly, it must be said, you know, remember again very well being sat at NATO headquarters um, and told by a, a very senior British politi political figure in an off the record briefing that the partnership for peace that NATO invented in the mid 90s um, was not a stepping stone into NATO but was rather like the visitors room in a gentleman's club that that Hungary and Poland would be allowed to sit in the visitors room, but there was no way they would ever be allowed to become members. That didn't happen. Had that happened, it, you know, had, had that process been followed in that way, it might have been better and we might be in a better situation now. But 
back at the time, 20 something years ago, bad decisions were taken. Um, and you know, the, the Russians began to feel pushed into a corner. And with the, the way politics has deteriorated there into authoritarianism, you know, we're now at the end of that process and you know, they bear responsibility for what they've done. But um, at, the at the same time, um, you know, we could take the words of the OSCE again, have looked at security as an individual, an indivisible thing for, for all countries in Europe and, and proceeded on that basis, not on a zero sum game basis. Fine. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Chris. So that was uh, Martin Butcher, a Green Party councillor and the former author of the NATO Monitor blog. Uh, I hope that conversation was interesting, enlightening and was a nice compliment to the two previous interviews we've done on Bright Green Live with Linda Walker and Lindsay German, which you can, of course, catch on our YouTube channel. I'd love to get your thoughts on that interview in the chat. So please do let us know any comments or reflections that you have. Uh, Martin, please feel free to jump off the call now uh, as and when you want to. We'll crack on with the rest of the show. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Um, so we still have a stellar lineup of guests to come. Uh, including uh, next, we will be speaking to Maisha Begum from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective. I'll be discussing with Maisha the 10th anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse. I'll then have, uh, following that, uh, Katie Montgomery, the famous YouTuber and activist, to discuss the EHRC's letter to, on the Equality Act and the ramifications it could have for trans people. Alex Powell, the, uh, who is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University, will be speaking about the impact of anti-migrant legislation on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. And finally, Danielle Bett, the director of communications at Yihad, will be speaking to us about the protests in Israel against the um, Benjamin Netanyahu's judicial reforms there and the impact it's having on attitudes towards the Israeli government. If you enjoyed that interview with Martin, if you're looking forward to what's to come, please hit subscribe, please hit like, please share the show link. It helps massively and it means this video will appear in more people's feeds and you won't miss out on all of the future interviews and video we are putting out. Um, thank you, Linda, uh, for your comment. Uh, great to have Linda watching. Linda Walker, who um, we interviewed on the last episode of Bright Green to talk about the NATO policy. Linda has uh, said that denuclearizing NATO totally is clearly 100% realistic. Declaring a policy of no first use is unlikely, but not completely impossible. Uh, some, so some responses there to that interview with Martin Butcher just now. If you want to hear more from Linda, you can go back and watch the interview I did with her uh, a few weeks ago on YouTube. So throughout the show, we have been playing our game of Guess Who, where I give you a series of clues to a prominent figure on the left. I've given you, I think, six clues thus far, and I'm about to give you the final one. So the six clues I've given you so far is that this mystery person was born in Essex. This mystery person died in 2014. They were a fan of Millwall Football Club. They have a brigade of the International Freedom Battalion named after them. They were the leader of the No to EU, Yes to Democracy Electoral Alliance. They were a co-founder of the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition, i.e. Tusk. And the final clue I have for you is that this mystery person is a former general secretary of the RMT union. Guesses in the chat, please, after your full list of clues. I would love to give some of you brownie points for getting the answer correct. Uh, so more comments from Linda Walker coming in. So Linda says, for NATO to meet the demands of the Green Party, it would have to become a much less aggressive alliance. If that didn't happen, the Green Party would leave. And Linda says that uh, she's not sure why Martin objects to the policy. Thanks for keeping the conversation going there, Linda. That's very, very helpful. Um, and as I say, you can watch the interview with Linda on our YouTube channel. Um, thank you to everyone who is joining us, everyone who has hit like and subscribe. If you haven't already, do that, please. And please share the link to the show and get your comments, reflections on that last interview with um, Martin Butcher and any questions you have for our remaining guests in the chat i'm seeing some guesses come in for our mystery person please do keep them coming in 
So on the next episode of Bright Green Live, which is taking place on May 14th, I'm going to be joined by a number of incredible, inspiring guests. One of them is Gillian Mackey, who is a Green Party MSP in Scotland. She is the MSP who has been leading on the campaigns for buffer zones around abortion clinics. That's the concept that you prevent protests from taking place outside abortion clinics so people can have free and fair access to um, reproduct their reproductive rights. And we're going to be discussing that campaign and the legislation she's seeking to bring in into the Scottish Parliament to get Scotland to introduce buffer zones. I'll also be speaking to Matt Kennard, who is the author of a new book coming out very soon called Silent Coup. Uh, it's about uh, the role that corporations have played in um, undermining democracy and the role of the corporation in modern uh, political economy. Uh, that book's coming out very, very soon. Uh, brilliant journalist, reporter, investigator and author. I'll be speaking to Matt on the next episode. We'll be doing a deep, long conversation with Matt uh, to get into the um, the issues that are raised by his book. And I'll also be joined by a representative of People and Planet who will be talking about the Fossil Free Careers campaign, a movement of students seeking to get um, fossil fuel companies prevented from uh, recruiting students on university campuses. Uh, I'd love to hear any other thoughts you have on guests that I could get booked for future shows. We've got about six or seven slots still to fill on the May the 14th show, and we've got lots of slots, slots to fill in June, July, August, and so on. So please do get your suggestions in the chat for anyone that you want me to speak to on future episodes. Any recommendations or suggestions, much, much appreciated. Uh, so please do get them in the chat, and also any questions for our guests, or indeed for me. We still have five amazing guests to come. I'll give you one last list of the clues on our first Guess Who game. The mystery person is born in Essex. They died in 2014. They were a fan of Millwall FC. They have a brigade of the International Freedom Battalion named after them. They were a leader of the No to EU, Yes to Democracy Electoral Alliance. And they were a co-founder of the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition, i.e. Tusk. And they were a former General Secretary of the RMT Union. Who is that mystery person? I'm going to take a quick five minute break. Whilst I do that, get your guests in the chat and I'll reveal the answer when I'm back. Please also do get any questions for me or for our guests in the chat as well, and I'll pick them up when I return. I'll be back in five minutes. Thanks so much, Shua.
Oh, hello, hello. Welcome back. You are watching episode six of Bright Green Live. Thank you so much to everyone who has tuned in so far. And for those of you who stuck with us the whole time, please let us know in the chat if you've been here since the very, very beginning. We are at the halfway point of the show. We have four hours left. Let me know if you've been here for the full four hours. Uh, I would love to know who our long-standing viewers are. I know that uh, Ben Samuel has been here for a long time. Have you been here the whole time? Has anyone else been hiding away? Not taking up the chat, but sin still here since 10 a.m. this morning. Uh, let me know if you have been. Uh, just to come to some of the comments. So uh, Long Newton one says that strengthening NATO will only fuel the arms race. We need a different approach, one focused on developing understanding and working together to solve the global challenges we face. So that was in response to the conversation I just had with Martin Butcher about uh, NATO, the Green Party's new policy on it, and um, getting his take on that, and uh, also the interviews that I did with Linda Walker and Lindsay German on the last episode of Bright Green Live. If you're just joining us and you haven't already, make sure you hit subscribe, make sure you hit like. It doesn't cost you a penny. It helps Bright Green out massively. It means this show will appear in more people's feeds on YouTube. And if you hit subscribe, you won't miss out on any of the videos we put out in the future. Every time we go live, you'll get a little notification um, and you'll make me very, very happy. So please do do that. I promised that when I returned, I would give you the first answer on our Guess Who game. So I gave you a series of clues that the mystery person who's a significant figure on the left that we were looking for was born in Essex, died in 2014, was a fan of Millwall FC, had a brigade of the International Freedom Battalion named after them, was the leader of No to EU, Yes to Democracy, was the co-founder of the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition, i.e. Tusk, and was a former General Secretary of the RMT Union. The person I was looking for was, of course, Bob Crow. Well done to Enrol 4200, who was successful in getting that first. And well done also to Ben Samuel for getting Bob Crow as well. Full marks to you. Uh, you get a nice little feeling of success for correctly identify that I was looking for Bob Crow, the former... General Secretary of the RMT Union, one of the most effective trade unionists in recent political history. Of course, his uh, successor, one of his successors, uh, went on to become another one of the most uh, significant and um, successful trade unionists as well, which is, of course, Mick Lynch, the current General Secretary of the RMT Union. So we're going to crack on with our second game of Guess Who. So you got Bob Crow. That was the first, uh, first clues I gave you. The second person I'm looking for is a significant person on the left and they were born in Caracas. So you're looking for someone who was born in Caracas. Guesses in the chat, please. Please also do get questions lined up in the chat for the remaining guests that we have on for the rest of the show. I'm next going to be joined by Maisha Begum from Oh So Ethical and the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective. For those of you who aren't aware, the Rana Plaza uh, was a building collapse that took place in 2013. It was a garment factory in Bangladesh, and it led to the deaths of over a thousand workers. I'm going to be speaking to Maisha about the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective's plans to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the building collapse. We'll also be talking about the garment industry and the workers' rights and health and safety violations that are present within it, and whether there has been change within the sector and the industry since that collapse. Following my Isha, I'll be joined by Katie Montgomery, who for many people who are familiar with YouTube will be no doubt a household name. Katie is a prominent YouTuber and activist. I'm going to be talking to her about the Equality and Human Rights Coalition, the Equality and Human Rights Commission's new guidance on the Equality Act. So for those of you who missed this story, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the EHRC, was asked to provide guidance for the government on um, the interpretation of the protected characteristic of sex within the Equality Act. The uh, EHRC responded to that request by saying that it believed that sex should be determined to be, quote unquote, biological. And what it means by that is that the sex that you're assigned at birth should be how sex is determined in the Act when we're looking at things like um, protections uh, against discrimination and uh, that obviously has huge ramifications for 
trans people and trans rights. The guidance has been extremely controversial and attracted major criticism, including from LGBT rights organisations like Stonewall. So I'm going to be talking to Katie about the guidance the HRC has issued and the potential impact and ramifications it could have on trans rights and trans people. Following that, I'll be joined by Alex Powell, who is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. We'll be discussing the government's anti-migrant legislation, and we'll be looking specifically at the impact of that legislation on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, Alex is an expert in migration law, refugee and asylum law, specifically in relation to LGBT um, refugees. So that'll be a really interesting conversation, continuing the conversations we've had with other guests about the government's anti-migrant legislation. And closing the show, I'll be joined by Danielle Bett, who is the Director of Communications at Yahad, uh, which is an organisation which campaigns uh, within the Jewish community in Britain to advocate for a two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict and for an end to the occupation of Palestine. With Danielle, I'll be discussing the uh, protest in Israel against the uh, judicial reforms that Benjamin Netanyahu has tried to introduce. Um, we're going to be looking at what those judicial reforms are, why it's elicited such protests and the impact those protests could have on the uh, attitudes towards the Israeli government amongst the Israeli population and the Jewish diaspora outside of Israel as well. So that's all still to come. We're halfway through the show. We've got four amazing guests still to come. If you're just joining us, you can rewind through the show and catch up with any of the interviews we've done so far. So kicking off the show, I spoke to Sean Berry, who is a former co-leader of the Green Party of England and Wales and also a member of the London Assembly. We discussed the 23 years that the Greens have been sitting in the London Assembly and the impact that those Green Party politicians have had. We discussed a whole bunch of stuff in relation to some of the campaigning issues and working on some of the things they managed to get the mayors of London to do and much, much more. That was at 10.15. So if you go back to about 15 minutes into the video, you'll be able to find that. At 11 o'clock, so about an hour into the video, I spoke to Elle Folan. Elle has been on the show before. Uh, they came on again today to talk about the upcoming local elections, which are taking place in May. We discussed the scale of the Tory collapse that's expected, how well the Labour Party and Liberal Democrats will do, but we've focused and honed in really on the prospects the Green Party have of gaining seats in a big way in those elections, including looking at some of the, the council areas where the Greens could gain a substantial enough number of seats to take control of councils. I then spoke to Samuel Sweet from the Peace and Justice Project. The Peace and Justice Project was founded by Jeremy Corbyn and is a campaign group that uh, is working on a whole range of issues and recently has launched the Music for the Many campaign, which is seeking to protect and defend live music venues across the country. We looked at the issues that are facing music venues right now and how people can get involved in the campaigns to save them. Gwen Gwynville was our next guest. He's the CEO of Yes Cymru. We discussed the movement for Welsh independence, how strong support is for Welsh independence and the big issues that Yes Cymru are campaigning on right now. What are they seeking to, uh, how are they seeking to win independence? And finally, uh, so that was at 12.30, so look back about an hour and a half, you'll find that. At 1.15, I spoke to Martin Butcher, who's a Green Party councillor and a former, the former author of NATO Monitor, which is a blog that uh, looked at the at NATO uh, its operations and we discussed the Green Party's new policy on NATO. It changed early this year at the Green Party Spring Conference so the party no longer supports outright withdrawal from NATO. Instead Greens want to see reforms to NATO including the uh, introduction of a no nuclear first strikes policy, the upholding of human rights and um, the ensuring that NATO only operates in defence of its member states. We discussed uh, all that and more and you can go back 20 minutes to catch that interview. So that's the rest of the show. If that sounds exciting, it sounds interesting. First thing I'm going to ask you to do is hit like. If you hit like, the video will appear in more people's feeds. That means that the people, if you find it interesting, other people will too. They get to see it as well. You can also share a link to the stream on your social media channels, preferably using the hashtag Bright Green Live. And of course, if you like this show, please do hit subscribe because that means that you won't miss out on all the other episodes we have coming up in the future, including our next episode on May the 14th. Catch that by hitting subscribe. Of course, with all those guests that we have coming up, you can line up questions for them in the chat. The earlier I get the questions in the chat, the more likely I am going to be able to put them to them. And uh, everyone will have a wonderful time because you'll get your questions answered and I'll feel a little bit less lonely staring at my camera for eight hours straight. Obviously, this is very odd behaviour. Um, our viewers seem to like the show. So there we are.
So Aisha Begum is going to be joining us soon. But before we go into our next interview, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about Bright Green's coverage of the upcoming local elections. So obviously on this episode of Bright Green Live, we spoke to Al Folan earlier today about the Green Party's prospects in those elections. But on our website, bright-green.org, we're also running a series of articles looking at the places where the Green Party could really win big. There are a number of councils across the country where the Greens could gain significant numbers of seats. Some of those places, the Greens could be making double digit gains. In other places, the Greens could take control of councils, including in one place, the Greens look on track to win majority control of a council for the first time in history. We're going to be delving into all of that and more in our analysis over the next few weeks. So we're going to be running a series of articles deep diving into the places where the Greens could be having major, major success. We published the first of those articles recently, which took a look at Herefordshire. Now, Herefordshire is interesting because in 2019, the last time these seats were up for election, the Greens went from two to seven councillors. Now, in this year's election, I've spoken to people involved in the campaign and they think that the Green Party could win somewhere in the region of 14 to 16 councillors. That would see the Green Party double their representation on the council and go to double digits in terms of the number of seats they hold. Now, Herefordshire is a really interesting place politically right now because historically the county, the council had been run by the Tories. In 2019, the Greens and Independents, and I think some Lib Dems too, swept the board and won loads of seats from the Tories, kicking them out of office, and they were replaced by a joint administration of the Greens and the Independ and Independents. Since they've been in administration, Greens and Independents have introduced a whole raft of policies that have been very, very different to the sorts of things that you'll get from the Tories. So, for example, the administration introduced a scheme of free bus travel on Sundays um, in the wake of COVID-19. There's a whole bunch of other things. They're talking about building council houses for the first time in a very, very long time. A whole raft of measures you wouldn't get while the Tories were in office. They're going into that election in 2023, in May, in a few weeks' time, on that record. And they think... Their record is going down well. The voters are supporting them. The support for the Tories is at an all-time low and that they could double their seats on the council. You can find all that analysis on our website with the first three articles in that series. Tomorrow, we'll be publishing a piece on the elections in Lancaster. Now, again, in Lancaster, the seats were last up for election in 2019. In those elections, the Greens won, I think, 10 or maybe 11 seats. They're now on 15 as a result of by-elections and as a result of uh, defections from other parties. I've spoken to some people involved in the Lancaster campaign and they're confident that they're going to end up on more than 20 seats in the next election in May. Now, in Lancaster, the Greens are also in administration right now. They lead the council in a coalition with some independents and with uh, Labour and they are hoping to continue with the administration, be the largest party on the council after the next election. If that happens, it's really, really significant, not only because the Greens will be still running Lancaster, but because they'll have increased their numbers substantially. And it's really interesting because the Labour Party in Lancaster are in disarray, the Tories are at rock bottom, and the Greens, I think, were the only party to run a full slate of candidates across the whole of Lancaster, which they didn't manage last time. Last time they ran 35 out of the 61 seats that are available. This time they're running a full slate. Fascinating what could happen in Lancaster. Check out our analysis, which is going live on our website tomorrow. There are other interesting places. So with Elle earlier, I spoke to them about the elections in Mid-Suffolk. So in Mid-Suffolk, the Greens currently have 12 seats. They had massive gains in 2019. That means they only need six seats. They need to gain six seats in order to have majority control of the council. If they get majority control of Mid-Suffolk Council, it will be the first place in the country anywhere ever that the Greens have been in majority administration. So yes, there are places where the Greens have run councils. So right now there's over a dozen places in the country where Greens are in administration. But often, in fact, in almost all instances, they are in joint administration with other parties. And the one place where they're in sole administration is Brighton and Hove. And in Brighton and Hove, the Greens don't have a majority. They're simply the largest party. That means that in Brighton and Hove, in order to pass a budget, in order to get various things through, they need to rely on the votes for the parties. 
If in Mid-Suffolk the Greens win a majority, they don't have to rely on anyone else and are able to govern alone. So Mid-Suffolk is going to be very, very interesting. It's also interesting because Adrian Ramsey, the Green Party's co-leader, is a candidate in Waveney Valley, which covers part of the council area of Mid-Suffolk. And so the momentum is uh, that could be built from the Greens winning a majority on the council could really boost the general election campaign in Waveney Valley too. It's exactly very, very similar to uh, Herefordshire, where Ellie Chowns, former MEP, is very hopeful of doing very well in North Herefordshire in the next general election. It's a parliamentary seat the Greens are targeting as well. The fourth place I wanted to mention as an interesting uh, council where the Greens could win and win big is, of course, Brighton and Hove, which I just talked about. The reason Brighton and Hove, I think, is interesting is because in 2023, the Greens are hoping to do something they've never done before. In 2011, the Greens took control of Brighton Hove Council. They ran the council for four years as a minority administration, and four years later in 2015, they lost seats and lost control of the council. They then came back into office uh, seven years later in 2020 or 2021, I can't remember which, uh, but a couple of years ago, and they're seeking to go into the 2023 elections in administration and come out the other end also in administration. That would be the first time anywhere that a Green Party had managed to go in as the sole party of administration and come out the other end that's still in administration. So Brighton Hove is very, very interesting. They've had boundary changes, which means it's hard to, slightly harder to predict what's going on there. But they are confident of, of doing well. And it'd be very interesting to see if they manage to retain control. So that's another historical thing that could happen this May. The final place I want to talk to you about is East Hertfordshire. So in East Hertfordshire, the Greens, I think, have two seats that they won in the 2019 local elections. In 2023, there is talk amongst the Green Party of potentially winning, uh, gaining more than 10 additional seats on the council. So going from two to something like 12 or 13. That's huge. And it's really interesting because in 2019, in East Hertfordshire, the Greens came a really strong second or third in lots of places. And actually with a bigger, bolder, stronger campaign, combined with the fact that the Tories are tanking in the polls and a lot of the East Hertfordshire sheets are Tory seats, there's a real prospect of the Greens winning big and gaining lots of seats in East Hertfordshire. There's lots of other seats, there's lots of other places, there's lots of other councils where there could be big gains too, but those are five that I just wanted to talk to you about uh, initially. And you can catch all of our analysis in depth on our website, bright-green.org, starting with that piece on Herefordshire. Tomorrow, piece on Lancaster and much more to come over the next few weeks. So make sure you head to bright-green.org, subscribe to our mailing list, follow us on our social media channels so that you can catch all of our election analysis of the upcoming local elections. On election night itself, we'll also have a live blog on our website, uh, bringing you all the results for the Green parties, the wide left analysis news uh, in a way that the other media outlets don't. We'll be really delving into the impact of the elections for the left and for the Greens. And also on election night at 3am on our YouTube channel, we're going to go live, have a live stream, bring you in-depth analysis and discussion with important prominent figures about those election results. And a second live stream will be happening at 6pm, the Friday after election day, to delve a little bit deeper into the results when we have more of them in from the counts that take place at the following day. That's all to come still in Bright Green's election coverage. If you want to make sure that happens and that can continue to happen in future years, the best way that you can do that is to head to website bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation because we don't have the backing of billionaires. We don't have the backing of big business. We rely solely on the kind and generous support of people just like you. It's the reason we're able to cover the left. It's the reason we're able to cover the Green Party because we're not beholden to vested interests. We're not beholden to billionaires, big business, bankers or anything else. We are only beholden to our readers and viewers. So please do set up a regular donation to help us cover these elections, elections in future years, the Greens more broadly as well. I'll leave that there as we warm up for our next interview. So Maisha Begum will be joining us in about five minutes time. She is from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective and Oso oh Ethical. We're going to be talking about the Rana Plaza disaster that took place in 2013. Ten years on from that uh, building collapse, which led to a thousand workers losing their lives. We're going to be discussing the, um, the, the impact of that. 
whether the garment industry has changed and whether the issues that were present at Rhino Plaza are still present today and how uh, the Rhino Plaza Solidarity Collective will be commemorating the 10 year anniversary. At 3 p.m., I'll be joined by Katie Montgomery, the YouTuber and activist. We'll be discussing the EHRC's new guidance on the Equality Act and its ramifications for trans people and trans rights. At 4 p.m., I'll be joined by Alex Powell, who is the, a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. And he will be talking to us about the government's anti-migrant legislation and its impact on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. And closing the show at 5 p.m., I'll be joined by Danielle Betts, who is a, the director of communications that you had. We'll be discussing the protests against uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's judicial reforms and the impact they are having on attitudes towards Israel um, amongst the Israeli public, but also the Jewish diaspora outside of Israel as well. So that is all still to come. Please do stay tuned. If you haven't already, hit like, hit subscribe, share the show link. I'll be joined by Maisha very, very shortly. But before we bring Maisha in, our Guess Who game, our second mystery person, a significant prominent figure on the left. I'm looking for somebody who was born in Caracas. Please get your guesses in the chat as to who that mystery person could be. And also, of course, please do get questions in the chat right now for our next guest, Maisha Bagan. Uh, and I'll try and get as many of uh, those put to them as we can. In the meantime, please do, of course, like, share and subscribe. You can also share this video on the hashtag Bright Green Live uh, and get any questions, comments, thoughts on there as well. Um, and again, I'll try and put anything you put on there to our guests. Uh, the earlier you get your questions in for me, the easier it is for me to get them to our guests. Um, and uh, the more likely it is that I'll be able to put them to them. So if you want something asked, please do get in the chat and I'll try and put it to them. Um, and we'll get started with the next interview very, very shortly. Um, if you haven't already subscribed, just to let you know that the next episode of Bright Green Live will be happening on May 14th. You can uh, make sure that you don't miss it by hitting subscribe or pop it in your diary, but we have three amazing guests lined up already. We have uh, Gillian Mackay from the Scottish Green Party. She's an MSP who's been campaigning for buffer zones around abortion centres, uh, campaigning to stop protests uh, from taking place so that people can exercise their rights to uh, reproductive rights and, uh, and abortion uh, freely. Uh, I'll be talking to her about the legislation she's planning to bring into the Scottish Parliament that uh, would prevent, would introduce buffer zones. I'll also be speaking to Matt Kennard, who is a journalist, writer, author about his new book that he's co-written called Silent Coup, which is all about how corporation, corporations are undermining democracy across the globe. I'll also be speaking to um, a someone from People and Planet, the Student Activist Network, and we'll be discussing the campaign to get fossil fuel companies uh, prevented from recruiting holding recruitment activities on campus and getting rid of the recruitment pi pipeline from uh, universities to the fossil fuel industry. So that's all still to come. But for now, I'm going to bring in our next guest now for our, uh, for our next interview. So whilst Maisha connects to the call, I will just do a brief introduction so that you all know who you are about to hear from. So next up, I am joined by Maisha Begum, who is from uh, the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective. We're on the 10th anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse, and we're gonna be discussing that event and how the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective is commemorating it. But before we get into any of that, I just want to give a, a massive welcome to Maisha. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Thanks so much for having us. No, I'm really grateful for this platform for what we're doing and what we have planned so thanks again for like letting us come on not at all thank you so much for joining us so let's get started then so it's been 10 years now since the rhino plaza disaster could you explain to our viewers uh, who might not be familiar with it uh, what happened at rhino plaza um for those of our viewers who aren't aware yeah sure so for context rhino plaza was an eight-story building in bangladesh which housed multiple businesses, so shops, a bank, um, but particularly garment factories. Um, and so in April 2013, it became widely known among the public locally and nearby and the workers inside that there were wide cracks in the building and it basically sparked fear among the workers. Um, when the cracks became very visible, a lot of the, the businesses inside shut down, so the shops and the banks, they closed for business. However, the only businesses that remained open were the garment factories and they basically continued business as usual. 
And so on the morning of 24 April 2013, garment workers refused to go in the factory, literally pleading to the factory owners to not let them in because they were very scared for their lives. Instead, they were met with um, threats that they would lose their wages. And bear in mind, garment workers are paid poverty wages. They don't have any savings. So they were essentially compelled to go into work that day. And literally hours later, the whole building collapsed within 90 seconds and there were 3,000 workers, in, workers inside. And so this, for, this basically marked the most deadliest disaster in the garment industry. And the official death toll is 1,138 and thousands injured. But according to Bangladesh Garment Workers Solidarity Group, which is an all workers organization in Bangladesh, they estimate it's actually 1,175. And so a lot of the investigations and so a lot of trade unions had to go on the ground and basically a lot of brands were denying that they were sourcing from the factories and so trade unions had to take it upon themselves to go into the rubble amidst the bodies and the, um, the just the dis just the, it was a really horrible situation. Um, it was just really horrible. They basically had to go in and look for the labels, try and find which brands were linked to the factories and so for UK brands, a lot of the brands were Matalan, Benetton, Primark, Mango. Um, and so yeah, this was, the collapse was largely the result of the fact that the owner had been adding extra stories onto the building that were, but he had had no permit for that. And it was basically a very structurally unsafe building. Um, and so it, the building basically couldn't hold the weight of all the machinery in the factory, sort of um, the vibrations from the factories. And so for us, this was, um, yeah, so for me, I was 18 at the time, and so for most of us, it was just basically a harrowing reminder of how deadly the fashion industry is and how workers are essentially just cogs in a machine that are very dehumanized. They're subject to horrific working conditions, and they're just made to work regardless of the risk to their lives. And the fact that brands will continuously try to undercut their wages, their health and safety, um, just to maximize their profits. And so... You've talked obviously there about what happened uh, in the event. I guess following the building collapse, there was, um, I mean, it exposed sort of major issues within the garment industry and the, and I guess in the supply chains of major Western brands, um, some of which you've mentioned. But after the building collapse, there was a real push um, amongst the, I guess, uh, the labour movement in Bangladesh and the international solidarity movement for the industry to, to clean up its act and uh, that included through for example the Bangladesh Fire Safety Accord and other measures. Um, what do you think the impact has been of the the campaigning around Rana Plaza and um, what's your sense of the uh, scale of the issues in the garment industry today? Are these issues still present? Yeah so with the Bangladesh Accord this was so this is a legally binding agreement which holds brands legally accountable to invest in health and safety in the factories in Bangladesh that they source from. And so this was actually an agreement that was, the trade unions were trying to push this agreement prior to Rana Plaza, but a lot of the brands were kind of just like, no, we don't want to get involved and kind of shifting responsibility, evading responsibility. And then when Tazreen factory fire happened in 2012, which was literally six months before um, Rana Plaza, then that happened. And so they were like, oh, maybe we should be investing in health and safety. And then Rana Plaza happened. And then because of the global outcry, like you mentioned, that then led to that agreement being pushed ahead. So it was something that was in the works, but it was just, it took thousands of people to die and a global campaign for it to happen. And so, yeah, this got put through um, and it's basically, yeah, a legally binding agreement with between global and Bangladeshi unions and brands. And so we have seen, so a lot of research has shown that there has been significant in, um, success in terms of protecting health and safety. And so, for example, there was a study by Professor Mark Anna who found who compared um, health and safety between 2013 and 2018 and found, for example, 83% of factories that were identified as having inadequate circuit breakers, which can basically is a big, big fire hazard. Um, they had been fully remediated by 2018. And then um, also when it comes to escapable exits, which is a big issue with a lot of, particularly in factory fires, 97% of the factories with these issues had been remediated. So we're seeing a lot of remediation in the factories under the accord. I think a significant problem we're finding is that there's a lot of subcontracted factories, which are basically factories that are hired by bigger tier one factories to help meet the demands of the excessive demands of brands um, sort of production. 
requirements and so these are very much under the radar no one knows they exist no one really there's no sort of regulation and so workers are very much at risk of health and safety violations abuse um, wage theft etc and so this is a ongoing sort of systemic sort of issue among, across the garment industry and i basically today took a quick look at any sort of fire help fires that are um industrial accidents have happened in the garment factory because I do media monitoring my day job so it's something I've checked regularly and literally in the past two weeks we've had a, like three shoe fire factories a textile factory fire um, and one another one in which um, four people had to be rescued from the fire so this is a very this is literally the just past two weeks so this is an ongoing issue beyond the Bangladesh Accord and I think another point I want to make is that health and safety shouldn't necessarily be confined to structural issues. So for example, we have wage theft, which is, at, which is basically putting workers at risk because they can barely afford to kind of nourish themselves and afford to pay rent, et cetera. The systemic uh, gender-based violence and harassment that we've seen continuously and particularly exacerbated post COVID. Um, and then we have mental health impact of um, having to work forced, having to work overtime to just make ends meet. And so there's all these elements of health and safety that are still very much there and exist and have been exacerbated by brands purchasing practices, which is basically how they choose to do business with their suppliers. And so a lot of the time they'll undercut the suppliers and say, we're not going to pay it. We're not going to we're going to ask for this amount of um, clothing, but we're not going to pay the amount you need. And if you don't agree, we're going to go somewhere else. So you have to accept this. And that has been an ongoing basis. And this, the report I mentioned earlier by Mark Anna found that while health and safety has improved, these practices have become worse. So the expectation of the lead times that factories are given to make clothes has become shorter. The wages have gone lower. So we're seeing this improvement in health and safety and um, it's a really great thing. And it's now been expanded to Pakistan with the Pakistan Accord, which is amazing. But we're seeing all these other issues related to health and safety that are still very much existent. And amid the econ economic crisis, where, um, brands have once again put workers um like basically sacrifice work and then are now again putting workers at risk and it's just getting worse and so i guess in light of that then like the kind of endemic issues that you've talked about there within the garment industry i mean that's that's also true within other sectors as well so you look at the electronic sector that's a huge has huge issues around labor rights violations around chemical exposure all the things that you talked yeah. about as well in light of all that and the kind of ongoing issues within global supply chains, how can people support the struggle of workers on the ground who are uh, in factories experiencing these conditions? How can people uh, support and stand in solidarity with those people? Yeah, I mean, while all these horrific things are happening, there's a massive sort of worker led trade union movement across the garment sector. And I think one thing we found is that effective collective solidarity has been very key to challenging brands purchasing practices. So for example, during the pandemic, people might remember when brands basically in response to their, their shop shutting, they basically canceled orders of the suppliers, their first people to go to were to undercut the, work the workers. And so this meant that a lot of suppliers couldn't afford to pay the workers, workers lost their wages, um, and there were like mass demonstrations, mass protests. And so unions basically connected with international worker organizations and said, look, these are the brands that are canceling orders with us. A lot of suppliers provide that intel as well. And so there was essentially a global sort of movement, especially as it was locked down, everyone was online. There was a very much a big outcry against the brands cancelling orders without any sort of regulation of the workers and conditions. And there was a report by Worker Rights Consortium, which found about 80 percent of workers were essentially starving because of it. And it was a really horrific time. But because of that movement, a lot of brands then U-turned and agreed to pay the council for the council orders which was a huge sort of, we are, you're convincing billion dollar brands to basically U-turn on a big business decision they've made. And so since then, we've seen a big sort of, sort of collective action sort of thing that's been happening since. So whenever there's a factory closure, there's a bright organization called Clean Clothes Campaign or Labour Behind the Label, they'll basically say, look, this is happening. This is what our trade unions are telling us. Here's how to get on board with the campaign. And so there's been outcry, subsequent outcry. And as a result, we've helped to sort of U-turn those decisions or force brands to pay up. This isn't a very like this isn't a sustainable way to do it, but it's effective. And I think more supporting worker unions and worker movement and build, union building will only strengthen the movement. And I think that's absolutely crucial. And I think it's a very 
bottom up solution we have where it's very much workers are leading the movement and we are supporting that in any way we can so the organizing such as people hills campaign labor behind the label one one they're very much sort of in contact with these unions and so i guess uh before i ask you about the kind of uh, commemoration events that uh, the runner plaza solidarity collective has planned i just you mentioned there that um the kind of responsive campaigns isn't a sustainable way to tackle the systemic issues. So I guess, what do you think needs to happen in terms of long-term reform to supply chains in order to tackle these systemic issues? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think the trade union movement across the garment sector has been weakened significantly. And I think, I think while I say it's not sustainable, I think it's, it's going to eventually hopefully lead to a stronger trade union movement. And I think that's, I'm pushing, I don't know, it's a bit difficult because I think essentially we would just need brands to that the, the redistribution of wealth. I think brand, we're very much not at that stage yet, but I do think building the trade union movement because essentially that's what will lead to significant change and the ability to collective bargain um, and leave put workers on the table. So I think I think continuing to support these movements is absolutely crucial. And I think eventually that will lead to a place where workers will then be able to speak up and have their say in how their conditions are. So finally, then, uh, it's the 10th anniversary of the Rana Plaza disaster. Um, what does the Solidarity Collective have planned to commemorate uh, the event? Yeah, so we have multiple events happening across London, Leicester and Manchester for everyone to get involved in the public to help not only commemorate the workers and to pay tribute to them, as well as all other workers who have become a victim of um who are basically uh, being subjected to such horrific conditions, but also to remind ourselves of who, those who profited and continue to profit from the exploitation of workers. So on the 23rd, there are marches taking place in both London and Manchester to pay tribute to the workers and also remind brands who are on a high street of their role and that we haven't forgotten their complicity. On the 24th, there's memorial events happening both in London, in al Tabeli Park, and also in Leicester with high fields. Um, high, Leicester is a big sort of garment house, is a hub for garment factories so um there'll be a bunch of events from panels um, exhibitions film screenings and a memorial service so you can find out all this information at ranaplaza-solidarity.org and we'll keep updating for any events that are happening yeah well thank you so much for your time today Marisha. it's been an absolute pleasure no worries. thank you so much appreciate it Thank you so much. So that was Maisha Begum from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective. I'd love to get your thoughts on that interview and some of the issues that were raised there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop in the chat now a link to the website that um, Maisha mentioned at the end there so that if you do want to get involved with any of the solidarity, solidarity activities and the commemoration of the Rana Plaza building collapse, you can do so at the link that's in the chat there. Uh, click that link and you can get see what's happening and what the collective are organising and um, how you can get involved. So, um, yeah, so the, the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective is a fantastic group of organisations that are leading the, um, the commemoration and also organising for justice for garment workers going forward, it includes the likes of Labour Behind the Label, which Maisha mentioned, Oh So Ethical, which um, Maisha is involved in, No Sweat, the anti-sweatshop campaign group, and War on Want. We've spoken to Jay Kerr from uh, No Sweat on the previous episodes of the show. And we'll continue to bring you interviews with some of the people on the front lines of campaigning for justice for workers in international supply chains um, as well. So. Uh, please do click through on that link and find out the activities that will be going on and let me know what you thought about that into in the chat. Still to come on today's show is we have three guests uh, who will be joining us very, very soon. We have Katie Montgomery, who is a YouTuber and activist. We'll be discussing with her the, um, the EHRC, the Equality and Human Rights Commission's new guidance on the uh, Equality Act and the impact that could have on trans people and trans rights. Following that, I'll be joined by Alex Powell, who is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University, and we'll be discussing the government's latest anti-migrant legislation and the impact it could have on LGBT um, refugees and asylum seekers. And then closing the show, I'll be joined by Danielle Betts from Yahad to talk about the um, protests against Benjamin Netanyahu's planned judicial reforms in Israel and 
the impact those reforms and the protests are having on public attitudes towards the Israeli government in Israel and beyond within the Jewish diaspora. So that is all still to come on the rest of the show. We're still live for the next three and a half hours, so please do stick with us. If you haven't already, please do hit like, please do hit subscribe, and of course, please do share the link on your social to the show on your social media channels, preferably using the hashtag Bright Green Live. If you've enjoyed this show so far, other people will enjoy it too. The best way to make sure that they see it is to hit like and to share the link to the show. I'm flagging a little bit. Uh, I've been going for four and a half hours. So I'm going to get another coffee. And whilst I do, um, I want you to continue with our Guess Who game. So we're trying to find a uh, mystery person who is a significant figure on the left. The first clue I gave you was that this mystery person was born in Caracas. And the second clue I'm going to give you is that this mystery person died of tuberculosis. Those are your first two clues. Get your guesses in the chat whilst I'm gone fetching my coffee. Uh, please do stay with us for the duration. We've got some amazing guests still to come. And I'll see you all very, very soon.
we are you are watching episode six of bright green live thank you so much for those of you who are watching apologies for the gap whilst i got myself some caffeine uh it's been a long day we're nearly there we're over the halfway mark but we still have three amazing interviews still to come uh next up i'm going to be joined by katie montgomery who uh many of you will know is a youtuber and activist and we're going to be discussing the EHRC, the Equality and Human Rights Commission's latest guidance on the Equality Act. That guidance has proved to be hugely controversial and has faced extensive criticism from LGBT groups and campaigners, including Stonewall and others. And we're going to be discussing with Katie the um, the impact of that guidance if it were implemented on uh, trans people and trans rights. Following that, at uh, Four o'clock, I'll be joined by Alex Powell, who is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. I'll be speaking to him about the government's anti-migrant legislation and the impact it could have on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, Alex is an expert in asylum law, and um, we've talked about the anti-migrant anti-migrant legislation the government has introduced on previous episodes of the show we're going to be delving into the specifics of its impact on lgbt people um with alex and then at five o'clock closing the show i'll be joined by danielle back from the card we'll be talking about the uh, protests against um the israeli government's new judicial reforms that benjamin netanyahu is trying to introduce and what that means for attitudes towards the israeli government the israeli state both within israel and among the jewish diaspora uh, more broadly um so we'll be talking about that all that throughout the rest of the show if you're just joining us and you haven't caught the previous interviews you can rewind through the video and catch any of them at your leisure i'll just run through what we have had so far so at 10 15 this morning bright and early i was joined by sean berry sean is the former co-leader of the green party of england and wales she's a london assembly member a three-time mayoral candidate uh in london and uh, we talked about the Green Party's, um, the impacts the Green Party has had on the London Assembly. Over the 23 years, the Greens have had representations, representation on that body. We also talked about what the Greens will be prioritising in the 2024 London Assembly and mayoral election campaigns. So you can go back to about 15 minutes, 15 minutes to start this video to catch that. At 11 o'clock, I spoke to Al Folan, who is the election expert analysis and statistician behind Stats for Lefties, which you may know is the prominent Twitter account and blog. They're also a commentator and columnist for Navara Media. And Al spoke to us about their assessment of the state of play going into the 2023 local elections. We discussed at length the Green Party's prospects in those elections and also how badly the Tories are going to lose. Uh, lots of interesting analysis throughout that 25-minute uh, conversation I had with Elle. At 11.45, I spoke to Samuel Sweek from the Peace and Justice Project. The Peace and Justice Project, of course, is the campaign group that was set up by Jeremy Corbyn. They've launched a new campaign called Music for the Many, which is um, seeking to protect and defend live music venues across the country that are under threat. Uh, I spoke to Samuel at 11.45, so you can go back and find that uh, for a conversation about why we need to protect live music venues, why they're so important and how you can get involved. At 12.30, I spoke to Gwen Gwynville, who is the new CEO of Yes Cymru, one of the organisations that is campaigning for Welsh independence. We discussed the current uh, public levels of public support for Welsh independence, why that's different to levels of support for Scottish independence, Yes Cymru's plans to campaign for Welsh independence, why independence is so important and much much more besides at 12.30 you can look back in the video and find that. I then spoke to Martin Butcher who is a Green Party councillor and the former author of NATO Monitor. We had a really interesting discussion, at least, at least I think it was interesting, uh, about the Green Party's new policies on NATO. So at the Green Party Spring Conference, they shifted their policy. So no longer is the party in favour of immediate withdrawal from that military alliance. Instead, the party is now calling for reform of NATO, including a commitment to a no nuclear first strikes policy, a commitment to upholding human rights in all of NATO's operations, and a commitment to uh, acting only in defence of NATO member states. Martin has a, a particular criticism of that policy. So you can find that interview at 
Uh, it was 1.15 p.m. So if you look back about an hour and a half in the video, you'll find that. And then at 2.15, I spoke to Maisha Begum, who is uh, from Oso oh Ethical and the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective. We talked about the 10th anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse, the disaster uh, that happened in Bangladesh that led to the deaths of over a thousand workers. We discussed whether the um, there's been changes in the garment industry since that building collapse, uh, whether the uh, garment industry may, remains unsafe and um, damaging for workers and others involved. And we discussed uh, how people can uh, get involved in the solidarity campaign with garment workers as well. That was about half an hour ago, so you can catch that as well. Before I introduce our next guest who'll be joining soon, <clears throat> just to continue with our game of guess who. So we are looking for a prominent, significant figure on the left of politics. Uh, they may be alive, they may be dead. Well, we know they're dead because of the second clue, uh, but we are looking for a mystery person on the left of politics. I've given you two clues so far. I'm gonna give you a third one now. The mystery person was born in Caracas. The mystery person died of tuberculosis. And the mystery person is referred to as the liberator of America. Who is that mystery person we are looking for? Get your guesses in the chat. And of course, whilst you're in the chat, get your questions lined up for the next set of our guests. Katie Montgomery, Alex Powell and Danielle Bett. Uh, I would love to get put as many questions uh, that I, as I can to them. So do get them in the chat when you can. In the meantime, please do hit like, share and subscribe and uh, make sure that you share the show link. Uh, apologies, I've just seen a comment in the chat that uh, someone said that Maisha's volume was super low. I'm very, very sorry for that. What we can do is we will edit when we uh, upload that interview as a standalone video. I'll edit the audio so that it is equalised between me and her and so that you don't have to fiddle around with changing your volume if you want to watch that interview back. But apologies for the audio issues that people experienced there. Um, just checking the socials, see if there's any comments on the socials. Uh, please do get your comments, questions, etc. on the hashtag Bright Green Live as well as in the chat. Um, so on Mastodon, a rare mastered on message uh rb says that uh today is a battle between bright green live and british sunshine they feel conflicted but they opted for supporting bright green i fully endorse that uh you can we'll be finished the sun will still be out you can get your vitamin d hit when we are done don't you worry so you're watching Bright Green Live. This is episode six, which of course means that there were five previous episodes. If you're not a regular viewer and this is your first time watching, you can go back at any time and watch the previous episodes in the uh, catalogue of shows that we've put out so far. We have had some absolutely incredible, amazing, inspiring, exciting, interesting guests throughout those previous episodes. And you can catch the whole episodes or indeed individual clips of the interviews within them. The guests we've had on previous shows have included Mark Sawatka, who's the General Secretary of the PCS Union. That's the union that represents civil servants. I spoke to Mark about the ongoing uh, trade union, the ongoing industrial disputes that are happening within the civil service and the, um, the strike and industrial action that his union, the PCS, have been involved with. Um, really interesting. Uh, he's always got interesting insights on the trade union movement. He's been a General Secretary for over 20 years. And uh, obviously those disputes are still ongoing. I've spoken to Maggie Chapman, uh, who is a Scottish Green Party MSP. We discussed the, um, her campaign to get free transport home for late night hospitality workers and the work she's doing to get that legislated for in the Scottish Parliament. I've interviewed Natalie Bennett, the Green Party member of the House of Lords, where we discussed uh, the role of the House of Lords in the British Constitution and the role of the Green Party within the House of Lords. I've spoken to uh, Chris Saltmarsh from Labour for a Green New Deal about the, the Labour Party's policies on climate and whether they are sufficient. Spoilers, Chris did not think they were sufficient, uh, but you can go back and watch that as well. I interviewed Michael Chesham, who is the author of a book on the history of the British left from the student movement through to the fall of Jeremy Corbyn. He has really interesting views on that period and also left strategy going forward. 
I have spoken to um, trade unionists from Myanmar. I've spoken to elected Green Party politicians, Labour Party politicians, and much, much more besides. You can catch all of those uh, previous episodes and the interviews within them on our YouTube channel. Head to our YouTube channel and you can watch them at your leisure. Uh, but please do pop back before our next interview, which will be with the legendary Katie Montgomery, who will be on at 3 p.m. So one of the things that I've been talking about throughout the show, and apologies if you've heard this before, is the upcoming local elections. And this year in the local elections, the Green Party will be defending an unprecedented number of seats. In 2019, the last time these seats were up for elections, the Green Party gained almost 200 seats, meaning that it doubled its representation in local government in a single night. Now this year, in 2023, the Green Party will be defending all of those seats. That's over 200 more than it's ever defended before, and it's hoping to gain an additional 100 or more seats as well. At Bright Green, we're going to be covering those local elections in depth on our website, bright-green.org. We're going to bring you, bring you in-depth analysis of all of the places the Green Party could win a significant number of seats, starting with an article we published last week on elections in Herefordshire. Now, in Herefordshire, the Green Party already has seven councillors, but having spoken to some of the people involved with the local campaign, the Greens think they could win as many as 16 seats this time around. That would be huge. The Greens are in joint administration in Herefordshire right now with some independents. This would solidify the position of the Greens in that administration. And also it has really interesting ramifications for wider politics as well. The reason for that is that the Green Party are currently targeting as one of its number one targets uh, the North Herefordshire constituency. That's where Ellie Charles, the former MEP for the West Midlands, and a, can and a cabinet member in Herefordshire is standing as the Green Party candidate. At the Green Party Spring Conference, Ellie Charles spoke very strongly that uh, the Greens could have the opportunity to take a seat from the Tories in North Herefordshire. The Greens could gain massive momentum in this year's local elections for that general election campaign if they win as many seats as they're hoping for, and they seem pretty confident. There are other councils that could be significant too. The obvious one is Mid Suffolk, where in the last local elections, the Green won 12, won 12 seats. That means that they only need six more seats this time around to win a majority. That would be the first time ever in history the Greens have won a majority on a council. Absolutely historic. Now, it's not a given, it's not a done deal, but it looks like it's heading in the direction of the Greens at least becoming the largest party and possibly also becoming the majority. If they have a majority, that means it'll be the first place ever that takes place. But it's really important in terms of the Greens' ability to govern, because, of course, if a, local, if a party has a minority administration, it means they rely on other parties to get their budget through, get key policies through. But if they get a majority, they're only reliant on their own votes. So that could be really interesting and significant. Other places that I think are worth looking at are Lancaster, where the Greens currently have 15 seats and are looking, if you speak to local activists there on the ground, at winning something in the region of 20 seats. Now, the Greens currently lead Lancaster Council. They won a significant number of seats at the last local elections, but they've since grown by defections and by-election victories. And it's those by-election victories that I think are really interesting to look at going into this set of elections, because the Greens have been winning more seats. They are the only party with momentum in Lancaster. and indeed. Not only have they been winning by-elections, but they've been coming very close in ones in seats they didn't win as well. Greens were, I think, the only party to stand a full slate of candidates across every seat in Lancaster this year, which is hugely significant because last time they only stood in about half the seats. So in Lancaster, we could see the Greens going into these elections as the leading partner in the administration and coming out the other end still in administration in a strengthened position too. Brighton Hove, as always, is interesting. The Greens are currently administration there as well. They're a minority administration and unique in governing Brighton Hove as the sole party in administration. If they go into these elections in administration, come out the end of the end, still in administration, it'd be the first time in history that anyone, any part, Green Party has done so in a local council where they've been in sole administration. The last time it was tried was in 2015, where after four years of the Green administration in Brighton Hove, the Greens lost seats. They're hoping for very much the opposite to happen this time around. So please do keep an eye on Brighton Hove. And East Hertfordshire is another place that's very interesting too, where the Greens currently, I think, have two seats and are looking to potentially make double-digit gains. 
We'll be providing analysis of all of these councils and more where the Greens could win big on our website, bright-green.org. And tomorrow we'll be publishing another one of those pieces with the analysis of the Lancaster election results. So please do keep your eyes peeled for that more in-depth assessment about what's going on in Lancaster. We'll also be looking at some of the places like, for example, Lewis, Norwich and others as well. And on election night itself, we'll be running our annual election night live blog, bringing you news and analysis of the election results as they come in. At 3am in the morning, it's going to be a late one, we'll be doing a live stream on our YouTube channel where we'll be looking at the results in a little bit more depth, hopefully interviewing some interesting and significant people uh, where we will delve into those results a little deeper and we'll be doing a 6pm on the Friday following following day uh, stream as well. So the best way to keep uh, those in your diary is to hit subscribe, it means that when we go live you'll get a little notification and you won't miss out on those. So that's all still to come in Bright Green's local election coverage. And if you're interested in the prospects for the Green Party in the local elections, you can always go back in this video and find the interview I did with Al Folan from Stats for Lefties at the start of the show, where we discussed the Greens prospects and we delved into some of those uh, councils in particular as well. So uh, I spoke to Al at 11 a.m., which feels like a year ago now. Uh, but I spoke to them at 11 a.m. today. So if you go back five hours in the stream, five hours, is it five hours? No, four hours in the stream, you'll be able to find that interview with Al where we discuss all that and more. If you haven't already, please do hit like and subscribe. We're aiming to get to 570 subscribers by the end of the show. We're on 560, we're nearly there. We're aiming to get to 50 likes on the video by the end of the show too. So if you haven't already, make sure you do both those things. It helps Bright Green out massively. It means the video will appear in more people's feeds. And of course, it means you won't miss out on what we do. And of course, it doesn't cost you a penny. So there's no reason for you not to. So please, please, please do that. In the meantime, just to give you the final rundown of what we've got left for the show before I introduce our next guest. So up next, we will have Katie Montgomery, who is a YouTuber and an activist. You may know uh, they are very prominent on Twitter and on YouTube and on other platforms as well. And uh, I'll be speaking to her about uh, the new guidance that's been issued on the e from the EHRC, the Equality and Human Rights Commission on the Equality Act. The reason I'm going to be speaking about that is because that guidance has been extremely controversial. It's faced widespread criticism from LGBT groups, including Stonewall and others, because of the implications and ramifications it could have for trans people and trans rights. Kate will be joining me in about five minutes time to talk about those ramifications and implications. Following that, at 4pm, I'll be joined by Alex Powell, who is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brooks University. He's an expert in migration, asylum and refugee law, and we'll be discussing the government's anti-migrant anti -migrant legislation, including uh, the latest uh, of that, which is the Illegal Migration Bill. We'll be discussing uh, the impact that could have on LGBT asylum seekers and refugees uh, in part of a wider series of interviews we've been doing on that legislation, including in previous episodes with um, Benali Hamdash, who's the Green Party's migration spokesperson, and with Anna Oppenheim, who is a campaigner with Labour for Free Movement, uh, Labour Campaign for Free Movement, I think. And finally, closing the show, I'll be joined by Danielle Bett, who's the Director of Communications at Yakad, uh, which is an organisation which campaigns for a two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict uh, and uh, seeks to um, campaign within the Jewish community in Britain to get an end to the occupation of Palestine. And we'll be talking about the much um, discussed and uh, maligned uh, judicial reforms that Benjamin Netanyahu and the Israeli government have trying to, been trying to introduce. And the crucially, we'll be talking about the uh, protest movement that's uh, popped up in response and resistance to that. We'll then be talking about what the impact those protests and those reforms are having on attitudes towards the Israeli government, crucially in Israel itself, but also amongst the Jewish diaspora more generally. So that's what we still got to come on the show. Please do stay tuned uh, for the last couple of hours for our amazing remaining guests. Thank you so much for those of you who are trickling in and joining us just now. You are watching episode six of Bright Green Live. Thank you to 
Max Morris, uh, who has put a question on Twitter for our interview with Katie Montgomery. I'll do my best to get them to uh, get that question to Katie. Thanks for the question. Of course, please do get questions lined up in the chat for our guests. Uh, the more questions we have, the better. And the earlier you get your questions in the chat, the more likely it is that I'll be able to put those questions to our guests. So anything you want to ask Katie, please do get it in the chat ASAP. Uh, it means that I'm more likely to be able to put it to her. Uh, and uh, you get your questions answered. So uh, yeah, get them in the chat, get them on Twitter, get them on wherever, as long as I can see them. Don't just like write them on your wall. Obviously, I can't see your wall. Uh, so anywhere <laughs> where I might be able to see it, i.e. on Twitter or indeed on the YouTube channel. And before I get going with the next interview, I just wanted to give you a reminder, we are playing a game of Guess Who, where I'm looking for a significant figure on the left. I'm giving a series of clues which become increasingly easy as we go. As to who this mystery person is, you've had three clues so far. The first clue was that the mystery person was born in Caracas. The second, question, uh, second clue, sorry, was that the mystery person died of tuberculosis. And the third clue was that the mystery person is referred to as the liberator of America. Uh, so guesses in the chat for who that mystery person who's a significant and prominent figure on the left might be. Uh, and I want when I get back from this next interview to see a sea of guesses um, on who that might be. Uh, so please do get them in the chat and uh, I'll tell you if you're right or wrong uh, and you'll get a nice warm fuzzy feeling if you were indeed right. So I can see that Katie has just joined the call. So I'm going to let her in now. And as Katie joins the call, I'll just do a brief introduction so that you all know who you are about to hear from. Although I'm sure that Katie absolutely needs no introduction given that we are on YouTube. Uh, but Katie Montgomery is a YouTuber and an activist. And today we're going to be talking about the EHRC's letter to the government on the Equality Act, which has obviously been deeply controversial and faced widespread criticism by LGBT groups. Before we delve into any of that, though, thank you so much for joining us today, Katie. How are you doing? Um, yeah, I'm okay. I've, uh, I went to a wedding yesterday, so a little bit tired from that, but it was a good time. So other than, of course, good. stressing about this EHRC thing, which is ruining my life. But other than that... <laughs> Other than that, yes, <laughs> that's less good than the wedding. Well, I'm glad the wedding was good. Um, hope you've recovered okay. Um, so some of our viewers might not be aware of what this, what we're talking about here, what the EHRC's new guidance is on the Equality Act. Could you talk us through what their letter to the Equalities Minister, Kenny Badenock, said? Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know how much background people need to know, but there's a thing in the UK called the Equality Act 2010, um, and it basically is the thing that grants people in this country their human rights, and it covers everything from uh, women's rights to LGBT rights and disabled rights and, and all kinds of things. Um, and the EHRC is the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission, and originally their purpose was to progress human rights in the UK and be an independent body from the government, but to be like the official human rights organization of the UK. Um, and that's what they were doing until three years ago or, or some, sometime around then. And uh, then the government uh, basically replaced all of the people in charge. And now it's kind of, in my opinion, um, just a vessel for the conservatives. Um, but so what they have done is they have proposed that the Equality Act 2010 be amended. So changed, changing the law. Um, and the how they're trying to they're trying to say it as if oh it's just a small change we just want to change one word we just want to change the word sex to biological sex and that's all um and it's just good for women and and the thing is this it's a little sort of sleight of hand and it has a lot bigger comp um like uh complications and, and consequences than you might think so they have actually listed in the letter the things that they're intending for it to change. And in my opinion, and the opinion of lots of lawyers, they're actually wrong on what they think it's going to do, but also you can see what they're trying to do, and it will still do, still do a lot of bad things. And so basically, um, you have illegal sex, um, and the, you can change that. Uh, you can change that with the Gender Recognition Act 2004, and they kind of want to just get rid of that. 
by the back door by basically saying, well, it doesn't matter what you change your legal sex to, because for the purposes of human rights legislation, your sex is just the same as your birth sex. And they want to say biological sex, but perhaps we can get into that later, but that's a whole um, sort of can of worms because that's uh, doesn't quite work the same as legal sex anyway. Uh, and, and certainly doesn't always match up with what someone's recorded birth sex is. And there's all kinds of confusions, but basically what this would mean, and they do list this out in the letter is that, um, or, the, or what they want it to mean is that any business or public space or public institution could just choose to ban women like me, trans women, from women's toilets, women's changing rooms, everything to um, rape shelters and prisons and stuff. Um, and to be clear, that is a massive change. At least it's a massive change for trans people. It's not going to affect cis people, which is anyone who isn't trans at all. Um, but banning me from the toilet, I mean, I've been using the women's toilet at work for, you know, nearly a decade now. Um, this is just, it's its my normal everyday life. It's the same as everyone else. Um, and, and making it so that would then be illegal for, or potentially depending on which, you know, I'd have to ring ahead every single pub and every single shop I ever want to go in to see if they will serve me, like, you know, accept my kind in there or not. Um, but also they've listed out that it would change human rights legislation. So, I mean, I've I've been lucky in my life to uh, never had an incident of sexism at my workplace, um, which is something the Equality Act would cover. But they basically would, are saying that I would no longer count as a woman for that, so would not be protected from sexism in my, in my workplace. And they even list out the gender pay gap and say, oh, well, yeah, trans women will no longer be covered for gender pay gap regulation. And like, to be clear, trans women's pay gap is even bigger. Like the gap between cis men and cis women is already awful, and trans women's is even bigger. Um, so this is very straightforwardly uh, a huge attack on particularly trans women's rights, but also trans men's rights, um, and and all trans people in the country. And it, I mean, I d I don't want to fear monger, and also I don't want to seem like I'm being hyperbolic, but it really isn't. If they bring in a law where people are allowed to just ban me from public spaces effectively you know if you can't go to the toilet if you can't try clothes on if you can't you know it's just completely unreasonable and like how are people like me to participate in public society at all so i don't know how good a summary that was but hopefully i didn't go into too much detail <laughs> it's incredibly helpful but obviously also incredibly bleak um so i guess there's you touched on a lot of things there, and I think one of the things that I wanted to, to unpick a little bit is, I guess, there's there's two sides of this, this really, isn't there? There's the one side, which is the uh, the direct impact this could have on trans people if the guidance is implemented. And then there's the wider kind of um, context that it creates around trans yeah. people and trans rights in, in the UK. Um, what do you think the impact of this is going to be, both in terms of, like, A, literally you've got the supposed equalities watchdog, uh, being sort of actively transphobic uh, in terms of what the impact that is generally, even if this guidance never formally gets adopted, and then B, it could have on trans people. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess there's so many different impacts, but like the EHRC used to be, uh, in my opinion, fairly credible organisation, which would push for the advancement of people's human rights. And now we're in a situation where it's just like, openly campaigning to remove trans people's rights and it done a 180 degree uh, change on this like they supported reforming the gender recognition act for years and then they got in the new people in charge and then they were writing to the government opposing reforming the gender recognition act with no i mean no justification for that change at all no explanation as to why it'd be bad um so that i mean at least for trans people was just said this organization is now of no value to us it's completely you know, meaningless, that they're, they're not credible, they don't deserve respect for, for their single purpose. But it's not just trans people are saying this, like we saw um, major LGBT organisations who focus particularly on gay rights, pulling out of having any association with them, because, you know, but, but LGBT rights are all very interlinked. And it's the why we're sort of a political group is because homophobia and transphobia overlap so often and we often need similar things it's often attacks on our bodily autonomy our ability to you know adopt and have family um, and all of these things which affect all lgbt people similarly so it says are oh, this you know this group isn't trustworthy at all 
Um, and I know that other, you know, minority rec struggles have already been complaining about the EHRC previously, and it just kind of adds more fuel to the fire of saying, well, you know, uh, is this just going to become a vessel for removing people's human rights? It, who, who can trust this? Even groups completely unrelated to LGBT rights. Um, so that's, I guess that's a, a, a thing for the EHRC in general. Um, but did you mean me more like what it's how it's going to affect trans people sort of in a more, um, I guess the morale of trans people as like as a community, right? Yeah, because that, you know, when the EHRC started hiring lawyers that we knew were gender critical and they would just do these little announcements every now and then, oh, we're getting this new person on board. And then you look at their history and, you know, they voted against gay marriage or they've, you know, been campaigning against abortion or they've been following every single transphobic loser on Twitter or something. And it just says, oh, this is bad. Like we saw this coming, you know, years years ago when they started doing all these reshuffles. And every single time something like this happens, you some new transphobic person gets a really big position of power, or they start um they had some scandal where someone leaked that they've been meeting with a load of hate groups. Um it it scares. It's it's scary anyway, even if they hadn't have written the, this letter or even if this all falls apart, it just shows how much political power they have. And it is absolutely relentless uh, being a trans person in the UK at the moment. Like the the whole British media, left to right, uh, constantly just pumps out the most nonsense articles about trans people. Um, you know, sometimes entirely fabricated. Uh, there's no no one kind of arguing for the trans rights case. The only pro trans stories you ever get are you know like biographies of someone coming out and having a happy time, and then. To counter it, to balance it, they'll put someone saying, well, we need to remove all trans rights. Otherwise, a mystery thing that I'm just going to gesture towards um, what might happen. But it's it's kind of, you know, the highest levels of government. It was also really terrifying, for example, when the UK government decided to overrule the Scottish government's uh, vote to um reform the Gender Recognition Act, because it said, you know, all the way up to the top, like Rishi Sunak commented on it like literally the person in charge of the entire country is prepared to use unprecedented legal measures to stop the most minor slight improvement in trans people's lives it just says well what's coming next you know what what are they going to do even if this fails what's the next thing they're going to try and it's you know this our community feels very embattled i you know talking to i, I talk to hundreds of trans people every single day um and people have just been messaging me saying, like, getting out the country, I can't take this anymore. Um, you know, fearing for their futures, fearing for the, what's going to happen with our healthcare, as attacks on our rights are always seem to be really interlinked with attacks on our healthcare. You know, pe people are terrified. I'm, I'm terrified. It, it is. You know, after reading that letter, I was kind of in like fight or flight, high adrenaline mode for like 24 hours at least, feeling really ill. But now I just feel so anxious from. You know, like, am I going to have human rights this time next year? I, I don't know. And that is so, it's really hard to ex explain because obviously you can imagine being worried about the future, but it's, I mean, this, like the meaning of the word oppression, it's oppressive. It's, it's just something you cannot stop thinking about because it's, you know, they're saying, oh yeah, well, maybe you won't be allowed to go to the toilet at work anymore. I don't, I, I don't know. I'm kind of reiterating, but it's just so intense this kind of fear and I, I i'm not absolutely not the only person feeling it i mean yeah i think you you put it pretty, pretty powerfully there in terms of the i guess the, the, the wider context this sits within right of like you know it's been at least half a decade a little bit longer than that where any time that the government wants to distract from anything they're doing they'll have a bash on trans people anytime that the media wants to distract they'll they'll have a bash on trans people and the the way that you know trans people are somehow become the kind of bogeyman de jour um for a tiny minority of the population who uh, you know had uh decades centuries of oppression uh it's yeah like horrendous and the way that you talked about the, the kind of direct impact it has on people individually i think is really powerful I've got a question that's come in from Twitter um, mm -hmm. from Max Morris, who's, um, I guess, asking about this in relation to previous anti-LGBT campaigns and legislation we've seen. So Max asks, um, how do we prevent the 
or reverse the kind of longer term impact of transphobia. So, for example, we've seen changes to law and policy for following moral panics in the past. So you had Section 28, uh, which obviously had a long tail far beyond the period in which that existed. So how do we how do we how do we build power to prevent and reverse the long term impacts of not just this this latest example, but the wider context of attacks on on trans people and LGBT people more broadly? Yeah, I mean, I guess what gives me hope on this is focusing on the super long term first. I mean, the gay panic, um, which saw, you know, at one point, something like only 10% of the UK population thinking that being gay was acceptable, um, all the way to where we are now, where we, although things maybe are starting to slide back, we um, have gay marriage and people can be gay openly and be on TV and stuff. And that happened in a single generation. I mean, it took decades and we still have progress to go, but people, even, even with section 28, even with, you know, making, um, gay marriage illegal and all these things, the public still just learned about gay people and they're, they're, even with the media attacks, they couldn't like you can you can sell prejudice to people. It's quite easy to do it, and if you you can throw all these horrible articles at people day after day after day. But then if you just meet a gay person, you're like, oh, it's all rubbish. Like gay people are normal, and trans people are kind of going through that at the moment. Like we're visible for the first time in you know sort of modern history, and that means there's loads of people ready to sell prejudice to people, and people buy into it. But it was also going to be they'll see a trans person on the TV and they'll be like, oh, my favorite show has a trans person in. Or, oh, you know, there's a trans person at my school who's a, the mother of one of the children there or something, and she's normal. And then hopefully, I mean, I, I feel like this is how sort of civil rights struggles go. After a while, the panic dies down because people realize that we're just the same as everyone else, um, which means I'm hoping... <laughs> In my lifetime, the trans panic will be over and we probably won't ever have in my lifetime full legal equality and, um, you know, free from prejudice and and stuff. But the horror will go down and we might be back to slow progress like we were having for the decades before. But in the kind of medium term, I mean, one of particularly of, of for the UK is we have this very far right government and I think a government change hopefully will make some difference. Um, I know that not all of the alternatives for the current government are the best <laughs> for trans people or in general. Um, I, but I also, I don't really want to put too much of my hope on a new government because it really is possible that the Conservatives will win again. And um, even with a government change, it's going to depend on people... Uh, you know, being replaced and on all of the, they've, the Conservatives have been in power for 12 years and they've done so much sort of institutional damage, destroying organisations like the EHRC, for example. It's not something you can just fix in six months. It's going to take years and years to rebuild. Um, so that is kind of worrying. But at the same time, I mean, I think that... Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, in the medium term... I don't know. <laughs> I don't have that much hope, to be honest. It is kind of bad. But in, in the short term, I think the most important things to do are to like build a community with within trans people and, and people who know and, and love trans people and stuff, our families, and just make sure that we're there for each other and turn up to protests and write to your MPs and let them know that if they try and do this, that you're going to make their life hell you know you're going to ring every single day and tell them to fuck off oh sorry i don't know if i can swear um and um and and that kind of thing and also um sort of make plans even if they were to bring in this horrific legislation that doesn't mean that every single business and every single um you know public place will ban trans people from going there some will, and it'll be horrific, and our lives will be worse for ages because they're not good. I mean, Section 28 took like 20 years to repeal. So this could, who knows how long this could take. Um, but that means that we will be able to have LGBT pubs and, um, you know, workplaces and stuff like we did previously before we had any rights, which are spaces for us. I don't know, that kind of sounds quite depressing. I'm I'm hoping 
that the LGBT community can come together on this and, and our allies and, and people who have any kind of morals or <laughs> conscious at all might turn up to some protests to make it clear that the government, it, it would be a massive hassle to even attempt this in the time they have left. Um, and then we'll battle off this attack and then we'll just have to do the same thing for the next one. I don't know. I'm not feeling super positive. <laughs> so I think a lot of people also aren't feeling super positive right now. But I guess one of the things that you you mentioned there was the government and a potential change of government. And one of the things we've had a lot of questions come in on is um, the response to the HRC letter and also the the I guess the, the wider kind of moral panic and culture wars around trans rights uh, recently and the the response of other political parties, particularly those on the centre left uh, and the left, uh, to uh, the HRC letter and elsewhere. What's your, I guess, reflection on how the other parties have responded um, so far? So I think, um, I guess if I was being optimistic, I would say that, I mean, the response from the Labour uh, Party has appeared at least at first glance is terrible um they've pretty much just said yeah cool bring it on let's see what happens um which as a trans person especially someone who doesn't understand big politics and you know this maneuvering they have to do um it really just looks like they're abandoning abandoning us and so many people have just said that's it i'm done with the labor party now because they've done nothing i know that um the lib dems and the greens have said something positive but then also both all parties have their own sort of little transphobia wing, which uh, is horrible um, and seemed very committed to pushing this forward. So, um, but I do think that there's some um, justification for the argument that, I mean, the whole point of this, the, the conservatives don't care about trans people. I mean, some people are chronically obsessed with trans people and cannot talk about anything else and want to ruin our lives and that's it. But most people, Rishi Sunak does not care about trans people. He doesn't care if I live or die at all. He just wants to win another election. And they're gambling on on this and on culture war, you know, which is basically a tax on human rights, it's, you know, code for. Um, he's hoping that if they deport enough people to Rwanda and ban enough trans people from the toilets, then maybe people might vote for them. But it also re it relies on this kind of like um, British gutter press kind of fear mongering nonsense. And that's fed by the Labour Party arguing back. So I, the, I'm hoping this is the plan, though I don't know how much faith I have it in. But if someone like Kirstama or any of the other leaders of any of the other parties just says, OK, Rishi Sunak wants to ruin the life of trans people and immigrants, but I want to fix the country and I want to make it so your child can eat lunch at school and so that you can buy petrol and so that inflation isn't 20% or whatever ridiculous number it might get up to. And hopefully people will say, you know, even some people might be like, oh, well, I don't understand trans people. I'm kind of scared of them. But I kind of like the sound of the country being good rather than just wasting all our time attacking trans people. Um, so I don't know. As much as I would like to see uh political parties saying this is going to ruin the lives of trans people and therefore we are opposed to it i can also see that the conservative government wants to bait the other parties into you know a, an argument a pointless argument and if if we were being if we were able to argue on our on equal terms even if we just had an equal landscape you know if we had like trans politicians and um some media outlets that even were just neutral on trans people, then we would have things where they'd, they would say, this is going to ruin the lives of trans people and it isn't going to affect cis women. It's not gonna change their lives at all. And that's a fact, like th there isn't some kind of, oh, you know, you're just saying it, that is just factually true. Um, then people might understand that. But the problem is, is because of the media and the conservative party just have such a total dominance on this. Um, it means that they can say, oh, we just care about women. And everyone's like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I care about women. Do what you want. So I don't know. <laughs> Incredibly helpful, if bleak. Um, before I let you go, I just wanted to read out some of the comments we've got in the chat to you because they're lovely. Uh, so Meg said, solidarity with Katie and all trans people. Steve C said that um, Katie's interview is making them quite emotional um, and all LGBT. 
people need to stand with the tea. And Max said, thank you for answering uh, their question and uh, that at least we can be slightly more hopeful about the long term, despite a bleak short to medium term and finishes by saying, see you at the protests. Um, so lots of support for everything you said, but um, I'll let you get on and enjoy the rest of your Easter Sunday. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. And everyone, please write to your MP. Thanks so much, Katie. Bye. So that was Katie Montgomery, the YouTuber and activist. And um, I'd love to hear more thoughts and comments in the chat about what you thought of that conversation. Uh, I always find Katie a really insightful, um, really insightful voice on these issues, and really boils it down to you know the 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 the, the truth, the truth and the reality of the situation we're facing when it comes to the fact that we have a government, we have a media, we have major opposition parties that are actively hostile to trans people and trans rights and the the deep and damaging um, impact that's having on trans people in this country um, and the the importance that there is for us to all stand shoulder to shoulder with our trans siblings. So uh, I hope you agree. I hope you enjoyed that conversation um, and uh, found it valuable because I certainly did. Um, so coming up in the rest of the show, we're going to be uh, talking more about LGBT issues very, very soon. So I'm going to be speaking to Alex Powell, who is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University about the government's new um, well, the, the raft of anti-migrant legislation that the government has been introducing and its impact on LGBT uh, refugees and asylum seekers. I'll then be at the end of the show speaking to Danielle Betts from Yakad about the uh, protests that have been taking place in Israel against the government's, uh, the Israeli government and Benjamin Netanyahu's planned reforms to the judiciary and the um, the impact those protests are having on attitudes towards the Israeli government, both in Israel and in the wider Jewish diaspora. So those two interviews are still to come. Please stay tuned. Got another two, two and a bit hours left of the show. So please do keep watching uh, throughout the rest of the show because um, the guests are amazing and everyone deserves to hear from them. Um, so in the meantime, um, we have throughout the day been playing a game of Guess Who, where I've been giving you clues to a significant figure on the left of uh, British, not British politics, politics in general, and uh, you've got to guess who they are. So I've given you a series of clues so far for our second Guess Who mystery person. First clue was the mystery person was born in Caracas. The second is that the mystery person died of tuberculosis. The third is that the mystery person is referred to as the liberator of America. And the fourth is that the mystery person was a contemporary of Haitian revolutionary Alexandra Petion. Uh, so who is that mystery person? Get your guesses in the chat. Welcome to people who are just joining. Uh, I can see that Katie's just retweeted the stream. So there's going to be a flurry of people who are joining just now. If you wanted to catch the interview with Katie, uh, rewind about 25 minutes and you'll be able to find it there. Um, fascinating interview as uh, everything, every interaction with Katie is. Um, so please do do that. If you're new to the stream, please do hit subscribe and like and share the stream as well. Um, I'm going to take a very, very brief break um, to catch my breath because I've been talking a lot. Uh, in the meantime, please do get your guesses for our mystery person in the chat and also get some questions lined up for our two remaining guests on the show, Alex Powell and Danielle Bett, who are still to come in the closing two hours of the show. Questions in the chat for them. I'll try and put as many of them to uh, uh, as many of them to them as possible. I still can't say that sentence. Please do get them in the chat uh, or on Twitter on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Uh, we'll be back in about five minutes' time. Uh, I'll see you all very, very shortly.
Hello, hello, hello. We are back. You are currently watching episode six of Bright Green Live. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're just tuning in, make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you hit subscribe. And throughout the rest of the show, we have two amazing guests still to come. We have uh, Alex Powell, who is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. He's going to be speaking about the government's anti-migrant legislation and the impact that it's had on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. And following that, I'll be joined by Danielle Bett, who is a is the Director of Communications at Yakad. Uh, we'll be speaking about Benjamin, Yet Benjamin Net in Yahoo's um, judicial reforms and the impact that uh, the, 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 the protests that have popped up as a result of that and the impact that those uh, reforms, those protests uh, are having on attitudes towards the Israeli government, both in Israel and within the wider Jewish diaspora outside of Israel. Uh, those interviews are still coming up later on. If you want to ask questions to either of those two guests, please do pop them in the chat. Um, we've got plenty of uh, time to get questions in and the earlier you get your questions in, the more likely it is that I'll be able to put them to them. If you're just tuning in and watching, we've had uh, seven amazing guests thus far on the show, um, including, uh, well, amazing people from across uh, Green parties, from across social movements, campaign groups and others. We started off the show at 10.15 with Sean Barry, who is the former co-leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. She's also a London Assembly member and has um, for the uh, last seven years been on the London Assembly. And we spoke about the impact that the Greens have had on the London Assembly and on London in the 23 years that the Greens have had seats there. We also spoke a little bit about the 2024 London Assembly and London mayoral. London mayoral election campaign and what the Green Party will be prioritising in that. At 11 o'clock, I spoke to Al Folan from Stats for Lefties. We discussed the local elections that are coming up in May this year and the prospects of the Greens um, winning seats in those elections. You can rewind the video and watch any of those interviews, as well as at 11.45, the interview with Samuel Sweek, who is from the Peace and Justice Project. That's the organisation that was set up by Jeremy Corbyn and uh, the organisation that has um, run, been launched a new campaign on called Music for the Many on protecting and saving music venues across the country. At 12.30, I was joined by Gwen Gwynville, who is uh, the CEO of Yes Cymru, one of the organisations that campaigns for Welsh independence. Uh, as part of the conversation with Gwen, I uh, asked him why support for Welsh independence is lower than support for Scottish independence. Uh, I asked him about the, the reasons why Yes Cymru are campaigning for Welsh independence and what they are currently prioritising in that campaign and um, much, much more beside. That was at 12.30. So if you rewind half an hour, uh, three hours, sorry, not half an hour, three hours in the show, you'll find the interview with Gwen. I'm at that point of the day where I've been sat in front of this camera for so long that my words just sort of blend into one and each other, one and, one and each other, one and other, I intended to say, and start to be less coherent. So apologies uh, for that. Um, at 1.15, I spoke to Martin Butcher, who's a Green Party councillor and also the former author of the NATO Monitor blog. We discussed the Green Party's new policy on NATO, uh, what his criticisms of that policy are, and much, much more besides about NATO and that military alliance and how it operates. At 2.15, I spoke to Maisha Begum from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective about the uh, that building uh, collapse that took place 10 years ago. 10th anniversary of the um, building collapse was this year. And we spoke about the impact that uh, collapse uh, has had, uh, the, the, the collapse that led to a thousand workers losing their lives. We spoke about the garment industry more generally and whether any um, long term reforms and changes have happened to the sector and much, much more, including the plans the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective have to commemorate that anniversary. Uh, and then at 3 p.m., about half an hour ago, I spoke to Katie Montgomery, the YouTuber and activist, about the EHRC's new guidance on the Equality Act and the ramifications that potentially has for trans rights and trans people. We also talked about the wider context of transphobia in the UK and the horrendous moral panic that's being whipped up originally just by the right and by the Tories, but sadly now also by some who claim to be on the left as well, including most of the mainstream media, including groups within a number of political parties and so on. If you rewind about half an hour, you can catch that interview with Katie. Um, Katie obviously is a household name on YouTube and um, she had a lot of 
a lot of things to say about the the current context it was a, a deeply moving interview it was um you know she had some really important things to say about the current state of affairs when it comes to transphobia in this country uh, so i'd really recommend rewinding at your leisure and watching that interview as well I want to give a special shout out to some of our regular viewers who've been with us throughout most of the show so far, or indeed who've been with us since the very beginning of Bright Green Live. So Bright Green Live launched six months ago, and there's been some people who've been in the chat on every single episode, getting questions in, getting comments, responses to our interviews. I want to give a special shout out to Ben Samuel, who joined the stream at 10 a.m. this morning and has been with us most of the day since. And indeed was one of those viewers who was with us on the very first episode and has been here I think on every episode since. Similarly Steve C is a regular viewer always contributing good questions and comments in the chat and Meg as well uh, is has been a, a long-term supporter of the show so I want to give a special shout out to those three um, who are with us so often um, and make the show happen. I'd love to hear if there are other people who've been with us since 10am this morning as well let us know in the chat if you've been uh, watching the whole day, if you are engaged in as bizarre behaviour as I am, because you've been sitting in front of your television or laptop or phone watching this show as I've been sat here for six hours uh, talking at a screen. Um, the other thing I'd love to hear from you is any suggestions you have for future guests on uh, episodes of Bright Green Live. So. As you probably know by now, this show goes out on YouTube once a month. It goes out on the second Sunday of every month. And so the next episode is taking place on May the 14th. On that show, we already have three guests lined up. We have the uh, Scottish Green Party MSP, um, Gillian Mackey. We're going to be speaking about her work campaigning to introduce buffer zones outside of uh, medical centres that provide abortion so that... Um, people who are seeking to um, have abortions and seeking to you know access their basic reproductive rights are not confronted by violent and graphic protesters uh, we're talking about the the initiative she's got in the Scottish Parliament to try and get legislation in Scotland to prevent that from happening in the future uh, I'll also be joined by Matt Kennard who is a journalist author writer uh, who is co-written a new book called Silent Coup which is all about the role of corporations in undermining democracy across the world. I'll be speaking to him about his new book, Silent Coup. Um, I haven't yet read it all, so I can't give you anything away. It's also not been published yet. So um, when it's been published, grab a copy or watch the interview uh, with Matt to see whether you wish to read it. We'll be doing a deep dive interview with Matt. We'll probably go a bit longer than we normally go uh, to get really under the skin of all the issues in that book. Um, and we'll also be joined by someone from People and Planet. So for those of you who were watching the last episode, you may remember that we intended to have someone from People and Planet, which is the Student Activist Network, uh, which campaigns on human rights, poverty and the environment, to talk about their fossil free careers campaign. That's the campaign to get fossil fuel um, companies prevented from um, recruiting students on campuses uh, to, to end that recruitment pipeline where students attend university careers fairs and they get a big shiny store from Shell and then and so on. So we're going to talk to someone from People and Planet about that and how that campaign is going and how people can get involved. So May the 14th is the date of the next episode. If you want to make sure that you don't miss out on that episode, get in your diary, but also hit the subscribe button. Because if you hit subscribe, it means that you won't miss out on all the videos and interviews we're putting out in the future. Um, and every time we go live, you'll get a little notification and you can uh, catch the show when it comes out. Uh, so if you haven't already, hit subscribe. We had an aim of getting to 570 subscribers by the end of the show. I'm just going to hit refresh and see where we are at. We are on 561. So we've got nine to go. Just nine more people need to hit subscribe. 17 people are watching. So maybe you're one of the ones who hasn't clicked subscribe. If you haven't, do so now. We're also aiming to hit 50 likes on the video by the end of the show. The reason I ask you to hit like is because, well, firstly, it gives me a nice little dopamine hit, but secondly, it feeds the YouTube algorithm. So it means that this video will appear in more people's feeds on YouTube. And that means that more people will get to watch the interviews with our amazing guests. So if you've enjoyed the video, if you've enjoyed the interviews you've put out so far, if you think other people will like it too, then hit like. It doesn't cost you a penny, requires no effort, but it means that other people will get to see the video as well. Now, Throughout the show, we have been playing a game of Guess Who, where I've been giving you a series of clues to a mystery person who um, is a significant figure on the left. 
And I want to see your guesses in the chat as to who this mystery person is. The first clue I gave you was that the mystery person was born in Caracas. The second was that they died of tuberculosis. The third is that they are referred to as the liberator of America. And the fourth is that they were a contemporary of the Haitian revolutionary Alexandra Petion. So who is that mystery person? Get your guesses in the chat for me now, please. I've seen some guesses come through already. I want to see a few more. Please do guess away. And of course, get your questions lined up for the guests that we have still to come. You can get them in the chat or on social media, on Twitters, on the hashtag Bright Green Live. The earlier you get your questions in, the more likely I am going to be able to put them to them. So uh, please do pop your questions in the chat. I'd love to also hear uh, what people have thought of the interviews throughout the day. Let me know who your favourite guest has been so far today. Uh, anything that you've learnt, anything you found particularly interesting, engaging. Anything you've disagreed with as well, I'd love to hear that too. And also, if you have any other guests from previous shows that you have particularly, uh, particularly enjoyed, let us know about them as well. We'll be kicking off with our next interview with Alex Powell very, very shortly. Uh, he'll be discussing anti-migrant legislation in the UK and its impact on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. Now... You can see the incredibly high production values and the incredibly professional setup we've got here at Bright Green. So it may come as a surprise to you that we don't currently have the backing of billionaires or big business, nor do we want their backing because we want to remain an independent media outlet that's able to provide the content, the analysis, the interviews, the news, the coverage that you want to see about the left, about green parties, about social movements, campaign groups, culture, and so on and so on. The only way we're able to do that is because of the kind and generous support of our viewers, our readers, who are ordinary people or maybe extraordinary people just like you. Now, we ask people to set up a regular donation to Bright Green. And the reason we do that is because that's what keeps Bright Green running. It's what keeps us growing. It's what keeps more people engaging with our content. So if you enjoy the work that we do. If you think it's valuable, please do head to our website bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation. We ask people to give about five pounds a month just so that we can keep going and keep growing. So please do do that if you are able to or a one-off donation if you want. Every little helps and you'll only be helping strengthen independent media that's willing to cover the stories and the content that uh, other outlets won't and in a way that other outlets won't too from a radical left green perspective that other outlets uh, are unable to and unwilling to provide so if you are able to please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate now alongside the next episode of bright green live that i just spoke to you about which is taking place on may 14th we have two other really exciting live streams to come on in May, the voters across England will be heading to the polls to elect councillors in their local areas. They are the largest set of local elections in the cycle. So that means more seats are up for election this year than are in the in, in the year after or the year after that or the year after that. And we're going to be hosting a live stream at 3 a.m. on election night. I know that sounds absurd and it absolutely is, but I'm going to be exhausted because I'll have been working in the day and then I'll be running the bright green live blog during the evening and then going live on a live stream at 3 a.m. And what I really would love is some company. So please do join us at 3 a.m. on election night um, on Thursday, the 4th of May, I think it is. Someone will correct me in the chat if I'm wrong. On Thursday, the whatever of May uh, for that live stream. Uh, well, technically it'll be Friday, Friday the whatever of May at um, at 3 a.m. Uh, because that's how days work when you pass midnight. Uh, we'll be deep diving into the local election results. We'll be giving some analysis as to what's happened. We'll be bringing you uh, some interviews with some guests um, to talk to me about what the elections mean and where the interest, most interesting places are where the results have come in from. We'll be doing that at 3 a.m. on election night and we'll be doing a second stream at 6 p.m. the following day on the Friday. Let's delve into a little bit more detail when we have more of the results. So get that in your diary and of course hit subscribe so that you don't miss out on those um, streams when they come live. 
We'll also obviously be running uh, ongoing news coverage and analysis of those elections in advance of the elections taking place. And uh, I mentioned there we'll be doing a live blog. We run a live blog every single year, which runs down the uh, results as they come in. And of course, we provide coverage of results in a way that other outlets don't and won't. So we provide coverage which looks at the, the results for Greens. We look at results for left candidates more broadly and the state of play of politics from that perspective, rather than what the other outlets do. We're not going to treat it like a soap opera between Tories and Labour. We're going to be looking much more detailed at the um, elections and what they mean for the left and what they mean for the country. So uh, the live blog will be on our website, bright-green.org. If you head to our website now, you can subscribe to our mailing list. If you do that, we don't bombard your inbox. We don't take the piss. We send you an email once a week on a Sunday, and occasionally a few emails in between. And that gives you all the latest in Bright Green, all the articles uh, that we publish each week. But crucially, for the purposes of the live blog, we'll give you a link to the live blog when it goes live. You can catch it there. You won't miss it if you go to our website and sign up to the mailing list. And also, of course, you can follow us on all the social media channels to keep up to date as well. So Bright, <laughs> so at BrightGRN on Twitter, Facebook.com forward slash BrightGRN on Facebook at Bright Green Online on Instagram and we're on the Mastodons as well at Bright Green on the UK server, something like that, uh, if you want to find us on Mastodon too. Uh, follow us there and then you'll get all the uh, articles we put out in the run to the elections and also you'll get to see the live blog on election night too. So our next guest is going to be joining us imminently but I am absolutely shattered so I'm going to take an extra bonus break just for myself uh, I'll be back very, very shortly, but please do uh, get questions in your chat, in your chat, in the collective chat, for Alex Powell, our next guest, who is a lecturer at Oxford Books University, and we're going to be talking about uh, anti-migrant legislation and its impact on LGBT plus refugees. Catch you very, very shortly.
Hello, hello, hello. We're back. You're watching episode six of Bright Green Live. We are hurtling towards the end of the show. We just have two guests left to join us for the remainder of our time together. Our next guest is going to be Alex Powell, who is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. And we're going to be talking about the anti-migrant legislation the government has been introducing over the last decade, including the latest attack on migrants, the Illegal Migration Bill. We've obviously spoken about this at some length on this show before. We're going to be talking a little bit about it in general terms, but we're going to be delving into the specific impact on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers of the government's anti-migrant agenda. Uh, so Alex will be joining us uh, very, very shortly. I'll then closing the show be joined by Danielle Bett, who is the Director of Communications at Yakad, a organisation that campaigns for a two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict and uh, works for Jewish community to um, advocate for that position. We're going to be talking about Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, judicial reforms and the, um, the protests that have erupted in response to them and the impacts that they've been having on the government's, the attitudes towards the Israeli government, both within Israel and also um, more broadly uh, with regards to the, the wider Jewish diaspora outside of Israel as well. So that's all still to come. Please do stay tuned. If you haven't already, hit subscribe, hit like, share the show stream so we can get more people watching. We've had an amazing number of people watching throughout the day. We can still get more. If you do all those three things, like, share and subscribe, then uh, of course, more people will see the stream as well. Um, interestingly, we've had to, on today's show, uh, this may not be interesting to you, uh, but behind the scenes, uh, we have had um, people have been watching this today's show for five minutes longer on average than they have uh, previous episodes. So clearly, uh, the quality of guests is far superior to uh, previous episodes. Uh, of course, that is no disservice to our previous guests who have all been excellent as well. Throughout the show today, we have had the likes of Sean Berry, the Green Party, uh, the Green Party's former co-leader and a member of the Living Assembly. We've had Katie Montgomery, the YouTuber and activist. We have had Al Folan from Left, uh, Stats for Lefties. We've had Gwen Gwynfill, the uh, CEO of Yes Cymru, and much, much more. At any stage, you can rewind through the show and catch any of those interviews with those amazing guests at your leisure. Uh, so please do do that if you wish to watch them. You can also catch them, watch them back uh, after the fact. So uh, all of the interviews that we, um, the whole show will stay on our YouTube channel, but also the individual interviews that we, um, that comprise it, we will clip, edit and publish as standalone videos that you can catch at any time as well, which of course means that all of our previous episodes of Bright Green Live, you can do just the same. With those as well so you can catch interviews with the likes of mark sawatka the general secretary of the pcs union um natalie bennett the green party member of the house of lords zach polanski the green party's deputy leader uh you can catch interviews with trade unionists from Myanmar. you can catch interviews with uh lgbt activists and campaigners um act people who are involved in some of the most innovative uh, projects campaigns and initiatives on the left all on our youtube channel best way to make sure that you keep up to date with all of them is to hit that subscribe button. Please do get questions and comments in the chat for our upcoming guests. We still have two guests to come, Alex Powell and Danielle Bett. Uh, I'd love to put your questions to them. And the best way that you can make sure that happens is to get your questions in the chat for them nice and early so I can see them and I can get them put to our guests. You can also put them on Twitter as well on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Um, but uh, your time is running out. If you've got burning questions you want to ask about the government's hatred of migrants, if you've got burning questions you want to ask about the protest movement in Israel, you have only a set amount of time left to do it. So please do get your questions in soon. And of course, throughout the show, if you've been watching, we are playing a game of Guess Who, where I've been giving you clues to a mystery person uh, on the left. Uh, I've given you a series of clues. I want to see your guesses in the chat. The mystery person was born in Caracas. They died of tuberculosis. They're referred to as the liberator of America and they were a contemporary of the Haitian revolutionary Alexander Petion. Please do get your guesses in the chat as to who that mystery person could be. I'll reveal the answer at the end of the show. We've had a couple of guesses already. Please do get your answer, guesses in the chat. But in the, before anything else happens, I'm going to let our next guest into the call right now. So while they connect to the call, I'll just give you a brief introduction to who they are so that you know who you are going to be hearing from. So Alex Powell is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. They're an expert in migration law, 
specifically uh, refugee and asylum issues relating to LGBT people. And they're going to be discussing with me now the government's anti-migrant legislation, including the, um, the latest attack on migrants, the Illegal Migration Bill. And we're going to be discussing the uh, impact of that legislation on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. Um, Alex, I can see you on the call. I cannot see your face. So I'll give you a moment to sort out your camera. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to see you very, very soon. And by magic, you have appeared in front of me. Uh, so thank you so much, Alex, for joining us today. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you. How about you? I am tired. Uh, I'm getting to the end of the show uh, with my blood being purely made up of caffeine. Uh, but that mm. is the way we do it. Uh, so thank you so much for joining, Alex. So obviously we know this government has introduced legislation after legislation that is hostile and attacking of migrants and refugees. The latest iteration of that is the Illegal Migration Bill, which is going through Parliament at the moment. What's the summary of the changes that the government's trying to introduce there? So I think the, the really interesting thing actually about the Illegal Migration Bill is, is how it's very much much the same as the Nationality and Borders Act. It extends substantively on many powers that were already granted under the preceding piece of legislation that just went through last year. So part of the core focus is on making inadmissible the claims of those who have entered the UK unlawfully, which is to say, uh, for example, it's mainly targeting people crossing uh, the channel, uh, particularly those coming via Calais. Um, so in that sense, it provides that the Secretary of State for the Home Department, Suella Braverman, must make an order for the removal of anyone who has entered the law, uh, UK unlawfully or who has entered the UK deceptively. Um, so it, that's very, very concerning in the sense that it will mean that removal decisions are ordered against people in a sense where prior to the recent raft of legislation, it's worth saying some of this sort of was already put in place under the Nationality and Borders Act. But prior to these two pieces of legislation, they would have had the right to have a full process around their uh, asylum claim. Uh, so it's really targeting people who've entered the UK unlawfully and trying to prevent them from accessing the international regime of refugee protection, or rather the UK's implementation of that. And so let's, let's start by unpicking that concept of entering the UK unlawfully. Could you talk us through the the kind of uh, what that means in terms of the the law, but also the 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 current process in which people can claim asylum in the UK? Yeah. So in terms of entering the UK lawfully, what we're looking at here basically is the UK has quite a large raft of what you call the immigration rules, um, and this is a body of secondary legislation. So it's largely made up of statements of changes posted by the Secretary of State for the Home Department. Obviously, in, in the UK, secondary legislation is inferior to primary legislation. So this can be changed more easily than if it were in statutes. Now, those immigration rules provide various routes to enter the UK lawfully. Uh, for example, you could enter via gaining an investor's visa. Uh, and that would be based on your bringing of capital into the UK, uh, giving you a lawful right to entry. Or you could enter based on a spousal visa. Basically, what we're talking about when we talk about illegal migration is someone who has entered the UK without a legal right to do so. So either they're not either they're from a country that requires visas and do not have one, or they have entered the UK in some sense irregularly without going through the prescribed channels. Generally speaking, in UK law, the prescribed channels would require you to claim in advance of your arrival. Um, we saw this as an example with the Ukraine scheme, where they had to very quickly change the process to create a legal route for Ukrainians to enter the UK, because given Brexit, they wouldn't have had one uh, it, prior to the Ukraine scheme. So when we talk about legal entry, really, we're thinking about people yeah, who've entered irregularly or without lawful permission. Now, asylum is kind of separate from that in many senses. The UK is a signatory to the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees, which is a UN treaty. Um, created in the aftermath of World War II. Um, and that basically provides uh, an international definition of who is a refugee. So by that document, uh, signatory states have signed up to recognise anyone who is, uh, for reason of their nationality, um, 
race, religion, membership, particular social group or political opinion outside their country of origin, and for that reason, unable or unwilling to return to it. So they basically need to, to fear persecution for one of those five grounds. If they do that, then signatory states have signed up to say, we will recognize them as refugees. So under that system, there is no sort of international body that can bind and decide who's a refugee. Individual states have to create their own processes. So the UK as a country has its own process. And that is to say, if you want to claim asylum, you would need to go through a process of claiming at the Home Office. And you'd go through uh, an initial interview where they take the basis of your claim, a substantive interview where they take the full facts, uh, and then they would issue a decision on whether or not you're a refugee. Now, the interaction between the Nationality and Borders Act, the Illegal Migration Bill, and this is that the two acts both put someone in a situation where those who've entered unlawfully are sort of prohibited from making that asylum claim. Their claim is inadmissible at the first stage. So they are prevented from going down that process of making a claim and claiming refugee status. In that regard, it's important to say that under Article 31 of the Refugee Convention, uh, signatory states are directly uh, instructed that they should not penalise refugees for their mode of entry, which is to say they should not penalise people for unlawfully entering a country where the purpose of that unlawful entry was to claim asylum. Uh, So it's questionable whether the UK is now in compliance with the Refugee Convention uh, with this recent legislation. Um, I hope that's reasonably clear. There's these two two points. That's incredibly helpful. I guess the the next thing I wanted to ask you really is Mm. the Illegal Migration Bill, you've obviously said, uh, is very, very similar in its nature to the National Latin Borders Act. Mm. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how both those pieces of legislation really fit into the wider scheme of anti-migrant legislation we've seen the Tories introduced since 2010? Yeah, so I mean, I think there are there's sort of two, two answers to draw out here, one relating to migration as a whole, and one relating specifically to refugees. But obviously, these are these are deeply interlinked. Um, and actually, it involves going back to quite early in the Conservative government's time. We can think back to sort of 2010, the 2010s and the uh, net migration cap. There was this idea of getting uh, net migration down to the tens of thousands. And in those numbers, uh, they count everything from international students to uh, refugees, Uh, somewhat in many cases, illogically. Uh, But nonetheless, because of that net migration cap, we initially saw this huge focus on effectively numbers reduction. Uh, And this obviously links to what was at once termed the hostile environment and is now termed the compliant environment. But generally speaking, Since 2010, all of the legislation has been aimed at making it harder to exist in the UK without regularised status. Now, when someone lacks regularised status because they feared persecution, the general route that they might have to regularise their status to become a lawful resident in the UK would be to go through the process of claiming refugee status or some other form of human rights protection. But for simplicity, let's just consider that as part of refugee status here. Um, What these bills basically do is they stop people from regularising their status. So, uh, for example, uh, when you're thinking of the Nationality and Borders Act, which is in force, uh, we've obviously had the recent situation with uh, a large number of Albanian claimants coming to the UK. Actually, more than 50% of claims from those people where they are processed are ending in success, that is to say they're being recognised as refugees. However, because they've entered the UK unlawfully, the Nationality and Borders Act would render all of them unable to claim refugee status. So in that sense, it sort of fits into this wider zeitgeist because it leaves people unable to regularise their status and therefore unable to, uh, well, access employment, access housing, because then they come into the wider system of the compliant environment, which still has right to rent checks, which has employment uh, check, uh, right checks, you know, checking passports and such. Uh, to ensure you have status uh, before you're able to work. So in that sense, it it fits in because it it really hardens the edges there to make sure that even those who historically, because of their specific situations, may have been able to gain access to society unmediated by this matrice of laws that are aimed to make life, as I mean, literally aimed to make life as intolerable as possible for migrants. Um, That's not even my view that's the government's open and stated aim of the policy um, so 
you know, it, it, it's really hardening the edges there. And I think it's important to note in that regard that the illegal migration bill even removes some of the protection for uh, people who are victims of human trafficking uh, in terms of the modern slavery act and, and the way in which that applies. So they are really trying here to make it impossible for people who have entered the UK irregularly to claim status. Um, and I think this sits as a wider part of a sort of shift in the framing of, of asylum um, that the government is actually engaged in. I actually link this as well to the Ukraine scheme, to the Hong Kong scheme, to the Afghan scheme, because there you saw responses to particular situations where the UK government allowed people entry uh, for specific circumstances. But the point of the international refugee definition under the convention was always that you claim as an individual, you are claiming that you are persecuted for this reason and you need the protection of another country. So the UK is really cracking down on that by making it hard to enter illegally, because necessarily when you're fleeing, it's very hard to regulate, regularize your status. You know, If you are fleeing persecution from your government, the chances that you have time to log onto the internet and just let the Home Office know in advance you're coming by putting forward a claim are not high. It's not at all responsive to people's lived experiences. Um, so I, I think, you know, one way in which I, these bill, these two acts, well, the bill and the act, uh, shift us forward is in really putting this focus on countries, not people. The, the discourse becomes about safe countries, not about the rights of an individual to claim asylum, which is what is protected in international law, which is what the UK has agreed to. Uh, protect and recognize. So yeah, um, yeah, I think there's, my real concern here is that it sort of links in in that sense of making it very hard to regularize your status, even if you're fleeing, fleeing persecution. So we've, we've talked obviously here about this in general terms, and on previous episodes of the show, we've had Denali Hamdash, the Green Party's migration spokesperson, and Anna Oppenheim, the um, activist with Labour campaign for free movement, about the various different pieces of anti-migrant legislation. But we've got you on, and one of your areas of expertise is around uh, LGBT plus um, asylum and refugee uh, issues. And so I wondered if you could talk us through the impact of this suite of legislation and conditions on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers in particular. Yeah, thank you. So um, my research has predominantly been with LGBT uh, asylum seekers and refugees themselves. So I've undertaken interviews with them, uh, basically with a view to understanding prior to the Nationality and Borders Act, it's important to say, uh, how they experienced the UK uh, asylum system as queer people, and also the extent to which the UK asylum system's attempts to effectively confirm that they were LGBT, IQA plus, uh, sort of corresponded to their lived reality. So it was looking at how does the UK determine whether or not you are or will be perceived as a sexual and gender minority. So those issues actually are exacerbated by the new legislation. So under Section 12 of the Nationality and Borders Act, uh, there is a provision to raise the standard of proof in asylum claims. Uh, and the nature of sexual gender identity is obviously something that is quite intangible in that sense quite hard to prove it's not uh something that you can easily say here is my evidence that i am this status um outside of asking for very very unsuitable forms of evidence perhaps uh so immediately we've seen and this is well raised within the asylum literature in academic studies a real issue in terms of credibility and proving that someone is LGBT. Uh, and as it was before, uh, every asylum claim was treated on the basis of a very low burden of proof, standard of proof. The standard of proof was the balance of probabilities. Sorry, no, the standard of proof was reasonable degree of likelihood. So is it more like, is it likely, basically? Is it likely that this person is this status. It's been raised to the balance of probabilities, which is more likely than not. So you're suddenly required to do more to prove that you are who you say you are, that you are LGBT, and indeed to prove every element of your claim. Uh, this obviously has a disproportionate impact because there is less likely to be any objective evidence of your sexual orientation and gender identity. And indeed, uh, many people in the countries of origin will have specifically taken steps to hide uh, those identities in order to avoid the fear of persecution. 
which obviously means that they're unlikely to be able to present a narrative that, that then let evidence sit. So firstly, that's a real, real problem um, under Section 12 of the Nationality and Borders Act. Uh, and it's something that will disproportionately impact sexual and gender minority claimants. Um, but then secondly, also you get issues here in respect of the system of inadmissibility. So I said about those asylum claims being inadmissible. Now, the UK's approach where the claim is inadmissible is firstly to say, can we return them to a third safe country? Uh, and obviously this is partly because uh, the UK would say, well, you've entered unlawfully and you've done so passing through a third safe country, such as France, that is when your claim will be admiss inadmissible. Uh, so firstly, they say, can we return you to a third safe country? Now, currently, no country is going to take those returns. So although the UK would say their claim is inadmissible, there's nowhere to remove them to. The only country which the UK has agreed a removal agreement to is Rwanda. So that is what the Memorandum of Understanding with Rwanda effectively is. It is the establishment of Rwanda as a third safe country for the purposes of sending people whose asylum claims have been rendered inadmissible pursuant to Section 16 or 15 of the Nationality and Borders Act. 15 is about EU nationals. Uh, so that was sort of part of the law already uh, when the UK was an EU member and is creating something that already existed. 16 is the entirely new element because it exports that globally. Um, but then also this is uh, exacerbated under Section 2 of the new Act, which puts an even more strict requirement on the Secretary of State to remove them effectively. Um, so the problem, of course, there is that Rwanda is actually a refugee country of origin for LGBT claimants. It, it doesn't have any laws criminalising sexual or gender identity specifically, uh, but uh, refugees have been received, including to the UK, from uh, Rwanda. And indeed, the UK Foreign Office advises caution to LGBT people travelling to Rwanda who are British citizens. So there's a real problem there in that the UK is declaring as safe countries who are not necessarily safe for certain types of claimants. Um, and I think that it is in, in sort of full disclosure, there is a requirement on the Secretary of State or the Secretary of State may rebut the inadmissibility of a claim in a situation where that person would face persecution in the safe country. Uh, but there's not currently any clear process for how this is happening. Uh, and we've seen this in the recent AAA decision of the High Court, where they said that the Rwanda policy could be lawful, but you'd need to individually assess each claim. Uh, and you can see there that sort of linking to what I'm saying, because the courts are reminding the government, in effect, this is supposed to be an individual process. You can't just call countries safe, which is now why we're seeing the illegal migration bill, in effect, to try and reassert. Uh, even, the, well, in my view, to reassert that even though this is clearly not what the Refugee Convention imagined, we want you to do it anyway. Um, so there's a real issue here, basically, in that the UK, in pursuance of, let's say, exporting its responsibilities to refugees, is partnering with countries who, uh, at the least, will not necessarily guarantee the safety of particular types of claimant, and is doing so in a way that leaves very little room for detecting those problematic cases where they arise. So uh, if your claim is determined to be admissible, you in theory have just 14 days to challenge that. Now, uh, finding legal representation in the asylum and immigration system is nearly impossible. Um, legal aid rates have been uh, deeply sort of limited. Uh, and even where you can find legal aid, actually the number of legal aid lawyers in any given locality is extremely low. So for example, uh, I'm obviously based at Oxford Brooks in Oxfordshire, there is one firm in the whole county of Oxfordshire that does legal aid immigration work. And in that firm, there is one person who does LGBT uh, cases. So you're talking there, you know, possibly half a million people in, in the geographic region served by a single firm that's doing legal aid immigration work. And I think this is all the worse in the context of the UK government's dispersal policy, where claimants are sort of sent to various places around the UK, because it's very possible as a claimant, you'll be sent to a very, very rural area where there is not uh, legal aid representation available, but also especially where there's not legal aid representation that knows how to deal with LGBT cases. And just to say as well, when the Home Office does assess those cases, when they're not inadmissible, what they often look for is a sort of narrative that mirrors LGBT identity in the UK. For example, they seem to put a lot of weight on whether you go to pride parades, which might be hard to do if they disperse you to 
rural Wales. Um, so there's a real disconnect here between this sort of idea that you can say this is a safe country and the concrete realities of individual claimants. And it is uh, LGBT claimants, uh, most likely women, uh, and other people have particular vulnerabilities that will be hit the hardest by this policy. The same would go as well for, um, let's say, people whose age is indeterminate, because we've seen the UK's record for sort of determining that 14-year-old is in fact 21. Uh, and again, under this system, they'd have very little protection from being sent on their own to Rwanda. Um, and just for one more point to add there is that actually it's worth considering that as a sort of added cruelty to this, the UK would still say that they were returned, even though they're being returned to a country they have literally never been to and have no personal connection to uh, whatsoever. It's a pretty obviously bleak <laughs> description of the current state of play, which I suppose is, you know, what we'd expect. And um, to end on a slightly more, I guess, I mean, it's, uh, we're talking about awful, an awful situation here, but so to end on a slightly more positive note in, in one sense. Um, what do you think what reforms do you think are needed to the migration system so that we could have a fair and humane process for asylum for lgbt refugees so i think there's again sort of two answers i think there's a, an overriding answer like a sort of utopian answer if you like which is effectively that we should still consider abolishing borders as an answer to this at the end of the day the forms of violence we are talking about are largely structured by and created by the imposition of artificial lines in the sand. There are, don't get me wrong, there are arguments in favour of borders as well in terms of them giving rights to self-determination and stuff like that. But I put it out there because when we have these conversations, people often assume that the border is a prerequisite and then we talk about how we should manage it and it's actually a human construct that we could decide to do away with. At a more realistic level, uh, because I don't think any, at least, uh, party likely to be in government in the next few years is going to uh, listen to the idea of abolishing borders, there are other things uh, we could do very concretely to improve the situation now. So the first thing we need to do is to scrap the illegal migration bill. Uh, this bill will not solve the issues. And indeed, the argument the government makes effectively is that this is to break the model of human trafficking, uh, which completely ignores the fact that the model of human trafficking is directly caused by UK government policy. If the UK wants to break the model of trafficking, what they need to do is to create safe and legal routes. Frankly, human traffickers will be rub rubbing their hands with glee at the prospect of another policy that strengthens the border and makes it more necessary to arrive secretively, not through official routes. Um, and indeed, the likely consequence of the illegal migration bill will be people cease presenting themselves to the Home Office and claiming asylum, and you see even more irregularised status occurring in the UK. Um, so we need to scrap the illegal migration bill. It's also another concrete thing you could do right now is to repeal sections 15, 16 and 12 of the Nationality and Borders Act, uh, as well as the stuff around citizenship. But I'll, I'll leave that for, for someone who's more of an expert in the field of citizenship. Uh, but we need to um, remove those sections because, in effect, they again exacerbate the problems that is currently faced by the UK migration system. The problems the UK migration system faces is effectively an absolutely unassailable backlog, not caused by a rise in the number of people coming, but caused by horrific underfunding of migration services, if you like. I hate that phrase, but migration services in the UK. Um, our numbers are not vastly different from France, but France has actually invested in faster processing. Our numbers are not vastly different from Canada. Again, Canada has invested in faster processing of claims. It has hired more people to do the claims determination part. Um, and actually, I think that's a, a really concrete thing that you could do is even if the government is committed to, to keeping its current uh, process and, you know, morally unjustifiable, but even if they are, then they really do need to listen to migration experts in terms of the urgent need to increase the funding, because a lot of the issues are simply caused by the fact that the Home Office cannot cope with the volume of claims that it is dealing with. When the Conservatives came into government, there was an aim of dealing with cases within six months. That has been completely scrapped, and the average case time now is taking more than two years. So if you want to talk about backlogs, the people arriving 
on sort of at Calais are, are not really a part of that. It's, it's the fact that claims are not being processed quickly. Now, th this is bad for asylum claimants because during the period of a claim, you're not allowed to work. Often you will find yourself uh, with reporting obligations to the Home Office and you live that whole time um, with the sort of fear of deportation hanging over you, not to mention the fact you can't leave the UK if you because you wouldn't be able to come back. So it's obviously bad for claimants, but it's also very, very bad for the state. You know, the government talks about the huge costs of the migration system. A lot of those actually exist because of the backlog and because this means that we have people who we have no choice but to house in hotels or to house in barges. So actually, you know, for all I can talk about repealing the legislation, the thing the government truly could do is to stop the performative cruelty and actually try and deal with the problem. Because at no point in the last five years have they tried to deal with the problem. All they've wanted to say is that they are tough on things, which does nothing to solve the problem. It exacerbates the issue. Every piece of legislation we've seen on immigration and asylum since 2010 has been counterproductive uh, for the purposes that it's been claiming to meet. As I said, human traffickers have rubbed their hands with glee at the policies the UK government have adopted. The reality is that much like with drug decriminalization, if you want to break a model of organized crime, what you need to do is to create safe and legal ways for the activity to take place. Humans will always move. It's, it, you cannot legislate that away. Uh, and frankly, with coming issues of climate change, coming uh, shifting global politics, uh, forced migration is going to continue to grow. Uh, and the UK has no answer to this with its current policies. We really do need to start looking at creating safe and legal routes, and that would help with in terms of ensuring a humane system, because it would mean people weren't forced to take dangerous journeys. It would mean we don't have a rolling death toll of people who've been killed effectively directly by the UK's border policies. Um, they're not killed by human traffickers. They are killed by the UK holding such a hard line that forces people to take dangerous routes. Um, I think the last thing I'd say is all of this also needs to be met with a rise in the availability of legal advice. Uh, again, this is not just a problem of migration. The states in this regard, this is actually part of austerity. Um, the Legal Aid Sentencing Act of 2012 basically has stripped out uh, immigration uh, sort of representation in exactly the same way as it's done with welfare claim, it's done with family law. And actually the UK legal system is in an incredibly unhealthy state because it's been run in such a careless and financially unsustainable way. Um, and it's a real problem now that we have so many people who are not really able, and I, I should add here, the Law Commission looked at immigration law in, uh, I think it was 2018, I can't exactly remember the year. But anyway, they, they critiqued its labyrinthian complexity and stressed that even judges get the law wrong because it is so complicated. It also changes almost weekly because it can be changed by basically ministerial fiat. So actually, you know, without decent legal representation, there's no way people can navigate this system. Uh, so, you know, uh, we need to, to, to row back on some of these legislative enactments. We need to create safe and legal routes. But we also need to look at this as more of a, a global system of what's been happening to the UK legal system over recent years to ensure people can access a lawyer, to ensure that when people come to the UK and they are claiming asylum, they have livable housing conditions. Not, again, the performative cruelty of sticking people on a barge so you can throw some red meat to your voters, which actually costs more than, say, putting people in housing and, hey, how about while we're here, giving them the right to work, as most actually other countries do. I mean, it seems absurd to talk about the sort of cost of sheltering and feeding people when it's only your policy on not letting them work that stops you. And the last thing I'll say, because I realize I'm going in circles a bit here, is um, we really, really need to challenge the thoroughly debunked idea of poll factors. So Lucy Maybelin's done some fantastic work on this. The UK government caught constantly about breaking the model. Uh, they say we need to make it unattractive for people to come here. This is called basically poll factors. They think that there are poll factors like uh, people think that life is better in the UK, so they come here. Lu Lucy Maybelline's research actually found that this has a near zero effect on the likelihood of the UK as a destination. Far more likely are things like shared language and family ties. So maybe rather than this performative cruelty, we might want to think about how colonialism has created the conditions which we are now seeing. And um, 
you know, adjust our attitude towards the issue accordingly. Thank you so much, Alex, for that. That's been incredibly insightful, interesting, and hopefully informative and educative for our viewers. I think, um, if nothing else, I think the, the term you've used there a couple of times at the end of performative cruelty to describe the government's approach to migration over the last decade, and indeed previous governments as well, not just the Tories, and you know the, the Labour government in the, the 90s and noughties was uh, similarly so. Uh, is, a, is a very apt descriptor, I think, of everything that um, we have sadly been experiencing from government in recent years. But um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. Thank you very much. Hope the rest of the show goes well. Thank you so much, Alex. And uh, for our viewers, that was Alex Powell, who is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that interview and yeah, your reflections on the Alex's comments on the UK migration system and so on. Um, get those thoughts in the chat uh, at your leisure. Whilst you're doing that, please do also hit the like button if you enjoyed that interview. It means that more people will get to see the video and hit subscribe so that you don't miss out on future episodes too. Um, if you're just joining us now, you can rewind and catch the whole of that interview with Alex talking about the UK's anti-migrant legislation and its impact on migrants and refugees in general, but specifically on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. <clears throat> I found that uh, conversation incredibly enlightening, so uh, I hope you do too. We are coming very close to the end of the show now. We just have one guest left. It's been a long ride. We've been here since 10 a.m. We have one final guest joining us very, very soon, which is Danielle Bett from the um, campaign group you had. Uh, now, Yakad campaign and educate for a two state solution to the Israel Palestine conflict and work within the British Jewish community to uh, advocate for that. We're going to be discussing the government of Israel under be Benjamin Netanyahu and their decision to introduce a to seek to introduce judicial reforms, which have sparked a massive protest movement within Israel and internationally, too. I'll be speaking to Danielle about the impact that that protest movement has had on attitudes towards the Israeli government. And I'll also be uh, asking about the impact on the Jewish diaspora's attitudes towards Israel more generally, um, as well as the links between the Israeli protests and the anti-occupation movement within, um, within Palestine and in Israel as well. Uh, particularly in the context of the um, the two raids we've seen recently on the Al-Aqsa Mosque in East Jerusalem during the month of Ramadan and also the most recent bombing campaign, the airstrike campaign we've seen from Israel in um, Lebanon and in Gaza. So that's still to come. I'll be joined by Danielle very, very shortly. If you're just joining us, I'll just let you know what you have missed so far on the show that you can go back and rewind and watch. So at the start of the show, we were joined by Sean Berry, who is a former co-leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. I then spoke to Al Folan, who is the founder of Stats for Lefties. They're the election analyst and statistician behind that brilliant Twitter account and blog. We spoke about the local elections and the prospects the Greens have of winning seats in them. I spoke to Samuel Sweek from the Peace and Justice Project. That's the organisation set up by Jeremy Corbyn which has just launched the Music for the Many campaign, which is seeking to defend music venues across the country. I spoke to Gwen Gwynville, the CEO of Yes Cymru, about the Welsh independence movement. I spoke to Martin Butcher, um, who is a Green councillor and the former author of NATO Monitor, about the Green Party's new policies on NATO and his take on those. That was at 1.15, so if you go back three hours in the show, you should be able to find that. At 2.15, I spoke to Maisha Begum from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective about the 10th anniversary of the collapse of the building in Rana Plaza that killed 1, 000, over 1,000 uh, garment workers. And we talked about the, uh, the garment industry today and whether there's been any uh, significant change in the industry since that collapse. I then spoke to... Katie Montgomery at 3 p.m. So if you rewind by an hour and a half, you'll catch that interview with Katie where we spoke about the EHRC's new guidance on the Equality Act and the, the damage and the impact that could have on trans people in the UK. And finally, just now, half an hour ago, I spoke to, well, rather, we started half an hour ago, we finished a few minutes ago, I spoke to Alex Powell, who's a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University, 
about uh, the government's anti-migrant legislation and um, its impact on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. If you have enjoyed those interviews, if you're looking forward to watching them in the future, the best way you can keep on top of everything Bright Green puts out is to hit the subscribe button, but also please do hit like so that uh, other people get this video appearing in their feeds and they get to watch them too. I will be shortly taking my final break of the day before we go into our last interview, but before I do that, we are still playing our game of Guess Who, where I'm giving you a series of clues to a prominent and significant figure on the left, and you are trying to identify who that mystery person is. So far, I have told you that that mystery person was born in Caracas, that they died of tuberculosis, that they are referred to as the liberator of America, and that they were a contemporary of the Haitian revolutionary Alexandra Petion. And my penultimate clue for you is that this mystery person was a militia officer in the Venezuelan War of Independence. Please get your guesses in the chat as to who that mystery person is. You can also, of course, get your questions lined up for Danielle Betts, our final guest of the day, and I'll try and put as many of them to her as I can. Get your question in the chat and also on the hashtag Bright Green Live, um, and I'll try and get them to, to her. So also, you've still got a little bit of time to ask any questions to me. And I'll do my best to answer them as well. We've had some great questions throughout the show about, uh, what was I talking about earlier? Oh, uh, defections from the Labour Party to the Greens and whether we're going to see more of them and the local elections coming up soon and lots of other things. So if you've got any questions for me, please do ask them and I'll do my best to answer them. And in the meantime, I'm going to take a quick break. Get your guesses in the chat for our mystery person. Um, I'll be back in a couple of minutes time uh, where we will wrap up the day with our final, final interview. Uh, and then I'll let you go enjoy the rest of your Easter Sundays. But um, thanks so much for watching. We're still here for the hour or so. So please keep tuned. Stay tuned. Keep tuned. Whatever you want to do. Tune, tune however you wish. Uh, and uh, yeah, like, subscribe, share, comment in the, in the chat. And I'll see you all very, very shortly.
Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to episode six of Bright Green Live. We are hurtling towards the end of the show. We just have one interview left to bring you. And our final guest will be Danielle Bett from Yahad. We'll be discussing the uh, judicial reforms that Benjamin Netanyahu's government in Israel has introduced and the protests they have spawned. Specifically, we're going to be discussing the impact of those protests on attitudes towards uh, the Israeli government within Israel and also within the wider Jewish diaspora. Um, we'll be discussing that and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, please do stay tuned for that. It will be coming up very, very soon. If you haven't already, hit like and please do also hit subscribe. We wanted to get to 50 likes on the video by the end of the day. and We wanted to get to 570 subscribers. We're 14 likes away and we're eight subscribers away. So if you haven't already, make sure you do it. Uh, it means that more people will see these videos. It helps Bright Green out massively. It doesn't cost you a penny, so please, please do. Also, if you've got any questions for Danielle, please do get them lined up in the chat and I will do my best to put them to her. <laughs> in the meantime, throughout the show, we've been playing a game of Guess Who, where I'm asking you to identify a significant, prominent figure from the left. And I've given you five clues so far on this person. I'll give you the last clue just before the next interview and reveal the answer at the end. The clues I've been giving you so far are that this mystery person was born in Caracas. They died of tuberculosis. They're referred to as the liberator of America. They were a contemporary of the Haitian revolutionary Alexandra Petion, and they were a militia officer in the Venezuelan War of Independence. Who is that mystery person from the left? Guess us in the chat, please. So, as you'll have noticed if you've been watching the show, Bright Green Live is a regular occurrence. We stream live on YouTube on the second Sunday of every month. That means that we have a show coming up in just a month's time. And on that show, on May 14th, we're going to be joined by another array of brilliant guests. I'd love to get your thoughts on who we should book for that show, because we've got three lined up so far. I want to get your suggestions for more. So please do let us know in the chat who you'd like to see us speaking to on that show as well. So far, we have booked Gillian Mackey, the uh, Green Party MSP up in Scotland. She's going to be talking about the campaign that she's been running to get buffer zones introduced around medical facilities that, um, that provide abortion services. So uh, that means preventing protests, graphic and violent protests that are uh, outside of uh, abortion centres where people are trying to, to uh, access abortion um, and um, to exercise their rights to reproductive rights. Uh, so we're talking about the legislation she's trying to bring in the Scottish Parliament. I'll also be speaking to a representative of People on Planet, the student activist network that um, campaigns on climate, human rights, poverty, the environment and so on. I'll be speaking to them about the Fossil Free Careers campaign. Uh, that's a campaign to get recruitment of students, uh, fossil fuel companies that seek to recruit students on university campuses kicked off of those campuses to prevent that process from happening. I'll be speaking to people on planet about why they're campaigning and how you can get involved. And I'll also be speaking to Matt Kennard, the author of a new book, the co-author of a new book, Silent Coup, which is all about how corporations are undermining democracy all across the world. If you want to catch that show, the best thing to do is hit subscribe and then you won't miss out when we go live, which will be on May 14th. If you want to put it in your diaries, put it in your diaries. Throughout the show, I've had a bunch of other guests on today. You can rewind now and watch any of those interviews at your leisure. The show will also be available on our YouTube channel um, forever, I guess, until YouTube no longer exists. Um, so on the show, right at the beginning, I spoke to Sean Berry, who is a co -lead, former co-leader of the Green Party and a member of the London Assembly. We spoke about the impact the Green Party's had over the 23 years the Greens have been uh, had representatives on the London Assembly. We also spoke about the 2024 London mayoral campaign and the London Assembly campaign. The Greens will be what the Greens will be prioritising in those. Uh, that show is right at the start. So if you rewind back to 10, 15, uh, so that's like 15 minutes into the, into the stream, you can find that. I then spoke to Al Folan from Stats for Lefties about the uh, local elections and the prospects of the Greens uh, winning seats in those elections. That was at 11 o'clock, so an hour into the show, you can find that. At 11.45, I spoke to Samuel Sweek from the Peace and Justice Project about the Music for the Many campaign, which is seeking to protect music venues across the country. Uh, that's an hour and 45 minutes into the stream, so you can find that there. At 12.30, I spoke to uh, Gwen Gwynville, about the, uh, who is the CEO of Yes Cymru. We spoke about the Movement for Welsh Independence. 
and uh, the strength of support for Welsh independence and stuff like that. Uh, that was at 12.30, so two and a half hours into the stream. At 1.15, I spoke to Martin Butcher in the latest in our series of interviews with people about the Green Party's new policy on NATO. I spoke to Martin uh, about his criticisms of the Green Party's new policy. Uh, he used to be the author of a blog called uh, NATO Monitor. At 2.15, I spoke to Maisha Begum from the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective. We're speaking on the 10th anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse in Bangladesh. That was a collapse that led to the deaths of over a thousand garment workers. And uh, we spoke about how the Rana Plaza Solidarity Collective is commemorating that event and also um, the, the situation facing garment workers in the uh, in supply chains right now, whether things have improved uh, in terms of safety since then. So that's four and a bit hours into the stream. And then I spoke to Katie Montgomery, the legendary YouTuber and activist about the EHRC's new guidance on the Equality Act and the ramifications it could have for trans people and trans rights. That was at three o'clock. So five hours into the stream at four o'clock, just gone. I spoke to Alex Powell, who's a lecturer in law at Oxford Brooks University, an expert in refugee and asylum law, specifically in relation to LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. Um, that was at four o'clock, so about 50 minutes ago in the stream. Uh, really fascinating conversation. We've spoken a lot about the government's anti-migrant migrant legislation uh, recently on this show. That one we delved specifically into the impact on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. So please do check it out at your leisure. All those video interviews will be available on this stream on our YouTube channel. And we'll also be releasing clips of the individual interviews. So the best way to make sure you can catch them in the future. And indeed, all the previous episodes of Bright Green Live is to hit the subscribe button. If you hit subscribe, you will our videos will appear in your feed. You can find everything that we've done on YouTube so far, and you'll get a notification every time we go live, every time we put out a video, you'll find the videos, they'll appear in your, your subscriptions feed, and so on and so on and so on. So hit subscribe, hit like, etc. 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 You know by now what I want you to do. If you haven't done it already, I'm very disappointed. You should do it. It helps me out massively. It helps Bright Green out massively. It makes us all very happy. So please do do it. Uh, I'm just going to go to the chat, see if we've had anything recently and also on the socials. So Adriana Spelinke, um, welcome back to the show. One of our regular viewers uh, has popped up in the chat. Great to have you with us as always. Um, check on the hashtags and on the socials. Um, Thank you to Max Morris again for sharing the show link. Um, you're a star. Be more like Max. And yeah, I think that's probably, we're probably caught up on stuff so far. Um, so as you know, our final guest is Danielle Betts from the ACAD. Please do get any questions for um, Danielle in the chat lined up and I'll try and get them to her. I think I saw some questions earlier, possibly from, from Ben Samuel. Um, who uh, should be able to, I should be able to find to, um, yes, I've seen them. Sorry for me trying to search and stream at the same time. I've got them. So Ben, if you're still watching, I'll pop your questions to Danielle as well. Um, so Danielle will be joining us very, very shortly. In the meantime, we have been running this game of Guess Who? We're trying to identify a mystery person who is a significant figure on the left. And... We've had some guests in the chat. I've given you all but the final clue. I'm going to give you the final clue now and I'll reveal the answer at the end of the day. So your final clue now is that this mystery person was... Sorry, that's not the final clue. I'm going to run through all the clues and then I'll give you the final ones. The clues you've had so far is the mystery person was born in Krakus. They died of tuberculosis. They're referred to as the liberator of America. They were a contemporary of the Haitian revolutionary Alexandra Petion. Uh, they were a militia, militia officer in the Venezuelan War of Independence. And finally, the Venezuelan currency is now named after this person. That's your last clue. So get your guesses in the chat as to who our mystery person is, please. I can see some guesses have come through. There are, I will give it away. I won't give it away. Get your guesses in. I won't tell you who's right or wrong yet. Uh, I'll give it, I'll give you the answer at the end of the show. Uh, a few final plugs for future things that are coming up with Bright Green. So local elections are coming up in May. And as always, Bright Green will be running our annual live blog where we'll bring you the results throughout the night and throughout the following day of everything that has happened as they come in. 
that I'll be running from the close of polls on polling day. So on the Thursday, first Thursday of May at 10 o'clock, we'll run the live blog throughout the night, bring you all the updates on the results as they come in. Then at 3 a.m. that night, we're going to go live on YouTube to bring you a more in-depth uh, analysis of everything that's happened in those local elections. Uh, we'll hopefully have some brilliant guests and we'll also go live the following day at 6 p.m. when we get more of the results in to talk in more depth about the results. So uh, hit subscribe so you don't miss out on that. But on the election day and on the day after, we've got two live streams. We've also got the, um, the live blog that will be happening throughout the night. And we will be running a series of articles between now and then on some of the areas that are really interesting. Um, the Green Party, in terms of its potential gains in the next local elections. So I'll be speaking, I won't be speaking, we'll be publishing uh, analysis of various council areas where we could see really significant results for the Green Party, including areas where we could see double digit gains for the Greens, uh, places like East Hertfordshire, places like Mid Suffolk, where the Greens could gain control of councils, including uh, potentially winning an overall majority. Places like Brian Hove, where the Greens are hoping to, to retain control of the council as well. Similarly, Lancaster and those. So keep an eye on our website for all those things. If you head to our website, bright green.org, and subscribe to our mailing list, then you'll get all that stuff and more coming into your inbox. We don't bombard your inbox, we don't take the piss, we send you an email about once a week. We occasionally stick, stick some other stuff out as well. Um, so yeah subscribe to the mailing list and you'll get all of that our local elections coverage that will be coming up in the coming weeks um as we get closer to polling day there's some really interesting uh really interesting areas that we're going to cover and we spoke about a lot about about a lot of it with Al Foyland from stats for lefties earlier as well if you want to catch that interview because uh it's a nice preamble to the analysis and coverage we've got coming up in the future Thanks so much for staying tuned throughout the day, everyone. I'd love to see who's been with us since the very, very beginning. Let us know in the chat. Uh, we will be having our final interview very, very shortly, which will be with Danielle Bett from Yachad. And we'll be speaking about the, um, the judicial reforms that are being introduced, or rather that Benjamin Netanyahu is trying to introduce in Israel and the impact that that's had in terms of the mass protest movement that has emerged. Um, and uh, we'll also be speaking about the impact those protests are having on uh, attitudes towards the government in Israel, both of the public in Israel, but also the wider Jewish diaspora outside of Israel and how attitudes are changing there. If you have any questions for Danielle, please do get them in the chat and I'll try and get as many of them to her as possible. The earlier you do it, the easier it is for me to get them to them. Uh, I know that we've had some questions in earlier on from Ben Samuel, which I'll try and put them um, to them. Yeah. Uh, great. So what I'm going to do is I can just see that Danielle has joined the call. So I'm just going to allow... Danielle in and whilst she joins the call uh, and connects to the audio and so on, I will just give a brief introduction to Danielle so that you all know who you are about to be hearing from. Our final guest on today's show is Danielle Betts, who is the Director of Communications at Yakad. Now, Yakad is an organisation that works for a two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict and advocates for that within the Jewish community in Britain. I'm only speaking to Danielle now about the uh, the situation in Israel right now with the judicial reforms that Benjamin Netanyahu has attempted to introduce, the protest movement that has erupted as a result of that, and the impacts that's had on attitudes towards the government in Israel. Um, Danielle, I can see that you've joined the call, but I can't see your video. I can see you now. That's brilliant. Uh, so before we delve into any of that, I just wanted to say a massive welcome to you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. I'm um, in a hotel in London, so hopefully the Wi-Fi works OK and you can hear me fine. I can hear you loud and clear at the moment, so let's hope it holds up. <laughs> Um, so let's dive straight into it then. So for uh, some of our viewers may not have been following the story of what's happening in Israel right now. Um, so for those who haven't been following it, could you talk us through what 
Netanyahu's government is trying to uh, introduce when it comes to these judicial reforms? Sure. So Netanyahu was re-elected in the end of last year, in November, um, and he has built the most far-right coalition in Israel's history, which is made up of four parties, Netanyahu's Likud, um, two Haredi, which are very ultra-Orthodox religious parties, and one party, which will probably come up in our conversation, which is the Religious Zionist Party, which is an extremely far-right party, anti-Palestinian, um, anti-LGBT rights, kind of pro-annexation, some might argue pro-apartheid. Um, so ever since Netanyahu's re-election, one of the main things that he and his government have been campaigning on is um, judicial reform or the judicial overhaul. Um, and we would, so people who oppose it would call it an overhaul because it's not just kind of changes to way in which Israel's judiciary works, but rather a complete overhaul of the political system and the, the legal system in Israel. Um, mainly it's a way of removing and reducing the checks and balances currently on the government, which are upheld by the Supreme Court. Um, I would argue the Supreme Court is far from perfect, but this is a complete attack on checks and balances and really trying to remove them. But there are not really any checks and balances. I know some people have tried to compare the situation to the US or other countries, but it's simply a false comparison because in the US you have the Senate and the Congress and the Supreme Court. That is not the case in Israel. You really just have the the sitting government um, and, and the Supreme Court, which decides if to kind of push back against any laws. Um, so it's mainly trying to weaken the Supreme Court to intervene in the uh, choices of Supreme Court justice, justices to make those uh, positions far more political, um, to weaken the current system around legal advisors, to make those appointments, again, far more political, and as well as legal decisions or legal advice being far less um, uh, some basically so politicians can ignore legal advisors. Um, but also the, the main thing that has been spoken about is the override clause. And the override clause is to say that should the Supreme should the government try and pass a law and the Supreme Court decide that it is not legal um, or might risk people's human rights or whatever else, the government can vote to override the decision of the Supreme Court, which essentially from a civilian perspective takes away any um, protection that civilians have over their human rights, over their civil rights, over their right to free speech. Um, and that's really the thing that's got people most concerned because things like LGBT rights, which a lot of Israelis do believe in, um, anti-racism laws, etc., cetera, are, are no longer protected in any way, shape or form should this legal overhaul uh, be successful. And so the that's a really helpful overview. Thank you for that. And I guess the 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 immediate thing that's happened following the attempts to introduce this overhaul, as you put it, is it's mm -hmm. it's triggered a mass protest movement against the government and against the the reforms. How widespread have the protests been in Israel against the um, the judicial overhaul? So massively widespread. Spread. Um, and it's quite interesting because obviously you will have people on the right who will try and downplay these protests, but we really haven't seen protests to this scale across Israel. Um, so they're widespread both in terms of numbers. Every single week you have hundreds of thousands of people out on the streets. Um, usually you would see Tel Aviv is the most liberal city in Israel and you would kind of expect to see protests in Tel Aviv, but actually we've seen protests across Israel. This issue is clearly um, crossing socioeconomic divides. We have seen people who are traditionally right-wing protesting, people who are much more pro-military than people like I might be going out and protesting. So it's crossing um, political divides, crossing socioeconomic divides, identity divides. The protests are across Israel, and most importantly, they've been consistent. Um, I think at the beginning, a lot of people worried that you know, the first few weeks there would be this um, mass protest movement, but we would die down because it's really hard to keep up that level of protest. But actually, we've seen them almost consistently increasing in size. Um, and they've also been very disruptive. So they've kept the issue on the headlines, both nationally and internationally, which is incredibly important because we have seen international support for the protests. There has been protests in London and also other countries in solidarity with uh, Israelis protesting, which means the issue is now an international issue. And you, you've seen also a, a massive intervention from the Biden administration, which is, again, almost unprecedented, this kind of level of international um, concern being expressed against Netanyahu. 
And so obviously in the last few years, we've seen, I mean, the Israeli government has, has had various iterations over the last few years with, um, you know, the, the various elections and the, the various formations of the government. But essentially the, the one theme throughout the last few years has been that it's been moving further and further to the, to the right throughout those iterations. And I guess the, the judicial reforms or overhaul, however we describe it, is kind of like a, a clear iteration of, of that. But mm-hmm. I guess what's your what's your assessment of how this uh, the, the, this these proposed reforms uh, are sort of existing as a as a totemic issue, which is shifting uh, attitudes towards the government within Israel? Yeah, I think it's been quite it's really interesting. I think abroad people view Israel from the lens of Israel Palestine, which is very fair, and obviously that's the field that we work in, and we would support that. But internally in Israel, um, it's really been a clash over what Israeli identity is. A lot of internal issues around um, Mizrahi and Ashkenazi Jews, and um, racial issues, and kind of Jews of color, and how they often are more discriminated against, and things like that. Um, so I think it's 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 a very different battle internally. A lot of it's also a socioeconomic ba- battle. Um, the assumption that people who protest are more liberal and therefore more privileged, etc. Um, in terms of the attitudes to the government, there are always going to be the hardline supporters of Netanyahu. He has a very, very strong base. That's why he succeeded so well. His party is also one of the most long-standing standing parties in, in the Israeli Knesset. Um, however, if you look at most recent polling, we've seen a massive reduction in support for these um, the, the current government parties. We have seen more people, especially over security. Um, so most of the parties in government have uh, their campaign platform is around security, saying, you know, we have issues, not just from uh, in the, on the Palestinian conflict, but issues in the south of Israel, with security, um, conflict with Bedouin Arabs, etc. And the, the platform has been around, we were, we we're going to keep you safe. And clearly, if you look at the past couple of days, this government is doing the opposite. We've now got conflict with Lebanon, conflict with Syria, conflict with on the Gaza border. We've had several terror attacks. We've had several incidents of violence um, in the West Bank. Um, and I think it's really shifting attitudes and people saying, actually, this government is not keeping us safe. Um, it's off. Many of its ministers are not being taken seriously. And, and the polling does support that. Um, and I, I also think that um, the protests have raised awareness for a lot of people. Again, there are people who are frustrated by the protests. There are people who don't support them, people who stand by their support for Netanyahu and for uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir and Smotrich and others. But I, I do think there has been a, um, a shift because the government is not proving itself to be effective. And in addition to the security issue, we're clearly facing a, an economic crisis because Every and I'm not I'm absolutely not an expert in common economy, but every economic expert pretty much has warned that this judicial reform is going to be bad for Israel's economy. And we have seen a rise in prices in Israel um, and the cost of living. And so people's lives are very quickly being affected negatively, which I think for will sh- is going to shift some attitudes in that. According to the most recent poll that came out, if, the, if an election was held today, this, gov- this government would not stand. Um, I think it's probably too early for an election, but but that's uh, it, it is affecting it negatively. And so the other area I guess I'm interested in in relation to this is we've also seen not just protests in Israel itself, but we've seen protests across the world, uh, including mm-hmm. in cities in the UK, um, in response to the the uh, Netanyahu's um, government and its actions around judicial reforms. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you know, protests about the Israeli government's um, actions are, aren't particularly rare in the UK. You know, that's quite a common feature. But I guess these are very different in that um, we've seen protests led and organised by the Jewish community in the UK, by people who would describe themselves as Zionists and people who are pro-Israel, organising and campaigning and protesting against uh, these um, these reforms. And I'm, I find this. I'm really interested to, to to hear what you think about the impact that the that this policy could have on um, attitudes towards the Israeli government and the Israeli state um, in sort of Jewish diaspora communities rather than just within Israel. Yeah. So I think I'll speak particularly to London because I'm more aware of the protests there. What's really interesting is the people who have set up the protests against um, when Netanyahu visited London. There was a huge protest 
against him outside Downing Street. And the people who actually organized that protest were Israelis living in London. And I know that's true for other countries as well. Now, the Israeli community um, kind of, I don't want to say functions, but it, it's it's different to the Jewish community. And it's, it's um, a little bit less political. Um, it, it's not necessarily merged as one with the, the Jewish community in the UK, for example. It's, it's a little bit separate. And it's really interesting to see Israelis abroad mobilizing in this way, in a way that they, they wouldn't have before. Um, and, and I think that's really telling. I think it puts a lot of pressure on the Jewish community. Um, I think the kid, Jewish community is it doesn't mean the Jewish community isn't going to be Zionist or not support Israel as a concept. Um, however, I think it's it's forcing the community to ask itself a lot of really difficult questions and questions that we we ought to be asking ourselves. Um, of you know, you kind of do have to choose a side in this instance. It's really it's really difficult to stay silent when so many Israelis are saying. If you want Israel to exist as a Jewish democracy, you're going to have to stand up and protest with us because that's what's at stake here. It's not a question of do you support Netanyahu, do you support Gantz, do you support Lapid? It's what is the character of the Jewish state that you want? And I think it has pressed more people and more figures in the Jewish community in the UK and globally to be asking difficult questions, to be challenging. Um, I mean, again, maybe it's not my ideal uh, outcome, but when the board of deputies met with the diaspora minister, they were very clear that it wasn't, you know, a warm handshake conversation, but that they posed very difficult questions to him. Is that my idea? Is a left wing Israeli? No, I would love them to have a stronger response, but it's a, it, it's a very different way of handling it than they have in the past. Um, and I think that's interesting, and I hope that pressure continues to to make people ask difficult questions. And so I want to talk a little bit about the relationship with the protest movement and sort of, I guess, wider civil society within Israel and also within Palestine. And um, there was an interesting interview that Navarra Media did uh, recently with the uh, the Palestine, Palestinian ambassador to the UK uh, following the um, uh, following the, with, on a whole bunch of topics. But one of the things that was interesting about that interview was um, he was asked whether the protest movement in Israel is um, giving, uh, I guess, more strength and support to the anti-occupation um, initiatives and um, whether the Palestinian ambassador saw hope in the Israeli protest movement helping to shift uh, attitudes towards the occupation. And uh, interestingly, the, that they said that actually they didn't feel like those links and connections were being made within the protest movement. I wonder whether... I guess, firstly, whether you agree with that, but secondly, also, as you know, someone working with Yakad, which, you know, is is concerned around the occupation and um, and, and the conflict, whether you think that um, that that ought to be taking place where, where those links are being made between this set of particularly regressive um, policies from Netanyahu's government and their uh, kind of occupation when it comes to Palestine. Yeah, it's a really good and fair and very complicated question. And I'll say... I completely respect the ambassador's view that um, as a Palestinian, and I can't speak as a Palestinian, clearly what is happening is not nearly touching on the occupation enough. The protests are focused on internal Israeli politics, and they aren't focused on the occupation. I think that's really clear. You see that it's uh, Israeli flags. The protest movement has made a very big effort to make it clear that it's pro-Israel in the kind of traditional sense. So I will say it's not making the link enough. I don't think it's fair to say that there hasn't been a link made to occupation. Um, so first of all, every protest, and especially in Tel Aviv, there has been a very substantial anti-occupation block. And you see organizations like Peace Now, Breaking the Silence, Standing Together, um, and others, I won't try and name them all, are, are making their presence felt um, and ensuring that they are talking about the occupation and making the link. Because ultimately, a huge part of what's happening in this judicial reform, this far right government, is clearly an attempt to, um, if not deepen the occupation, uh, completely create a situation where we are unquestionably in an apartheid state. Um, and that's been very made very clear. I mean, Minister uh, Itamar Ben Gvir, um, who's Minister for National Security, who's a far right politician, has said that his kind of vision, and he said this not long ago before the election towards the end of last year, would be um, annexation whereby Palestinians who want to be peaceful and not cause conflict can stay, but they won't be given a right to vote. 
So they will be second class citizens. And it, it's, the government has made it very clear what its attitude towards Palestinians is. It doesn't have any in- intent on working towards a two state solution. There have been countless outposts in the West Bank being legalized to become settlements. This is a this is a pro occupation, pro annexation government. What I think, though, is that more and more people are are realizing that. I think that some of the conversation that I've seen, if you look at Israeli media, is picking up on that more. Um, one of the former heads of uh, the Shin Bet, the in- Israeli intelligence services, um, has said that the biggest risk in this government is exactly that block, the the, the pro annexation, pro apartheid block. And so it's, it's inserting this conversation is happening far more than I've ever seen it before in the mainstream. But I completely accept that for Palestinians, it's not nearly enough. It's very fair for me as an Israeli to say, give us time. We have to shift the conversation. It's going to take a while. But for a Palestinian where your your homeland is being completely destroyed and your rights are being taken away, it's, I don't expect the Palestinians to be patient with us. Um, the, the other just one thing I wanted to point out on that is the biggest shift I saw in attitudes was with what happened in the Palestinian village of Hawara, um, where the settlers went in and rampaged and essentially did a pogrom against Palestinians. And the chant that came out of that in the Israeli protest was chanting towards the police, where were you in Hawara? And that's actually be- remained a chant in protest. And I think the link is starting, it's not there yet, but it's starting to be made where there's protesters saying, wait a minute, who are the police protecting? Who are the government protecting? Who are the security services there for? Is it for us as peaceful pro-democracy citizens, but not for the settlers who are violent towards Palestinians? Um, and so I don't accept that the conversation isn't happening, and I don't accept that there's a shift, but I completely accept that it's not nearly enough. And so finally then, um, just on that last point, given, I guess, what's happened over the last week, uh, I guess, since since I first kind of, we, we first agreed to do this interview, uh, we've obviously seen the 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 raids on the Al-Aqsa Mosque in East Jerusalem um, again during the month of Ramadan. We've seen the airstrikes in Lebanon and Gaza and so on. Um, I guess you've talked there about some shifting of attitudes in Israel towards the occupation and, and the interlinking of that to the, the protest movement. Do you do you think that the the, the these these kinds of acts that we're seeing from uh, like with the raid on the Alexa Mosque and the, the the airstrikes and so on, is uh, is also starting to shift attitudes um, as well. So it's really interesting. I think, unfortunately, I'll say with Alexa, no, and um, because it's the the this government has not invented the the violence at Alexa. We've seen it happen before. We saw violence at Alexa under previous governments, and I think that that's something Israelis haven't quite wrapped their head around. I'm not sure it's being reported as well as it should be in the media and explained as well as it should be. But I think when people look at the increase in at what's happening with Lebanon um, and also the, the kind of persistent violence that isn't bringing us anywhere, I do think questions are being started to be asked. Um, also questions, again, around the, it's not just about the explosions and the shootings, it's about the building of more settlements which this government sees as kind of, you know, many people in this government see as the goal, how is that benefiting people's security? Because actually it's clearly, it's an act of provocation, it's a, it's an act of violence. Um, and so I would say, I don't think Alexa as a moment in time will shift attitudes, but I do think there's a wider question around people seeing a, a violent government acting violently and not protecting them in any way. And so it's always going to be citizens who suffer. And I think the way in which this government is operating, one, is, is ineffective, um, isn't taken seriously, and two, is, is hurting people. Um, and so I, I wouldn't, there's there's few moments in time I would pin it down to, but I think there's an overall big picture of people kind of starting to, to see that um, having an impact on their lives. I'll let you get on now with the rest of your day, but thank you so much for joining us and for yeah the really informative and enlightening uh, contributions you've made. But yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So that was Danielle Bett from Yakad, and uh, I would love to get your thoughts on that interview um, in the chat. Let me know your comments on that and any thoughts you have on yeah, the ongoing situation in Israel, the judicial reforms and the, you know, the, the far right government that is there and the, the relationship it has to the occupation. Please do get them in the chat and any comments on that interview, much, much appreciated. So that was our final guest of the day. We've reached the end of the show. 
it's been a long journey, but we got there. Thank you so much to everyone who has been watching. And thank you to all of our guests throughout the day. Sean Berry, Al Folan, Samuel Sweek. Uh, I'm going to forget names. Gwen, Gwen, Gwynville, uh, Martin Butcher, Maisha Bagan, Katie Montgomery, Alex Powell, and of course, just then, Danielle Bett. Uh, it has been a long old show. I hope it's been as informative, engaging and inspiring for you as I have found it. I have a few final bits of admin to do before you leave. The first of them is to reveal that the mystery person I was looking for who was born in Caracas, died of tuberculosis, is known as the Liberator of America, as a contemporary of the Haitian revolutionary Alexandra Petion, was a mil militia officer in the Venezuelan War of Independence, and has the Venezuelan currency now named after them, is Simone Bolivar, um, as some of you have already guessed in the chat, the um, revolutionary leader in Latin America. Well done to those of you who got that. The last few things to say is that firstly, as always, if you've enjoyed this show, please do click like, please do hit subscribe. It means that you won't miss out on any of the future shows and other people will get to see these videos too. You can, of course, follow us on all the social media channels. And if you are able to, please do set up a regular donation by heading to bright-green.org forward slash donate. The next episode of Bright Green Live will be taking place on May the 14th and will be joined by Gillian Mackey from the Scottish Green Party, Matt Kennard, the author of Silent Coup, and someone from People and Planet to talk about the Fossil Free Careers campaign. Before we leave, I'll just rattle through some of the comments that we got through at the end of the show. So Steve C, a regular viewer who's been with us since the start, says some very thought-provoking interviews today, Chris, and a round of applause. Thank you so much, Steve. And a round of applause, of you, round of applause to you two for uh, being with us throughout the show and being with us so often uh, i think i've caught up with most of the other comments so i will probably wrap up and leave it there i hope you all enjoy the rest of your sundays and your long weekend thank you so much for joining us throughout the show um may 14th get it in your diary hit subscribe and i'll see you all very very 